Uh, the special meeting of the Annapolis City Council. We good to go? <laughs> On Monday, June 7th, 2021, we'll be called to order at 10.03, 10.04, sorry. At uh, this time, please join us for the invocation by Alderman Finlayson, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we have all heads bowed, all eyes closed, and all hearts open? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you thanking you and praising you for the great gifts of our city. Thank you for bringing us through an extremely difficult year. Lord, as we embark on our responsibility today, grant us the gifts of wisdom, justice, counsel, and fortitude that will result in a strong and healthy and sustainable city. These blessings I ask in your name, amen. Amen. Identified in the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mayor Buckley. Here. Alderman Tierney. Alderman Payon. Here. Alderman Pendel Charles. She was here, but she stepped out. She got to say it. <laughs> um, Alderman Finlayson. Present. Alderman Shandemeyer. Alderman Gay. Alderman Savage. Present. Alderman Arnett. Present. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Please present the first item on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. This time, I entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Okay, second, please. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mayor Buckley. Aye. Oh, oh sorry. Um, Alderman Finlayson. Aye. Alderman Shandemeyer. Aye. Alderman Savage. Aye. Alderman Arnett. Aye. Alderman Payne. Aye. Mr. City Attorney, please present the next item on the agenda. Yes, the next item on the agenda, sir, is consent calendar. And the supplemental appropriations, I'll read them. Uh, SA 3421, Fleet Operation Nationwide Insurance. SA 3621, Office of the Mayor Grant Fund, SA 3821, Planning and Zoning General Fund, SA 3921, Planning and Zoning General Fund, and a fund transfer, FT 1021. Move approval of the consent calendar. I'm second. Can I see roll call? Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mayor Buckley. Aye. Alderman Finlayson. Aye. Alderman Shandemeyer. Aye. Alderman Savage. Aye. Alderman Arnett. Aye. Alderman Payo. Aye. Mr. City Attorney, please present the next item on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is S business and miscellaneous items, beginning with supplemental appropriation SA 3521, fleet replacement, fleet replacement fund balance revenue. Move so, approval of SA 3521. Second. Can I get a second? Thank you. Second. Second. Alderman Savage. Uh, yeah, so this is, um, let's see, uh, transfer. This has to do with the uh, grant funding, the money we received from the state to replace a few buses, right? No. no? This is repairs. Oh, this is. The next one's the. Okay. Jody? Can you clarify? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the smaller ones were on the uh, consent calendar. These two here are the larger dollar ones, and this is um, giving a supplemental allocation to the fleet replacement fund so that it can use part of its excess fund balance and a transfer that it will be getting from the transportation fund in order to purchase buses. That was the next SA 35-21. This is it. That's what I'm. Yeah, the SA 35 21. Well, there, were, there are two of them, right? Yes, yeah, so there's two. To the there's purchase. two of them 35 and 37. 
Well, I mean, I think they could both be discussed at once because it's, it's still the same issue. I know this was spoken about at length at the finance committee meeting, um, and I, I did listen to it. Um, and I asked, uh, um, uh, where's Kwaku here? I did ask for the Department of Transportation for some more information. They did get it to me. Um, and, and my concerns are just kind of the same, which I know the, the chair from the finance committee mentioned, which is just, do we really need want to be purchasing these diesel buses when we know we're most likely going to be transitioning to alternative fuel in the in the near future? Uh, and it sounded like um, these vehicles have about a useful life of ten years or three hundred fifty thousand miles. So if we do get new diesel, they're going to be uh, lasting that long. I know it was discussed about um, how the. Um, I guess the department was concerned about the level of service falling if we keep using the existing buses, which are, I guess, have a lot of maintenance issues. Um, and so that's, I was asking about some of the um, options we have. I know it was also mentioned that we, the state is not supporting, uh, in terms of with their money, the purchase of electric vehicles for transit use yet. And, and currently, we end up only having to pay 20% of the bus costs where the state covers 80%. And one question I had was um, allowing, if the grant would allow us to get hybrid buses instead of um, diesel. I'm reading through this email because I <laughs> right now, um, but. I, I guess uh, Clog might be able to provide some information. Yeah, I do. So uh, my, my one question is, had to do with, could we use this grant money to purchase hybrids now instead of new diesel? Is that an option, or is it, or are they just too much in terms of additional cost? Uh, it will be additional cost because I did send you responses to all your emails. Okay, thank you. Based upon the average of three. Uh, prices from three manufacturers. Mm -hmm. The 35 foot bus would be around $792,000 versus for, for one, hybrid. versus the current one, which is for the clean diesel, which is about $382,000. So we are looking at additional city money of $410,000 on top of the 20%. So you're looking at about $500,000 from the city. Uh, for one electric bus. So you can get two diesel buses for the cost of one hybrid, it sounds like you're saying? Yes, sir. And, and would the state, w could we, if we wanted to, use the state grant money to pay for one hybrid, or would, do we have to use them to get diesel at this point? You cannot use the same grant to pay for the hybrid because, remember, uh, the a capital grant consists of 80% uh, uh, federal and um, typically 80% federal and 10% state. So you combine them. Mm -hmm. uh, for 2021, we didn't get any state funds for the capital item. That is why the city share actually went up to 20%. So if you're looking at that, uh, given the current prices of one clean diesel bus, uh, we are paying around $80,000 for one. So if you want to add money to get one um, hybrid bus, that will be $80,000 plus the $410,000. Mm -hmm. And at this time, uh, ideally, you have to look for another grant from somewhere else. Uh, some, some, think about the Department of Energy. Uh, they may have some program that we can apply for and get it. So uh, we are also looking into that as we prepare to transition to electric buses in the near future. So we will identify additional sources of grants mm -hmm. apart from what we normally get. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, okay. Um, so it sounds like it might not be too feasible um, to get a hybrid at this point with the... So you're saying if we wanted to get a hybrid, it'd be one bus and we'd have to pay more in terms of our share, it sounds like. Yes, yeah, yeah um, that is the case. And are there any other buses that we're going to need to be replacing in the next five years? Yeah, we typically have what is called the vehicle replacement plan uh, for five years. All that mm -hmm. we do is basically look at it and look at the useful life uh, in terms of years and all mileage. And you put, you put the vehicle number in the table. 
uh, whether you will get a CNG bus or a diesel bus or electric uh, a bus, it depends upon the amount of funding. So as we have said earlier, uh, as the state prepares to write the specifications for electric uh, buses, mm -hmm. uh, because it will be a statewide contract, uh, it's more likely the price will come down. And if you are picky bagging on that, we will know exactly how much additional uh, local funds that we will need in, in addition to the state and the federal grants for, for that mm -hmm. particular purchase. So how many large buses do we have in the fleet? Uh, by definition, what do you mean by large? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't okay, know. let me go this way. No, normally, small buses are up to uh, 18 uh, um, seats, passenger seats. Uh, in terms of length, it's about 26 feet long. Uh, what we have in our fleet, what is considered to be the largest one, uh, they are 30 feet long. In terms of seating capacity, uh, each one has 25 uh, six. But remember, we have seats that are folded down for ADA passengers. So when you fold them down, you are basically down to about 23 passenger seats in them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right. Um, all right, well, I guess um, I had other questions about the average. It looks like you said the average daily miles is about 150 for but I'm guessing there's some routes that what are some of the lower what what are some of the lower the shorter routes oh, shorter routes uh, one that comes to mind quickly is the state shuttle it's just from the stadium to downtown uh -huh. uh, that is the one that we typically put on the hybrid diesel bus uh, that uh, we, we, we have uh, if you take the red and the brown they are much longer uh, so we know the number of runs that each route actually has. We also know the time intervals and then the trip length. So based upon that, uh, when you did the calculation, it came out to about 150 miles a day. Mm -hmm. Of course, we, when you have the state route, it's much shorter. Yeah. All right. Well, I know this is probably this is going to be, a, I think, a, a much longer conversation we can have over the next few months. But it sounds like for the purpose of today, at least, um, you know, we, we could go with one bus replacement, which would be hybrid, but it would cost us more. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's necessarily worth it in that sense, but um, yeah, that's all uh, questions yeah, uh, I have for now. Thank you. Okay. May I add that uh, even if you have the money to buy an ele electric bus right now, we don't have the infrastructure yet. Uh, where are they going to be charged? Uh, are they going to be at ADOT? or we are going to charge them at some of the uh, transfer points, say eSport. If that's the case, uh, the city may not own the right of way, so we also need to negotiate it. You also not know that one of the major transfer points is the, is the mall, which we don't own that right of way. So in our mind, there are several other pieces that needs to be done first. In fact, in the department, we believe that buying the bus is the easiest way if funding is available. But planning for that transition, you need to train your technicians, we need to retool the maintenance shop, uh, and so on and so forth before the bus actually arrives here. So in our transition plan, as we are working on, we are looking at what are the requirements and can we have them in place before we actually uh, place an order for an electric bus? Um, director, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> city manager. <laughs> yeah, so based on the discussion of the finance committee meeting, we're planning to have a, a, a council work session to specifically discuss the EV plan for the city. Uh, so we can have that fuller discussion, but we're also going to bring in an expert that, that has, has taken uh, cities through this process of putting a plan together so we can, you know, start putting that together. The county has a plan now, so we, we don't want to mirror their plan, but that's, that'd be a good starting point for, for a city plan. So, so that's, the, that's um, sort of the next steps in this process. Thank you. Alderman Annette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I see several dilemmas here. The first is if we accept the grant, we're essentially approving the purchase of um, what is clearly an obsolete and undesirable technology. Um, the more desirable technology is to skip 
hybrid and go right to electric. It is available, it is viable. Um, there's a two-part infrastructure argument there. One is the charging stations. I don't know how many charging stations you need to have for electric buses. It seems like one at the depot would be fine. Maybe we could put another one someplace else, but I don't think that's the real issue. I think another infrastructure issue is repairs. However, I've heard that the electric vehicles are much more reliable and much easier to repair. Uh, another dilemma is I really do think that we need to be rethinking our entire transit strategy. Um, and some of it may not even ha be having our own buses uh, or buses at all. Uh, by our own buses, I do think that we need to push forward with a regional transit system, at least in partnership with the county, get them to step up and provide transit. It was pointed out to us years ago that most bus trips don't end at the city borders, and uh, yet we have a transit system that is really so focused on the city. Um, so I'd much rather see a regional transit or even a more highly technology-driven transit on demand using existing private sector. So I, I'm having a very hard time convincing myself to vote to accept this, but there's the dilemma. And when you turn down grant money, uh, which is not free because we have to match it, but also it is coming out of one of our pockets, but when we turn it down, then we're not buying buses. And I really, I don't have a firm fix on if we skipped a cycle, if we skipped a year, would we really have buses that aren't running? And I haven't, I have no ability to really know the answer to that. But I am, am thinking about it, I am really disinclined to uh, vote in favor of these two. Uh, maybe the first one, because I think there's repairs there, but the bigger one, and maybe by not accepting this grant, we can send a message to the state that they've got to get their self in gear. They've got to catch up with the times. They've got to stop insisting on this old technology and start giving us more flexibility to have uh, more uh, environmentally sound buses. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure whose hand went up first over there. I'm sorry. Alderman Pound. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Um, I think uh, we are not in a position to turn down $760,000 in the way of a grant. Uh, I agree with almost everything my colleague from Ward 8 said, but uh, it comes right down to can we afford to say no to this money, and the bottom line is we cannot. End of story. Can I just get Kwaku to give a little clarification yeah, before I go to Alderman well, Finlayson uh, and then um, Some responses to Alderman Aneta uh, uh, issues with uh, the not accepting it. Uh, if you do not accept the grant, there is no guarantee that you get more. And we have a clear case of example here in the city where we had about a quarter of a million dollars to uh, do a pilot project from here to New Carrollton. Uh, back in 2011, it was a decline. Immediately, another agency actually got the money. So the fact that you don't accept the money doesn't guarantee that you're going to get more. Uh, as I said earlier, the best way is to look at other sources of funding to add to whatever that you get. Uh, the also, the fact that you do accept the money doesn't mean that you have to buy the bus. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. The fact that you do accept the, this grant you can change your mind that you're not going to buy the bus and then just send them a letter saying that you don't want the money. They will take it back. But there is no guarantee you get more in the future. In fact, those agencies that do, that do not use your grants even get less because you, that, you have not shown the ability to utilize the grant that uh, is given to you. So if you're not going to use it, uh, there is no guarantee that you're going to get more. In fact, you may get less. If I may, Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure I want more. I'm, you know, this is going on and on and on. We're buying the same old technology over and over again. 
And I, I really think it's time to stand up and say, no, we're not. And if the state won't help us um, and the buses go belly up, so be it. Then the MTA can step in and provide the transit. But, you know, this is the same story year after year after year, and we just could continue to do the same thing, even though we have policies that say we want to go to clean technologies. We have policies that say we want to buy electric vehicles wherever we can, and yet we persist. And by accepting this grant, we are continuing in the same mode. And, and I think that we have to decide are we going to protect the environment and ourselves, our own lungs, our own air quality or not. And maybe the state will finally hear and, and change. If not, then they can come in and provide transit through MTA. I mean, I, I think this is time to, to really draw a line in the sand. So Alderman Finlayson, then Alderman Shanama, yes. then Alderman Gay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would ask my colleagues to think about the folks we're serving. Um, we have policies and practices and procedures in place. It never fails. It never fails. Um, but we don't follow up. We have known that this problem was going to come for years, probably. The uh, state has recognized the problem and are attempting to move to cleaner sources of vehicles. And they have told us that they won't be ready until around 2026. So I asked uh, Dr. Dua to do some research for us to indicate what the benefits and the detriments would be. And he was very quick to provide that information to us. But in the interim, we're not ready to go to, and, and we use diesel as a term to indicate um, what used to be. When we were, well, back in the day, when you drove behind a bus and you were in a black fog. Well, that's not what diesel is today. And I know it's an oxymoron to say, you know, clean diesel, but there is, it's very different. So we're, we're misleading folks into thinking that we're still you know, dispensing those fogs behind our buses, and we are not. We're moving too slowly, I agree, but until we create a plan that's gonna provide us with not only the resources, but the type of vehicles that we really wanna use, whether they're completely uh, electric, whether they're hybrid of you know, electric and, and some other form of energy, but we don't have a plan. So right now, we need to think about the people we're here to serve. And so I would ask you to approve this essay and then put in place the next step, which is how do we move from these types of buses to the types of buses we really want. And we have to make a commitment to pay for it. Dr. Dua has suggested that it's going to be at least half a million dollars, I think, if my addition is correct, uh, to move into a, a, a hybrid system or an electric system. And I would suggest that's just the beginning because of all of the other accoutrements that are needed to operate these buses. So let's really be serious about it. But right now, we don't impact our residents in a negative fashion by not giving them a decent vehicle to ride on. We complain that ridership is down, and part of the reasons might be because of the condition of the vehicles. So, you know, give them something decent to ride, and I would suggest that they would ride more frequently, or others would jump on board. But right now, what's before us is a need to serve our community better, and that's by giving them better vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm gonna go on two different kind of threads and tangents here, if you'll uh, indulge me. Um, first of all, I, I do want to respond to my colleagues, line in the sand, stand up for us. I worked with a bunch of people in the service industry that needed that bus to get to jo their job. So that line in the sand means they either have to try and buy a car, which, well, let's be honest, in the food service industry, you 
can't get one that's reliable and you put yourself and your finances at risk purchase, making that purchase, or they don't have their job. So just know that that line in the sand is uh, gonna be putting a lot of low income folks at risk of their employment. Uh, second of all, Dr. Duan, I'm gonna ask you a series of uh, questions that are going to be mind-bogglingly obvious, and I'm doing that for a point, it's the lawyer thing. Um, <laughs> Do people ride the bus because they either cannot or do not want to drive a car? You can just give a yes or no. It's a point, it's pointlessly silly and obvious okay. answer. So you can just kind of play along with me here. Would you say yes, people ride the bus because they cannot drive a car or do not drive a car? I would say no, because we have more choice people who actually have the vehicle, but they will ride the bus. But it is an alternative to driving a car, and sometimes people need an alternative to driving a car because they cannot or drive a car or do not drive a car or do not want to drive a car. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. So that would mean to get on the bus, you would have to walk to a stop, since we have established that it is because they cannot drive a car or do not want to drive a car. Is that a correct, fair assumption? Yes. So is it easier to walk to a bus stop if things are spread out or close together? If things are spread out, uh, it's easier to uh, walk to a bus stop. It is uh, easier to walk to a thing if they are farther away from each other and not closer together. Because it, it seems like it is easier to walk to something if it is close than if it is far. Uh, when I say spread out, meaning the route structure actually covers I a mean large if people area. people and homes are spread out far away from the bus stop. Um, our bus stops generally has a... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not attacking our bus stop location. Uh, no, is no, it just, I, there is, is it easier to walk to something far away from you or close to you? It's easier when it's closer to you. Thank you. So, uh, so if homes were closer to stops, i.e. not spread out in a development pattern that we have forced amongst our city, maybe we would get increased ridership. I'm trying to get you to support density. <laughs> I know where you are going, land use and transportation. Yeah, uh, yeah it, that makes it easier though, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Alderman Gay? Thank you. Um, I will vote against it in supporting my uh, colleagues. Uh, just as I tried to do with, I think it was the $3.7 million grant um, when I tried to block you guys from um, voting to move it forward that night. Because it's simple, as it's been stated by some of my colleagues that have been here much longer than me. We've known this is an issue. We keep saying we're gonna fix it, but we don't fix it. And so the only way that we fix it is just by making ourselves do it and not relying on this state grant funding, um, which I, I think is important, but if it's not putting us in the position where we wanna be, why would we rely on it uh, year after year? Do you see our transportation? Well, well, let me just take it back here because I, I'm obviously a huge fan of public transportation and I don't want to pick on this particular um, because uh, transportation sucks everywhere, to be honest. Um, even in big cities like Detroit, they only have a half a mile people mover is what they call it in their downtown area. And you, other way, you have to get on like long buses and stuff like that. And so... I thought that we had created this plan and the uh, transit development plan presented by um, director, then director Gordon. It was supposed to be over the course of five years and it included a series of updates. And so the, I guess my first question is where do we stand with that five year transit development plan, which included, and I understand some of the things, uh, the monies are being requested in this budget for in particular the app that will allow for um, a, a more transparent um, uh, transportation process with the user and the driver. But so where do we stand with, you know, the research into uh, finding out about uh, the hybrid or electronic buses, even after that uh, debate that we had, which was in February, I believe, when uh, I tried to stop that, it was everybody left that meeting saying, OK, we'll work harder and, you know, try to put us in the position to be able to, you know, get electric or hybrid or an on-demand mode of transportation. So where do we stand there? Uh, for the uh, transit development plan, uh, it has recommendations for short-term and long-term. Uh, as uh, Director Gordon has said earlier, 
uh, the idea is to uh, do a pilot project for microtransit, uh, basically serving some of the areas where the, those areas are not uh, suitable for a fixed route. Uh, so uh, the idea is to convert the orange route into a general demand response. Uh, one of the things that needs to be done uh, is to a way for people to call and actually book and come out with a way also to map. The, if you have many people actually calling, what is the best route to actually to use to reach them? Uh, so we were looking into that and then the pandemic hit. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, services were cut down. So the idea is that in FY 2022, uh, we are planning to embark upon that. Uh, ideally, you would like to get one-time funding to develop the platform and the phone app so that people can start using that. And then we also see general demand response as part of the future of public transportation, not fixed route. So we can build up on that. So, so you're still in the research phase because, or at least just collecting data and trying to figure out what's best because that presentation was made to us in October of 2019. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out what, what improvements has been done since then as it relates to, you know, making a more modern transportation system. We are not in the research phase. What I'm talking about is that the technology to deploy for people to actually use to make uh, the, an appointment for that. Uh, so that's where we are right now. So once we get the funding, we will just work with technology company to develop the software and then the app, and then we just start uh, implementing that. When you talk of research stage, it's more like a planning stage. We have passed that. Uh, that was done during the TDP. Uh, we are at the implementation stage. For your implementation implementation stage, stage we have different steps that we need to go through. Uh, we do have a vehicle, we do have the manpower, we don't have the software in the phone app. So that is what is remaining. Okay. Um, and then to the last point um, about the condition and what would, would increase ridership, whether the bus looks nice or not. Uh, public transportation is dirty. <laughs> the New York subway systems are filthy and people still ride them. So I don't think it has anything to do with the cleanliness or the look. It's about how efficient the transportation is. If I have to be to work at 11 a.m., but I have to get to my bus stop at 9 because it takes two hours for me to get from Eastport Terrace to the mall and then from the mall to I got to get on another bus to it's just like that's ridiculous. You know, and that's why people aren't riding because they would rather pay a friend $15 or get in a high cab or, I mean, or Uber or Lyft. It's not, I don't think it has anything to do with the condition of the buses. The buses look fine to me. It's how efficient is it? You know, and so that's the, that's the thing. Okay. Uh, if I may respond to that, uh, as uh, Alden Wenfelisian said, is the citizens. We are talking about hybrid vehicles that cost much more. And at the same time, we are talking about that it's inefficient because it takes a long time. A classic example, we have two buses on the green route. It runs at every 30 minutes. So if you're not going to buy a clean diesel bus and uh, we have money to buy only one electric bus, you put it on the green route, and now your wait time is actually going to increase from 30 minutes to one hour. So talking about all these things, the question is, where is the priority? Are we focusing on providing a high quality service to the citizens? So high quality transit service does not necessarily mean that they have to have a, a hybrid bus. In fact, for most of the riders, they don't really even, it doesn't matter to them. It's, what? I don't, and the, the rider may not care, but we care. Because I don't want a diesel bus ripping up and down the streets and 10 years when I have a kid, they don't have a clean atmosphere. That's why it's important. And so we should figure it out. We should get with the Department of Transportation as we requested in October of 2019 and again this year in February, put to get together, find the grants, find the dollars and, and get the two buses then. Buy the, buy the one uh, hybrid and then we'll find the grant money or we'll work with the department or we'll, we'll do something and we can buy it later because I just think again to my colleague's point, if we continue to kick it down the road, it'll be 2035 and the city will have 87 diesel buses and 
a single electric or hybrid bus. Obviously, that's I'm exaggerating, but you get my point. It, it just how important it is. I think what you're saying has some contradictions. At the same time, you're talking about a service efficiency where you expect a bus to be there every 10, 15 minutes. Okay. At the same time, you are also talking about, about uh, electric buses, which if you don't have enough money to buy enough to provide services at the same time, then we are not going to get your service efficiency you're talking about in terms of the frequency. What we need to think about is that how often do you want to run the bus? So how many buses do you have right now, currently? How many? We have 16. 16? Yeah. Okay. And so just so that I can, because I'm, I'm, you, you keep saying that if we buy this one, we'll lose. So how many, if we were to purchase the hybrid bus, we'd lose two, the opportunity to purchase two new diesel buses, correct? Yes, sir. And so you'd have 17 buses instead of 19. Now it's a bus replacement. I'm sorry, 18. We are, we are not expanding our bus fleet. So what is happening is that whenever the bus reaches its useful life, we find money to replace it. So unless there is expansion of service, because your expansion of service will call for additional vehicles. But so your, your, your fleet wouldn't shrink by getting, so that's not a problem. We wouldn't be uh, decreasing the, uh, the fleet size. You are just letting us know, which is, is very clear, that hybrid bus isn't going to all of a sudden, you know, make it go from 30 minutes to 15 minutes, but it's just a clean bus. That's all we're saying. No. We can work on the efficiency later, I believe, because you're saying that the routes and stuff are the problem there. And I mean, that's not, not something that we can do in, in a budget. Okay, uh, that's not what I said. What I said is this. If you want to buy an electric vehicle, given the current level of funding, you buy one. So if you take the green route, which has two buses, which runs every 30 minutes, you replace two diesel buses. But why would you, if, if the green route is the route that runs every 30 minutes and it already has two buses on it, why not, if it, that has two buses, then put the electric bus on the yellow route or something. It doesn't have to go on the green route. Uh, the, uh, Gay, uh, we don't just buy the buses and put it anywhere. We have a route structure, we have a schedule. So when I say that we have 16 buses, each one is assigned, including your spread. So if you take the red or take the brown, for instance, it has three buses so that it meets the average of 30 minutes to make it easy for people to transfer. So if you want electric buses on the brown route, okay, we need to get at least six because we cannot run your electric bus all day long. That is where- I think we're, I think you're, we're just, I'm, we have to start somewhere. We don't have to go out and buy all six right now. We just get the one, test it, see how it goes. We don't have to replace the entire route with one, just mix it in the system. That's my point. Maybe we're missing each other. I'll talk to you offline. I don't. Loman Savage. Yeah, I'd, I'd just actually like to make a motion to postpone this. Um, I just feel like we need to have more discussion. I'd like to see if we can actually get an estimate of how much it would cost to get a hybrid uh, based on, and then also an EV, and to make comparisons to see if perhaps we should look at getting one of the other models. Because I know Ellen Mayer Moyer years ago um, passed a, a clean energy, under that administration, uh, they passed uh, a clean energy vehicle requirement. I know it was determined that the trigger, there was a trigger included in there, which I don't think she may have realized, but uh, that triggered that code once we had some natural gas um, fuel station installed locally. But the point was, it required any new fleet vehicles to be alternative fuel. And we really haven't, I know we have a few hybrids on in our fleet, uh, but not very many from from what my knowledge. And um, and I, so, I mean, that was 20, 20 years ago that, that the council passed that, uh, and, and there really hasn't been much movement through that. And again, there are other technologies out there, so I really want to get a better understanding of how exactly much, how much more exactly is a hybrid. Um, and for the EVs, um, what are the infrastructure costs? I mean, because I just did, you know, I just uh, got your email this morning, Kwaku, and, and I appreciate the answers, but, you know, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to digest it enough. And I'm just doing a quick Google search, and there's, uh, you know, the, the Department of Energy 
has hired somebody to uh, a consultant. They, there's a whole report here I'm looking through that talks about um, uh, transitioning to uh, electric vehicles. It's a financial analysis of battery electric transit buses and uh, talks about like where it's appropriate to do that. But anyway, I think there's a lot of information we should look at too. So if we have if we have the ability to postpone at least even by just a few weeks or a month and without jeopardizing anything too much, I think we should. Just, uh, sorry, I was discussing the motion too second. much without a second. <laughs> sorry. Okay, we have we have a motion and a second discussion. On... Um. Yes, I would support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, postponing. Um, I think Dr. Dua is already preparing a work session for us, uh, bringing in, I think, someone from MTA? Uh, no, somebody from uh, American Bus, uh, uh, who actually has contact with several bus manufacturers. So he I have I reached out to him. He's more willing to come and uh, speak to council about the electric bus. And also, we will take the opportunity to talk about <laughs> our transition strategy to electric vehicles. So it's going to be a two-part presentation, one from an outsider uh, who is aware of what is happening, and also one from the department talks about how do we move forward to transition from our current uh, type of fleet to a zero emission vehicle. So. so my question is for Ms. Dickinson, is this timely? So I can answer part of that. We're dangerously close to the end of the fiscal year. You have one more meeting. Uh, this would not be ready by the 14th. You have a meeting on the 28th to accept this. I don't know if all this information will be available on time. And what I don't know is, does the state have a deadline by which we have to accept or reject this grant? If, if you do not accept the grant, it means we cannot place any order. Um, there is a deadline. Uh, typically, it could, be, it could be from one to two to three years, depending upon how difficult it is. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the fact that we do accept the grant doesn't mean that we have to use it. It doesn't actually um, bind you to anything to, to purchase. You can accept it now, and later on you say, well, we don't like it. Uh, we have done it before. We can send a letter to the state that, please, uh, no thank you, take the money back. So it doesn't matter. Director Dickinson. Yeah, so I wanted to clarify that if, even if it's, just, if you approve, there, I think you just stated an option to pass these but hold off on the purchase of the bus. And on the 26th, is it? The 28th, the meeting on the 28th, we are now shut down for purchase orders. We don't put in any new purchase orders the last couple weeks of June. So we'd have to waive that rule for this just to get a purchase order in. Um, so, and do you, did you say there is or is not a deadline? Do you know the deadline date by which we have to say yes or no? The, the this use, is a fiscal year 21 grant. Yeah, typically it should be accepted into the city budget so that we can use it. Uh, if it's not accepted, we cannot use it as had, has, has happened before. Uh, in terms of the actual purchase, because it takes a long time for the bus, even, even if we order it right now, it will take up to three years. Normally, they expect that within the three-year period, the bus should have been arrived or the bus that you did order should have been here. Uh, and if you don't accept it now, then it's more likely we go over the three-year period, which means the grant will not be available. I'm not clear, mm. however. <laughs> Is there a due date for this particular grant request. When must we have it in? Is it July 1 or is it a later date? I think what... Uh, uh, I just, it, wait, what's the date? The date for accepting it by for the city? For acceptance of by this the grant? City. I think the city has already accepted by uh, signing the grant agreement. Is it when, when does that have to be done? It has already been done. The grant agreement has already been done. We've already accepted the grant yes, agreement. Yes, what Judy is saying is that because the grant agreement came at after the FY 2021 budget has been approved, the city needs to actually get the money and then budget for that. So what exactly. does it mean that we've accepted the grant agreement? Does that mean we've already committed? Mr. So, n no, we apply for grants 
on a regular basis. It goes through the review of the administration and we apply for the grant. This, these measures before you, both of these supplemental appropriations are adding to our budget so that we can actually issue a purchase order for the buses. So the council, the grants do not come before council for approval. I think it was done that way a long time ago, but there's so many of them that we now do the application process within the administration. And then when we need a supplemental allocation, we come to you for this process so that we can move forward with using the monies. So let me ask this question again. Can somebody tell us exactly when, now that we've already, well, maybe we need to talk about what the commitment is because we've already signed the grant agreement. So now the question is, by what date do we have to order a bus to use this money? Yeah, a date. We, Just give us a date. <laughs> uh, by the end of the fiscal year. By the? By the end of this fiscal year. Which is June 30th? Uh, June 30th. Yeah, June 30th, yeah. So that's the timeline that we're on. So can we have a work session to gather this information prior to? You guys are the ones who made the motion. Now, do you want the information in a timely fashion or not? My answer is I want the information. We've heard the city manager say we are gonna do a work session. I think there's still a lot more information that we need to gather. Uh, I'm not convinced that if we don't buy these buses, all transit is gonna stop. We have umpty ump other buses. I think we need to take the time to get more information. but. Quite frankly, I think that we're just going to do the same thing over. We're going to continue to perpetuate the same method. So, Alderman Shandle, my head is hand up off to you, Alderman Finlayson. Uh, my question has been answered in all the back and forth, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we have a motion to postpone. I'm with Quaco, and I think we can take the money and give it back if we need to. So, I believe we should take the money. My position is going to be we should take the money. So I'm not going to vote to postpone. So we have a motion to postpone. All those in favor? Are you for uh, transit? Are you for energy efficient transit? Or for peaceful? I'm for serving the public and working on infrastructure while we get there. So I think we can still work on the plan at the same time except the money. That's my position. OK, all those in favor say aye. For postponement, yeah. Aye. All those against? Aye. No. No. Thank you. Now, we have uh, a sec motion and a second on the floor for SA 35-21. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Aye. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney, please present the next on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is SA 3721, Transportation Fund Grant. Is there a motion to approve SA 37-21? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Same. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney, please present the next item on the agenda. Yes, the next item on the agenda. Sorry, the next item on the agenda is public hearings continued, beginning with ID 11021, City of Annapolis, Notice of Proposed Real Property Tax Increase. We have received written testimony from Sue Ebbett of 947 Wind Whisper Lane, Annapolis, Maryland 21403. Mr. Mayor, point of information, is this a voting item or this is just an announcement right i think this is the public this hearing public, co yeah, continuation so, of the public hearing right when we finish the public hearing we're finished right there's no vote so we this close. is all subsumed in the ordinance yeah. yeah so thank you no vote on this so i declare I, I, alderman Penn. I, I don't know what we're Okay. We're, not, we're not voting, it's just okay. closing the public hearing. Yeah. Thank you. I declare the public hearing on ID 110-21 closed. Mr. City Attorney, please present the next item on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is legislative actions on second readers, beginning with 01021 annual budget and appropriation and property tax levy. Is there a motion to adopt 0-10-21 on second reader? So moved. 
Second. We get a second. 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 Thank you. We have um, a few amendments here. I'll probably get uh, you guys to talk them through. Excuse me, sir. We need a we need a motion to adopt or accept or consider amendments because the amendment deadline is closed. Okay. I don't we have amendments, right? They're included in the budget, so they're, they'll be talked about by Director of Finance. So we have a motion and a second we need to vote on it, and then we can bring the amendments forward? Is that what you're saying, Mr. City Attorney? Well, let me ask the Director of Finance. These amendments were the ones before the deadline, right? Correct. These okay. 19 amendments and the one on the resolution were the ones that met the deadline as set by council. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. So in my era, these are the ones that were included before the deadline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Um, I'm going to have uh, amendment number one. City Manager to talk us through the amendment number one. Uh, I, I'll be glad to walk through the amendments yeah. if we're at the right place in the in the agenda. Amendment number one is an amendment which will reduce the salaries and benefits in the Department of Public Works Engineering and Construction Division by one hundred and one thousand two hundred dollars. And it adds this appropriation to the planning and zoning de department for a hack a liaison. Can I, uh, Alderman Ed has a question. Uh, are we going to speak to the amendments? Yes. I think so. Yeah. So I oppose this amendment. So are we got a first and a second yeah. oh, just on them. Okay. We're, so. we're moving each amendment. Is that what you're saying? I, I move amendment number one. Can I get a second? Oh, I withdraw my motion. <laughs> <laughs> second. Thank you. <laughs> You're on that one with me, Alderman Gay. So, <laughs> so um, I I, um, I don't have a problem with finding money for the Haka liaison, but I have a great problem in taking this money for the transit traffic analysis out of public works. Um, I don't think I'm alone in my ward in noticing increase in traffic and also that traffic is a problem. I would note in passing that we had a hearing before the Planning Commission the other night with a, I found, reasonably exciting proposal for more public housing or affordable housing. I'm sorry, affordable housing, um, but traffic was certainly a huge issue there. I don't think we can take any resources away from looking at and analyzing traffic. Uh, so um, I, I cannot support removing money from um, public works. Even if we don't hire someone, which is my strong preference, I would certainly like to use this money to do analysis. There is a notable increase in traffic in Ward 8. Uh, it's hard to know whether that's just a return to the norm post-COVID as we uh, get back into our regular routines, but I'd like to know the answer to that. In any event, it is becoming harder and harder to make turns out of any of the side streets and um, more and more dangerous, particularly since we don't have very good control over the speed that people are traveling. So I am i cannot support this amendment as written. So I'm going to go in order that I saw hands. Alderman Savage had his hand up. Alderman um, Pindell Charles and Alderman Finlayson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question for, um, I guess, the city manager or, or the city attorney, but it'd be, is, is this new position a requirement coming out of the, what was it, the consent decree? excuse me, consent decree, <clears throat> whatever the agreement coming out of the, the original lawsuit against us, the first one? The position is being cre created at the discretion of the city manager. Um, there is a requirement to beef up our communication and contact with HACA. This is just one way to do it. I mean, it, it wasn't specifically stated. You must create a liaison. Okay, so so this is not... It's not a requirement per se. I mean, I'm asking just because, as as you know, I'm hesitant to add any any new positions at this time. Uh, I think 
as I'll get into a little bit later, you know, we actually have, at least before the amendments, uh, three less full-time equivalent FTEs employees than we did last year. Uh, it's not a, obviously any, it's not a significant decrease, but point is I'd like to see that remain the same. I think we should remain, have that remain the same until we get a handle on our uh, uh, structural deficit. So if this is, um, and I know this, granted it, it takes money from a position we weren't able to get filled and moves it over. Um, so I, mean, I guess that's good in the sense that it's shuffling around funding, but I'm, I'm still hesitant to. Uh, so can, can somebody provide more of the, the rationale f for this position? Mr. City Manager or Director Dickinson? Good morning, Sally Nash, Planning and Zoning. The idea behind this position was that there would be one designated person to work on promoting affordable housing in many different forms, including improving our relationship with HACA and our ability to communicate with them and their residents on a regular basis. It was um, part of the consent decree for something to, for City Council to consider, as Mr. Lyles mentioned. We thought it would be a good idea to say, you know, this person has been designated the liaison, and that is why we proposed the position. Okay, and and just to clarify, this does would trans, transfer money from that unfilled traffic engineer position, which I know we've had problems filling. Um, is that right? So we're essentially shifting funding from that, that, that position is, to this new one. That is my understanding. Okay. Just to clarify, we've advertised for the traffic engineer position for a year and a half, right? That is also my understanding. That position is in public works, however, yeah. so I didn't oversee that. It was, it was actually over a year. I think it was at least two years that we, because it was a year and a half ago that we had the one and only interview with, with a, a qualified candidate. Thank you. Finish on uh, Alderman Pindell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As my mother would say if she was still alive, Alderman Savage must be reading my little mind. That was the same question I had. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Alderman Finlayson. Yes, thank you. Um, City Manager Gerald, did I hear you say we've been advertising for this position for over a year or two years? Yeah, about two years. So do we not need this position or should we be restructuring that position to attract um, candidates? The, the problem right now is there's, there haven't been any qualified applicants for the position. We still need the position. That hasn't changed at all as Alderman Arnett stated. We still need it. So what the plan is is, is we're going to transfer part of that funding uh, for this HACA uh, individual and then the remaining salary will move to contract services to allow public works to contract for those traffic engineering <coughs> functions it won't be it won't be a full-time equivalent position it'll be just as needed as we need traffic engineering services we'll be able to use hire a consultant to do that work so do you feel you'll be able to attract candidates if it's a contract position we would hire a firm to do that I'm work. Sorry? We would hire a consulting firm to do that work, a traffic engineering firm to provide those services. Okay. I mean, I think this position, uh, and now that I've heard from Dr. Nash, I would support this position. I'm just very concerned about where we're taking the money from. Um, but um, if you say that we can do something different to still meet the need for traffic uh, analysis, then I'm good with it. Alderman Annette, then Alderman Gay, then Alderman Chandler. I um, really question how much traffic study you can do for about $30,000. My uh, recollection is that may be maybe two traffic studies and certainly not of any magnitude. We just had two transfers that we dealt with in the Finance Committee. One was for $10,000, one for $18,000. 
and those were very limited in focus. I would like to ask for a traffic study for Ward 8. I don't think you're going to do that for $32,000. And I think that you are really ignoring uh, a, a constant, and you know this uh, city manager, constant uh, plea from Ward 8 alone. I, don't, I won't speak for the other wards that we do something to look at this traffic, look at the patterns of signage, look at the controls for speed. I don't know that you can even do it for the full $101,000, even under contract. I'll take a contract. I'd rather have a non-staff engineer, but I think that we're really cutting this service, this need on the part of our community short. Again, I fully support the uh, planning and zoning initiative to get this kind of liaison and position working with the housing authority, but I strongly resist taking it away from traffic analysis and, and giving what I think is a pittance of money for what is a big problem. And I would just turn to my colleagues, anyone else having traffic concerns in their ward? Is it only Ward 8? Is it because everything's getting siphoned off of Forest Drive down through Eastport? I mean, I think it's a big problem and it's going to be persistent. So uh, again, I, I would really support the, the position for the housing authority, uh, but I really resist taking it away from traffic in public works. Alderman Guy was next, then Alderman Shenema, um, then Alderman Turney. Um, as I said last week, I'm uh, thrilled that the administration put this in. I'm pleased to be a supporter um, because the facts are, while Ward 8 complains about traffic a lot, the number one thing they complain about is hacker. <laughs> and, well, this position is needed. There are um, uh, plenty of issues that the city can assist in uh, aiding HACA. Um, and I think that just by having this constant line of communication outside of the executive director, outside of uh, the director of operations, um, an individual who is in this role on a daily basis, understanding not only, not just the uh, financing uh, that they need assistance with for future projects and maintenance cost and just all of those things, but the community as well and their needs um, that they don't feel that, um, you know, we hear here often um, or they don't feel uh, that is being elevated to the highest level. And so, look, the, the traffic engineer has not been filled. We can contract it out. You can get, I will support you in requesting a traffic study for Ward 8 um, in some other form, or way, shape, or form in the budget. Um, but it, it, it's not like we're, you know, removing the position that was filled. It just, it wasn't filled. So um, I would work with you on that um, at a later date. On the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm going to basically just say the only way, no matter how many traffic studies we do or remediation efforts, whatever, there's only one reliable way to deal with traffic. Get cars off roads by providing public transit, such as busing, by providing walkability or bikeability. That is the only way to get it done. Or work from home methods, that also works. Um, this traffic engineer position hasn't been filled for two years. And, you know, truth be told, I think a lot of complaints about our traffic are actually pretty overblown unless we have an actual accident. That's the only time when things shut down. Everything else, you're maybe going five miles an hour slower than the speed limit. It adds maybe one or two minutes. And um, as for Ward 8, I think a slower street and I think a slower flow of traffic in a neighborhood where a lot of people walk around actually keeps them safer. And um, I, I know my colleague has agreed with that sentiment because it keeps car crashes to a minimum. So, yeah, and uh, this position will help us actually keep housing safer in Hakka, uh, which we have had some issues with, so I think that is a much more essential fill. Alderman Turney was next, then Alderman Savage and Alderman Annette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I apologize for being late. I, I, I live with 400 constituents in my condo, and I got accosted this morning, <laughs> a delay in the lobby. 
um, I, I suggested this position a couple of years ago, and um, this is a real conundrum because you have two issues that are are really you know polar opposites here, and we have a need. My my concern about um, there's a joke in the construction industry that a consultant is somebody that takes your own watch and then tells you what time it is. Um, my my point is is that we really need. A, a traffic engineer that works for the city government. Um, we find, you know, I'm as you know, I'm constantly frustrated about our engineering, our traffic engineering over engineering. I'm sorry, I'm very vocal about that because traffic consultants sell their product. You know, they they sorry they do. It's like elevator, you know, consultants sell sell Otis and, and all that. So we need a traffic engineer that serves our interests, serves the residents' interests. So um, I, I, don't, I don't support what we're doing right now as far as using those funds for consulting. I don't think that achieves the goal of the traffic engineer. However, at the same time, if we don't have anybody that can meet um, the needs um, of, of, of you know, our, our legal requirement, I guess, is the word for hack. And so I have a question in all of this. Is there anyone else that could serve this this need, this the this legal need that we need in the in the HACA lawsuit? Sally? We can certainly work with our existing resources to do a better job for outreach with HACA. Okay then. Well then we have a opportunity to regroup. The other variable is that we have uh, a vacancy. I'm not sure how it's uh, being handled as director of transportation, who should be setting our policy and, and directing us on electric vehicles and traffic control. So um, it might be a good time to, to look for both positions at the same time. It might be a great opportunity to look for both positions at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman um, I want I to take sorry. a second to. Alderman Savage, then Alderman yeah. Annette. Who, what? Go ahead. Oh. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so I kind of yeah, adjusted my thinking on this. I, I will support this um, amendment. And I, again, because I think it's a swap in positions. Um, and I, I do, I'm not yet convinced, to be honest, of, of the need for a our own staff person focusing on traffic engineering. Uh, you know, what we, we do in my, my day job is you know, when we need, um, at least when the group needs that level of analysis, uh, we often do, we just have a contractor, a consultant on call. And I mean, there are benefits. We're, we have to remember we're a small city, so if we have one employee, uh, they only have a certain amount of supporting structure if you have a consultant, you have a larger firm who has the staff who can go out and do the actual counts to have the other expertise they can bring to the table. And so I think that is a benefit, especially if we don't need this kind of role capacity on staff 24-7, uh, so to speak. Uh, I think that's a valid way to go forward. Um, and so, and, and just quickly to my colleague from Ward 5, comments about traffic being, concerns being overblown. I mean. You know, I, I just, my constituents have a, a great concern about traffic, and I don't think it's overblown at all. You know, I think we've, we've seen what can happen, especially down in, in, in my area. And you said often during accidents, but it doesn't always take too much. And you know, we have, we have um, not just accidents, but construction that can back up traffic. And, um, you know, in, in my neck of the woods, we had one way in, one way out. We addressed that, fortunately, with the mayor's help. We took down a fence and put in a, a detour route. But you know, there are real capacity limits. We have roads that can only get so wide. And I agree with you in the sense that the way to one way to deal with it is to get cars off the road. But that really, that's a, a that's a worthy goal to do that. But I think we don't know if that's really going to be feasible because if you to get cars off the road, you have to have a high enough concentration of employment in Annapolis when so many of our folks commute out of the city. We're not going to be able to get away from that in the short term. So if we build up density in the short term with this lofty goal in the future, we're going to be having potentially contributing a significant amount of traffic. So that's why we have these traffic studies for the new development projects because some of these development projects are going to add traffic 
Um, and until we have that infrastructure in place to, to get around that, it's a matter we have to look at the, the living standards of our constituents um, who do have to deal with that traffic on a daily basis. Um, and so I just, I mean, but, you know, I, I, again, I, I hear your point. You know, I, I work down on Reaver Road, and I'd love to have a bike lane, a safe bike lane where I can get down there. And I know we're working on it, but for the time being, I'm not, I don't bike down there um, because not very frequently anyway, because of the safety issues. And again, that takes time. And I think if you want to move in that direction, we have to make sure the development's willing to pay for that. But anyway, that's a bit of a, 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 a bit of a tangent. But uh, in any case, I will support this amendment. Alderman Annette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to hasten to correct a misimpression that my colleague Alderman Gay has. Um, a couple years ago, I did a uh, priority setting exercise at a town hall uh, with my constituents to um, come up with what were the issues. And to my great surprise, it wasn't public safety, it wasn't gunshots, those were actually fairly low. Um, the number two priority was traffic, but the number one priority was improving our relationship with the housing authority. Number one priority at that town hall. So please do not think that they're not mindful of or care about that relationship. Now, I admit there's some self-interest there, but I think that it was more altruistic than that. And I, and I also will grant you that I was quite surprised that that was the number one priority for my constituents. In terms of traffic, I think that Alderman Savage just made a great point. We have members of this body who are driving to dramatically increase density, and that is only going to increase traffic problems. There are not solutions. That's one of the things that came out of the Forest Drive sector study, one of the issues that was a number one concern there. It is not going to go away. It hasn't gone away in Northern Virginia. It hasn't gone away in California. Human nature is what human nature is. And so we, there are things that we can do to control traffic in terms of signage, speed controls, those sorts of things, but those need to be done scientifically by an expert. I'm indifferent as to whether it's done by contract or done by a staff person. I'm inclined to agree with Alderman Tierney that it's good to have someone on staff that, uh, as we used to have with uh, Lily Openshaw, but um, whatever we do, but this is, this is taking away from that to do this other laudable goal, and I resist that. Alderman Gay was next, then uh, Alderman Shandlemeyer. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so again, just to kind of put things, uh, you start. So we, we can contract this out, right? You're saying. <laughs> so, so the way we do traffic engineering right now is we have one of our engineers. At least the ten years I've been here, Lisa Greco assigned to do traffic engineering, and she does really the operational aspects of traffic engineering, not the the long term studies that Alderman Arnett's talking about. Um, so we've been trying to fill that because Lisa is busy with project management. She manages all the, the large city dock projects. Uh, so we wanted to take that off her plate and hire a full-time traffic engineer. Um, but we haven't been able to do that clearly. So she's continued to do that and she has started to train another civil engineer to, to help with this function. So that is what will continue. Uh, for the more complicated uh, traffic engineering requirements, we would use a consultant to help with those. So that would be the plan. We have two civil engineers, trained civil engineers. They're not traffic engineers, but they're trained on traffic engineering that, that do the day-to-day -day function, and then we'd use a consultant for the rest. And, and then just briefly, again, really quick, because like I said, I'm voting for this, but I'm just trying to uh, create, uh, just clear the conversation up for my colleagues as it relates to uh, this and some constituents who may be listening who I don't want them to feel that um, you know, I don't care about the uh, traffic problem because I do. My biggest traffic problem, though, is not in Ward 8. It's this circle, um, memorial circle that backs traffic up every single weekend. Um, but that's a, a conversation for another point. When uh, we talked briefly a couple weeks ago, we had a great meeting, by the way, that you set up with Kwaku, uh, di I'm sorry, director. Um, and we discussed the um, 
um, the intricacies between the two departments. And as uh, my older, uh, the my colleague from War One suggested, well, moving forward, w w as we look for a uh, to a permanent director, is that something that you may envision in that role? I know you talked about um, clearing some things up there, but having a director of transportation that a actually is like. Because m most of the traffic analysis your department does, it's not done in transportation. But if you had a, a like assistance from that uh, department, it, is that something that could create um, an, an easier path moving forward to help my uh, colleague from Ward Eight and you know their concerns about traffic studies and things like that? Well, we we work with Director Dua now. He is a transportation planner. Um, we also have expertise in our department about traffic studies, and we also coordinate with public works and the county and the state. I think that, of course, you know, someone with that kind of background would be helpful, but the right now, from my understanding, is the principal mission of the transportation department is to run the transit system. So I think that would be a priority, but that can always change, you know, based on what the city council yeah, wants. Yeah, it, it probably should, because but as my colleague has suggested, and I know it's kind of been uh, disputed a little bit here, back and forth, but I'm on uh, Brooks' side with this one. You, I just don't get how, I mean, they are interfacing periodically, but it should be daily. Transportation, transit, and all the studies, they should be me. I mean, that's just how we get through this. Mm -hmm. And so I just, even when we had that meeting, I thought that you had proposed a, a really good plan. You put together that 21 page um, document on expectations and plans for traffic analysis moving forward. And so I think it, it's on the right path, but just again, the communication between those two departments has to be at uh, the top priority because I mean, they will be how we make our way out of this density hole and concern that we're in. I, uh, by I definitely improving agree. our public transportation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would add that the kind of study Alderman Arnett is talking about isn't someone a staff, something a staff member could do because we don't have the software we need to do that kind of analysis. So we, we would have to hire a consulting firm anyway to do the a, a traffic study of Ward 8, which if you know, if we did at the same level of detail we do for individual development projects, I can't imagine the cost. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm not sure it would really be something you would pursue after seeing the price tag. But um, it, we don't have the the software that is a large expense in and of itself, which is why one of the reasons why we use traffic consultants to the extent that we do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Alderman Chandler, then Alderman Pia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I've lived along Forest Drive basically since I moved to this city. And yes, traffic can be a minor inconvenience for a lot of people, but I've driven it in peak times, I've driven it at off times. And unless there is that accident, the slowest I've gone on Forest Drive has been 30 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone. And, you know, that's minorly annoying, but that's not the biggest of concerns in the grand scheme of things. Unsafe housing conditions in our, our public units, though, have caused some very severe problems that we are all aware of. Um, and I actually do think our public transportation system is adequate enough to support these growth initiatives and filling in of suburban sprawl. The issue is it's you can't really get to a bus stop unless you drive to it here, which defeats the whole purpose. You need to be able to walk to a bus stop and that only happens when things are closer together. And um, as for Northern Virginia and California, traffic is very bad there, they are. And there is a very good reason why. The zoning types allowed in those areas are single family and apartments. And things are spread. Yeah, 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 man. I, I researched this. I jump into this, man. I love this stuff. And I know California's trying to finally turn around on that. But that's either just recently passed or hasn't passed yet their state house. So, yeah, those, those two districts kind of prove my point of they, we copied their development pattern or vice versa. And it's uh, caused these traffic problems. On pen. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. City Manager, the fact is we've been trying to hire a traffic engineer for several years, correct? Correct. I mean, to my knowledge, we really haven't had a full-time traffic engineer since right when I got here. We had Larry Moore. That's and, correct. And uh, I have to question whether we'd be successful in hiring one. Do you have any thoughts about that? I, I mean, I understand we've had people before and they... They backed out at the last minute. Right. Um, we, we beat the bushes. We did national advertisements. We, we sent it to every place that we could possibly think of because I was a huge supporter and still am of hiring a traffic engineer. We just haven't been able to, to, to attract a qualified candidate. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. One minute. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I agree with Alderman Chandemeyer. We really do need to look at the transit system. I understood your question uh, to Dr. Dua. I think having more frequent, easier, easier to get to stops may well increase what has always been a very low ridership. So I support that. Uh, I don't think when I'm talking about traffic, maybe I'm not communicating what the issue is. This is not an issue of stop and go traffic, traffic moving slowly. This is an issue of getting onto the major thoroughfares out of the side streets. And we've had numerous accidents with people trying to get off of streets like Fairview, Burnside, State Street. And, and there are times when you can wait an incredible amount of time, and particularly if you're cautious, you wait a very long amount of time. And there are things that we can do to control that. I think it can be done by signage. Now that's actually going to make the traffic slower in terms of its pace down the road, but it is going to make it possible for people to get off their own street. And that's the kind of study I'm talking about. I'm not talking about making it so people can go 50 miles an hour or whatever it is to get from point A to point B in the shortest amount of time. I'm talking about safe entrance onto the main streets like Chesapeake and Bay Ridge and uh, those sorts of things. And that is becoming increasingly more difficult and unsafe. And unsafe is the operative word there. Uh, if we, I would wonder what the administration is, is instead of taking money away from traffic, did you consider any other alternative for what I consider to be a lofty goal to provide this liaison for the housing authority? I mean, of all places to go, taking it away from traffic just seems like one of the last places I would look. Apparently not. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. So this, this seemed like a good candidate simply because we haven't been able to hire a traffic engineer. So, um, you know, we, the original discussion was just uh, defunding it, taking the money out and, and using that money to, to help pay for the deficit that we have. But, but that didn't get done, so the money was still available, and we need to, to, to find money to, to fill this position. So that seemed like a, a good candidate. Thank you, Alderman Palin, and then, uh, you know, and then Alderman Pendel Charles, and then Alderman Turney. Thank you. You, you were first, you were next, Fred. Well, it, it just seems to me, I, I mean, I agree, we, we need a traffic engineer for all the reasons we've heard for the last, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour or more. Um, it's just that I have to question whether we'll ever be successful in in hiring one at this point. We've tried for... 10, 15 years. Uh, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, Alderman Pendel Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't think anyone here in any ward has had the traffic issues that we've had in Ward 3. Not only do we have them on Forest Drive, Chickwapen, and Aris T. Allen, but we had them along Upper West Street. And back in 2016, Dr. Nash uh, spearheaded the charrette in Ward 3. Uh, we looked at the study, 
We've worked extremely hard to get the traffic signal at Western Gibraltar because over the past 20 years, and I had um, police run the numbers, we've had too many fatalities, and we've had accidents there every day. Some reported, some not reported. And so what we did was we worked with the state and we got a uh, traffic signal at that intersection. The initial price tag was 150. Uh, the city pitched in 50, the county 50, the developer 50, and the state was agreed to install it. Then the price of steel went up and the price went up to 225. So we had to go and ask for 25 more from each entity. And finally, May of last year, the, um, the mayor and I ribbon cut it that and it was activated in July and it has made a tremendous difference. So much so when you come out of McDonald's, you can look all the way up westward to the traffic signal and see when the traffic stops and you can even make a left turn off of, uh, from McDonald's on Lee Street. So we're extremely happy. Um, we um, found a way to do it. Now we're still working with the Eastport uh, organization uh, to find uh, a way to address the traffic woes uh, between us. But I will say, I do believe based on what I've heard this morning, that there is definitely a need uh, for our relationship with Hacker to have someone to perform those duties. I, I can see both sides of the issue, of course, because of our traffic woes. Um, but I will say at this point, I think based on our inability to hire someone uh, appropriately, um, that we now need to move on to the next phase. And I will definitely, of course, since we've been working the past couple of years with, with Ward 8, especially in Ward 3, to come up with an alternative to uh, look at these traffic woes. But we are very pleased, give a shout out, because that's what this is for as well, for our traffic signal, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Owen Cerny? Yeah, I just want to say quickly, um, that I think we've spent the last hour talking about transit or transportation in one way uh, or another, and so I would I would like us all to get a copy um, of the of the um, the ap the uh, ap application for our director of transportation, so that we as councilmen can all have input into it. Because I think we're on the verge of some kind of paradigm shift here that somebody's got to take charge. Um, we're too compartmentalized. We can't isolate transportation from planning and zoning and from um, you know engineering I, I think you know we're just really stuck here uh, so I think you know we can wait for this you know new department head um, and not jeopardize this incredible liability we may have if we if we if we don't find any other money to support this this hack of liaison position okay I think we can ready to vote and it took an hour Looking good. <laughs> um, all those in favor of amendment number one say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Who said no? Thank you. Ah. Okay, on to amendment number three. Could somebody, amendment number two, please? Somebody move amendment number two. So moved. Second, please. Second. Director Dickinson. Amendment number two, adds $65,000 of capital outlay funding to MIT uh, using the reserve for one-time uses. Any discussion? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what, is, uh, what are we going to be using this increased funding on with our, um, with our MIT? Would you like to come forward, Brian? And uh, while you're walking up, I'm also going to go, can some of that go to cybersecurity? Because we're seeing a lot of stuff in the news for how that's a big issue in a lot of cities and companies. Absolutely. Um, so 25000 of that money is actually uh, earmarked for hardware and software replacement at the police department, which ties directly into cybersecurity. Aging hardware and, and software platforms are one of the leading causes of falling victim to things like ransomware. Um, the additional um, fund transfer, this is, is this the FT, Katie? 
It was just, this is the amendment. Um, so yeah, the additional amendment was to restore some funding that um, there was a little bit of a, a misunderstanding. We gave up some, um, some funding um, in order to assist with what was the upcoming budget shortfall. Um, there was a little bit of a misunderstanding as far as what we were giving back. Um, and this, the, the remainder of this amendment is just kind of restoring us to a feasible funding level in our capital outlay account. Um, historically, we've gotten about 250 to 260,000 a year. Uh, I believe we're at 211 for this year. So it's about a $40,000 savings over our, um, our typical ask. Um, but that's kind of our baseline of what we need to keep things moving and keep things safe. Got it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. So the uh, the original budget uh, in the budget book was 146, um, and then so this will get us back to 211, is what Ms. Connolly was saying. Aye. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Okay. Thank you, guys. Amendment number two passes. Uh, amendment number three. Somebody please move that. Second. And Jody. Amendment number three adds $4,450 to the Community Development Block Grant to add some funding to the project for Hacka Robinwood. It reflects the final award coming from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The first and the second, then Alderman Gay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I literally just called Paul to make sure director of operations. Um, this funding is, will be used to um, assist uh, with the continuation of the air conditioning projects in uh, Robinwood. They're about 70% done. I mean, a lot of units still don't have central air in the year 2021. Um, and it's crazy. And so I'm hoping that um, this will assist. ACDS is also uh, working on this uh, with them. It's really the back units. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can get this done pretty soon because there's still about 50 or 60 families without um, air conditioning. And so, um, yeah, just if you guys could help with this, that'd be great. Thank you. And obviously, the mayor is sponsoring it. So thank you. Thank you. Alderman is $4,450 enough to give 50 families air conditioning? It's um, adding to uh, funds that were already provided from the CBDG grants. And so I think this is just a, re a request for the amount they needed, Jody. I'm sorry. Correct. This okay. is, there's already some funding set aside for this. And when we got the final award amount, they had added $4,400 for this particular purpose. Thank you. So it's federal money, Jody? So it's it's HUD money, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, HUD a HUD award increase. Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Amendment number three passes. Can someone move an amendment number four, please? Second. The second. Thank you. Okay, amendment Richard number Dickinson. four. Amendment number four will add four hundred thousand of construction cost and two twenty thousand dollars of overhead to the maintenance facility project in FY twenty two. The funding source for this increase is bonds. Alderman Chandler. Uh, I actually believe my colleague uh, Alderman Payon had his hand up first, and then Thank I will you. go Thank if you, you don't mind. What What exactly is this going to be used for? I mean, construction is a very generic term. So uh, as we've moved through the design process for this for this project, there's been some things that we had to add. We had to relocate the uh, the, the shed for the salt to a different part of the site. We uh, had to add some additional costs for some of the other environmental issues. Part of it's just a general cost escalation of construction costs. So okay. this is just going to the overall project uh, funding. So this will increase the environmental viability of the project to it, some extent? It will, it, yeah, okay. it allows us to meet all of the environmental requirements of the project. Thank you. 
Uh, my questions have been answered. Thank you. Any other hands? Alderman Gay? I just would hope that this puts the um, end to this because I feel like every, they just keep coming back with designs. And so my question is also, is it possible um, to um, use, uh, well, I guess I can't, Never mind, because it's too late. But I know that they had in the budget a set aside, just like $75,000 for the existing salt um, dome to, to, be, to stay there and be maintained um, so that they wouldn't have to transport it. And so maybe that's something they could, but. Oh, attorney. Thank you. Um, well, it's a, this is a big ouch, <laughs> but um, in all seriousness, is the, um, the sale of our city property on Spa Road, both sides? Would that be uh, part of the? Um, would would could that be used to offset any of the cost of this project? So the, t the timing's not going to line properly. We've got to have the, the funding for the construction first. We need to finish the construction so we can move off of the spa road site. And at that point, the council will need to sort of decide what that is to become, the spa road site. So it's going to be a step-by-step -step process. None of, that, um, none of those receipts that we're going to get from selling the spa road property have been included in this, but that certainly will offset some of the costs. Right, that's 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 good to know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Gay. Sorry, I missed that. You said what property? The spa, the spa road, uh, the old site on Spa Road, the old DPW site. Yeah. that's city um, property. We, yeah, and I, we don't know what we're gonna do with I, it. We should keep. We the city should not sell that land. We should own that land and create affordable housing. Um, yeah. There. Right. So we should definitely not sell that to offset yeah. the cost of this. No, and, no. Yeah, the purpose of my question was to make sure that we didn't, um, I should have rephrased it, that we didn't include that oh, okay. anticipated, yeah. you it, know, so. And it, while it, we're on that, just because we're at this this point with the um, uh, D DPD swap and all of that stuff, where do we stand with the um, remediation of the existing land? I know they said they had to do some environmental tests, and that's why I'm so... Um, angry about this, the, the idea of keeping the salt facility there for another year and a half. I would like to get that, well, I'm not the person in charge, but I would get with my colleagues and see if we could get that land as ready as possible for future development so that we you know, aren't five years down the road and it's still just a nasty eyesore. Um, but so where do we stand with that? So there's, so there's two parts to that. Uh, there's uh, the Weems Wayland playing field, which is the, where all of the, uh, the incinerator ash was disposed of. So that's where the study's still being done. And then there's all of the other land that, that, that wasn't subject to that. It wasn't. So that's, that's, cl that's cleaner. Uh, so that's the area that could be developed. I'm not sure that the Weems Wayland field will ever be developable without removing all of that incinerator ash, which would be very expensive. So what we're moving towards is, is to, to put an additional cap over that so it can remain as a playing field, and we'll be able to open it back up and allow the kids to use it for yeah. soccer and so forth. Yeah, it would be a, a gorgeous, I just, every time I ride past, I just imagine really nice, affordable houses, and that playing space in the back staying the same, but being, um, you know, updated, and I'll get into it later on, um, hopefully with some of my amendments, but that could be a jewel for the city as it relates to recreational spaces. And uh, Gavin, I know that you had talked about that a lot. And um, so, yeah, I'd love to see that, but I, I'm happy that the $400,020 is being requested. And once we they get this funding, um, it, it, do you expect the, the uh, constructors to then come back and say, like, where, where do we stand on the timeline of the project as well? That's my last question. Sure. So we, we have a design builder. So the, the builder has actually been working with the designer all along to, to keep up with what the budget cost is going to be. Um, they're completing the design. We need to get it permitted. And then the, the uh, current schedule is to start construction this fall. So again, we've already got the construction company on board. We've had them for you know for all these years, but uh, they're ready to go. 
Alderman Shannon was next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Gerald, um, so with the transfer of the, the salt and stuff, uh, so is the plan for that basically to keep it as is until we run out of the, the salt and then we just put new deliveries at the new facility or? i like Director Johnson to address that. Uh, good morning, Mike Johnson, Public Works. Um, the plan is just to keep it until the city no longer, um, our city has an alternative purpose for it. It gives us, our, our, our new salt barn will hold about 800 tons, which gives us like one season's worth of uh, salt. Uh, this would just be additional inventory of salt, because particularly in hard wind, harsh winters, we sometimes have difficulty um, get sourcing salt as a small uh, re recipient. So this just uh, gives us a buffer. Okay. Yeah, that's the intent. And I'm, I'm gonna ask one more question. I apologize if this is silly. Uh, is there a reason we couldn't put the buffer salt in the new facility? Is it just not big enough to contain it, or is it just because we got the space for now, let's just keep doing what we're doing? Yeah, it's not big enough. The, the, new, the new facility just holds 800 tons. This mm -hmm. would give us um, probably somewhere around 1,400 tons, so which, you know, it's just additional supply of salt okay. as sense. a buffer for harsh winters. Cool. I uh, grew up in an area with very harsh winters, and my town once ran out of salt, so uh, I can understand the concern. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of amendment number four, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank I'm you. Just because I'm just sustaining, I just think like they're going to come back again for some more money. <coughs> Okay, uh, somebody please move amendment number five. So move. And second. <coughs> Thank you, Director Dickinson. The, yes, this amendment will reallocate $5,000 of community grants from the Street Angel Project to Peerless Rens. This was based on a recommendation from the Finance Committee. All right, any discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor, oh, Alderman Pan, sorry. I think the Street Angel Project is uh, doing excellent work. Uh, it's an anti-drug organization that provides uh, lots of counseling, uh, uh, pointing people in the right direction, that sort of thing. They work with a number of projects that are out of your office. And I think uh, it it's an, it appears to be an excellent program. I know that people on your staff highly recommended it. I think that that money is much better spent um, in that as uh, on on uh, well on anti-drug projects than it is um, on a social club, albeit a historic social club. Um, I just think it's uh, better spent right where it is. Thank you, Alderman Pindell Charles and Alderman Finlayson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to have a word with Alderman Payon before we vote. Alderman Finlayson, and then Alderman yes. Gay. Um, the Angel Project is a very valuable project, and there's no question about that. Uh, they are a new project in oh, the city uh, and great. making a new request of the city. Um, so nothing taking away from the benefits that they bring. On the other hand, Pierce is a historical institution. I'm sorry. Okay, let me back up. Uh, the Angel Project is a new project in the city. They do great work. Um, the moving of this funds doesn't take anything away from the value of what they do. Um, as I said, they are a new project coming before us. You know, our effort uh, with these community grants is to provide for the organizations that do things that we cannot do. Peerless Wrens Club is a historical institution in our community. We have been working hard to try to sustain that institution over many years. Uh, with this effort to help them uh, enhance their location and make it handicap accessible, which it has never been, is a, a long-term benefit for historical structure. So for that reason, I am asking that you support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Pindell-Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, I agree with all the women Finlayson regarding the Peerless Wrens Club. Um, uh, I had spoken with them uh, about a, two years ago, I guess even making it a local historic landmark like the Parole Health Center. But I have worked with Ms. Shirley many, many, many times, and I'm still working with her, and we have some things we're going to talk about um, that will enhance her programming. So I feel comfortable in um, supporting this legislation based on my conversations and my relationship with Ms. Shirley. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Gay. Thank you. Um, I will um, eventually support this amendment because I've, in my amendments, hopefully later on, can get some money back to the Street Angel Projects. Um, just trying to do both, understanding the extremely important work that Street Angels does, not only in Ward 2, but also in Ward 6, and assisting um, uh, assisting our communities who are going through uh, uh, some time, and particularly with uh, drug addiction. And to the older woman's point, the purpose of the uh, community grants uh, should be to invest in those, I'm sorry, to the alderman's point, should be to invest in those critical uh, programs that are assisting our, our most vulnerable citizens. Um, and so uh, I will support this, I, you, you know, my issue with the peerless rents is one, it is a business. Businesses should not be applying for community grants for improvements to their facilities. Because if we do it for peerless wrens, why wouldn't we do it for Acme? You know, we get into this thing where now people are relying on community grants for business enhancements. I, I do, and, and I would hope that if they are changing their uh, motto to a more community geared social club, uh, that we, we uh, us as older uh, people could work with them to enhance that process. Because it could be a gem in the city in particular for black youth um, who really don't have a hub um, to associate themselves with. And that could be a social atmosphere. Um, but that I think that is a project that is down the road in, um, in how they operate and what programs and things come uh, to uh, Peerless Rens. I remember when uh, Gavin uh, was running, they did a number of really cool programs that turned out young folks. They did Wine and Wings where they would on Wednesday nights and it'd be poetry and stuff. And so that's what helps generate, you know, revenue and helps put places back on the map. It's just creating interest in the business. Um, and so I would be uh, interested in helping you uh, with that as well, Alder Woman. Uh, but and I support your amendment. Thank you. Alderman Turney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just um, concerned about process here. I was wondering if um, perhaps Lynn Farrow could to tell us, um, you know, what's the background about this, who, you know, Street Angels application versus this, et cetera. Because I know we have a process, and I know the council can make amendments accordingly, but I just want to make sure. Yes. Um, so it is the council's um, ultimate decision um, to determine which organizations get what amount of funding. Um, and the, um, but we did have a review committee as you know, and uh, um, and the review committee recommended a different funding amount, but that is null and void once the council. And I, I won't say that, um, you know, the, the, the review committee has its own reasoning for um, wanting to support one organization over the other, or one organization at a different level than the other. Um, and many times it's based on the amount of, ref of funding requested. Um, and I will say that um, members of the review committee were very co uh, committed to um, providing us uh, the services that Street Angel Project provides um, to city residents and the importance of, um, of those services and that there wasn't another organization that submitted a request to us to provide those services. So that was, that was one thing. Um, but I will also, um, to Alderman Gay's um, uh, question or comments, um, Peerless Runs is a nonprofit organization, and so it is it is a business, but just a business just like any other nonprofit organization is a business. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a process person, so I just wanted to understand that. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Uh, all those in favour of aye. Amendment Number Five, say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Somebody, please move Amendment Number Six. So move. Get a second. Director Dickinson. Amendment number six adds $5,000 to the city manager's office in order to fund the administrative costs of a task force that will explore merging city services with Anne Arundel County. The source of this funding is the reserve for one-time uses. Alderman Finlayson. Um, I thought we had, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought we had changed that amount to a higher dollar amount. Mm -hmm. No? 5,000 is going to do it? The, yeah. um, the uh, survey. <clears throat> we changed the survey from 5,000 to 50. This is the task force. This is the task force. Okay. Um, I would like to speak to it, though, now that you've clarified yes. that. Um, last week I received a package delivered uh, to me here from a Mrs. Florestano. Uh, you may recall her husband was the president of the community college for many, many, many years. A uh, very distinguished gentleman, as well as a member of the Board of Ed. Uh, Ms. Florestano is a researcher and a professor at the community college, or she was. Uh, she sent me a packet of information of a survey, a task force, not a survey, a task force that had been done, and I want to say it was in the 80s, could have been in the 90s, on this very same topic. <laughs> so not a new subject. So when we, um, and I thanked her, and she called me this morning, because um, she had gotten my message. But anyway, I think it's a good foundation for the task force to have, and I will share this information. This research has been done, and while it needs to be updated, there's no question about it. Um, the, the, some of the policies and procedures, I suspect, haven't changed drastically. So anyway, this task force is um, vital, I believe, and we have a starting point. And so thank you, Ms. Florestano, if you're watching, uh, for sharing that, and I will pass that information on to the task force when it's created, hopefully, um, this summer. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Turney, then Alderman Payon. Yeah, I don't know how we're dealing with amending amendments, <laughs> but I think uh, we did discuss, because I brought up at the work session that we should really um, focus, or I'd like it to focus on our transit. Um, and I didn't know if that was included in the five thousand dollars. I think, I think transit is a really viable, um, you know, opportunity to to um, merge. Uh, I used to hate to use the word merge because I'm not really sure what I'm talking about. You know, whether it's just extension of services. Um, you know, not. Um, but but anyways, I, I I would really emphasize that that be a real viable <coughs> part of the study and whether or not that would um, create a, an ad for you know a couple more thousand or not. Shall I introduce a floor amendment to introduce to add 2,000 for transit? Um, Jody, oh. can you clarify? I, I didn't write anything. So I, I don't, it, it's my understanding you can't amend an <laughs> amendment. You would have to introduce another amendment yeah. To change whatever it is you want to change and, and overwrite this one. And that would be a consideration for later okay. when the council decides whether or not to um, consider other amendments. Okay. If, if I could just, just add that I, I think that this, this item is sort of overarching for, for all city services to, to combine with the county, which would include transit potentially. Um, I think the problem is there's no transit organization right now in the county to, to merge with it. It really should be regional, and I think we all know that. But but there's no nothing for them to merge with in the county right, right. now. Right. That's why I caught, you know it isn't the word merge. It's just to combine services somehow, so that we're not just an extension. Thank you, Alderman Pern and Alderman Finlayson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hesitate to provide money for a uh, task force that hasn't been created yet. I think that uh, it's, it's probably a bad practice, given that the source of the $5,000 here is the 
reserve fund, pretty sure that you have the right to dip into the reserve fund uh, if you think it's appropriate at a at a different time than right now. Yeah. I think that um, does this, uh, I, I just don't think this is the appropriate time and I'm not sure <clears throat> we need $5,000. We don't know the makeup of the task force. We don't know what form their meetings are gonna take or whether in fact they really need this. So I think uh, we shouldn't be voting it in right now. Maybe later, not now. Thank you. Alderman Finlayson and Alderman Onet. Um, I'd first of all like to remind Alderman Payon that he's one of the sponsors on this amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start there. Um, secondly. Every vote in the finance committee was not <laughs> unanimous, as you know. Okay. Well, you can this take your was. name off. It's all good. Um, I would just like to remind <clears throat> everyone that the purpose of this survey or this task force uh, is to help dispel an ongoing myth, oh, I shouldn't say that, an ongoing concern about us merging our police and fire with Anne Arundel County. We hear it every year during the budget process. And so this task force will be um, empowered to do the research um, to see if it is really viable to make those that merger or those mergers take place. I would vote against adding transit, and you all have said why already, so I don't need to repeat that. Um, transit, it's very valuable to have a task force of its own, and I would support that, but this task force is about merging our uh, particularly public safety services with Anne Arundel County. Uh, and while it hasn't been created many times, uh, public works facility being one, we create the task force in legislation and then we go back and we put all the pieces together to make it happen. And we've been extremely successful with doing it that way. So I would ask that we support this amendment, number 10. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ed, then Alderman Savage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I agree with what Alderwoman Finlayson said, almost. I, def I definitely think this is wide open. The task force will determine uh, what it looks at. Clearly, the major emphasis points have been public safety and public works. Um, could be public administration. The $5,000 the $5, is a placeholder. If we need more, we can always get it out of the contingency fund. If we don't need it at all, this will fall to fund balance, and it's, it is really to be sure that uh, if it's needed, it's readily available. If it's not needed, we don't need to worry about it. But, um, and I think the $5,000 is a fairly arbitrary figure. Nobody really knows what we're gonna get into when this task force gets going. And it may not need any or may need more. Thank you, Alderman Savage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mary. I just want to confirm with um, the, the primary sponsor. So is this, it's, is I'm not, I haven't made up my mind on one way or another in terms of merging. I just want to get information. Is, is the intention just to get that kind of, I know we have to set the parameters for the task force still, but the idea is just to get, have them get information and give an objective analysis about recommendation or feasibility one way or another. Well, I envision, and I haven't had this discussion with the city manager, but I envision that we will um, have a task force that is made up of officials from the county, uh, authority, uh, decision makers, uh, experts, I should say, best word, experts, in both police and fire to one, determine if the county is even open to having this discussion. And two, if it were to take place, and I feel guilty because my experts are out here, um, if it were to take place, what would the benefits be to both them and us? And what would the um, weaknesses be for both them, being the county, and us? Um, because the impression is that if we merge our police and fire with the county, one, there's gonna be a cost savings. And there's no indication that the county is willing, one, to take us, and two, to take us for free. And secondly, 
evaluation of the changes in service, whether we will have the same level of service for our constituents that we have now. If we merge with the county, are they going to keep three fire stations in the city of Annapolis in our seven square miles? I'm not going to say what I think, but I have an idea. And likewise with our police. Would we have the same, and I never get the word right, whatever their regions are that they, they work, you know, are we going to have that same level of attention? Um, but that's what this task force would be charged at looking at and bringing us back the facts, nothing but the facts. Did okay. I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I wholeheartedly support the, the idea, uh, the attempt to get more information and get clarification. I'm just wondering now if, I'm just wondering now, I guess, I guess we, I mean, we talk about this later in terms of the makeup of the task force, but I'm wondering if, if it would make sense to bring in a, a consultant of some kind to kind of be an outside party who goes to these individuals. Um, because I don't know if that would necessarily be, be best served with a task force who contains people from both entities or from an outside party, kind of like an independent arbiter who's going to come in and listen to these folks. I don't know, maybe we can combine approaches, but I'm just kind of wondering if, if that, but I guess we can always change it if we end up needing more money, um, depending on the approach. If I might, I, I will share with you um, the task force on the public works facility. And I personally selected all 22 or 24 of those people, um, most of whom I didn't know personally, but I knew by reputation. Uh, Mr. Flores, who's the expert on Forest Drive, he is the county employee that is totally in charge with every aspect of Forest Drive. He was on the committee. So I would look to uh, City Manager Gerald um, to determine whether there needs to be an outside facilitator, let's say. But my hope would be that we would bring in the people from the county as well as the city who have the most expertise in the areas that we're looking at and maybe a facilitator from the college or some independent group. Um, Mr. Gerald, I don't know whether you've thought about how this is gonna work or not. Yeah, I actually have, have not yet. But, <laughs> it's okay. But, but I can tell you back, in addition to the study back in the 80s, we did a study back in around 2011, I guess, of whether we should build a new water treatment plant or simply buy water mm -hmm. from, the, from the county. And it was a very in-depth study in which the county actively participated because they were interested in, in providing us water. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out that the cost was essentially neutral. It wasn't more expensive, but it wasn't less expensive um, for the county to provide us water. So we ended up building our own because we felt like it was worthwhile to control, um, our, control our destiny as far as the water goes. Uh, but, but we would, I think, want to model it on something like that, assuming that they were interested, but figure out the the activities that they would be interested in taking over and then form subgroups that would focus in on those specific mm -hmm. functions. Mm -hmm. And I do remember when we did that study, and maybe that's where I got the idea. It wasn't an original thought. Um, but yeah, so bringing in the experts in, in their different categories to help us make a wise decision. So thank you. Alderman Gay was next. And Thanks. Um, agree with the plan i think we should move forward uh with getting the research that's the most important thing um what i, I will say though is that i remember the union people were here a couple weeks ago when the police were here um and they weren't really pleased to hear the news so um i, I think making it clear that look i mean we're just trying to get the information we're not really moving forward with anything yet and i think that what should be included in this task force, I don't know if it's the place or not, but because it appears to be at the center of some morale issues, how can we then improve, I don't know, boost morale within these individual departments if we don't go this route or if we do go this route? Just, I, I guess just some, um, some aspect of the task force should just look at how we assist the employees with the transition or with no transition. You, you get what I'm saying? I get exactly what you're saying, okay. and that is always, I'll repeat, always a consideration for me. 
Um, and so I, I did not hear um, negatives from the rank and file, not that there may have been some, um, but I would want them at the table because absolutely they know their business better than all of us put together, plus some. Uh, and so we can't begin to speak on how they would be impacted. Their voice needs to be there. So they can count on, if I have anything to do with it, that their voice is at the table. Okay, so um, Alderman Pendell Charles and Alderman Payone, I think, and then Alderman Shannon Myers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I always harken back, especially when it comes to the water. I think Mr. Gerald can vouch for this. Isn't, we have never had a problem with the water in a hundred, I mean, there's always, what, what is that data point about the water, uh, the Annapolis water? Right, yeah, we just had our 100th anniversary, I think two years ago maybe. So yeah, 102 years of providing water safely. So that is extremely important and I uh, relate that to our class one fire department um, as well. And we wanna keep that designation because that does affect our insurance rates. So that's a, an extremely important point to keep in mind that we keep a heightened sense of um, professionalism. Not, I'm not saying the county isn't, don't get me wrong, but I just like to tout what we have here in the city. Thank you. Hold on, Pan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would remind my colleagues, not that they need reminding, but uh, this is only for administrative cost. It isn't for a vote regarding forming the task force. Um, I'm all for that. I just don't think we need at this juncture $5,000 in administrative costs before we even have the task force um, appointed and uh, about to take action. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Shanamaya. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Alderman Finlayson, uh, so with this task force being set up, we, we've we guaranteed our, our public employees that we will have uh, their their voices at the table. All right, cool. <laughs> I was just reminded, the task force that we did for the public works facility, we didn't have a budget. So uh, we're ahead of the game already in this with this task force. Thank you. I don't right. um, take a, a little bit more time. Uh, so what's, what's the usual procedure here for these task forces? Um, is it money first, then task force, or a task force first, and then we get the money? Because I, I want to get a little more info on Alderman Payon's point. Mr. City Manager? So, or is that half the fun of task forces? Or is that half the fun of task forces? Yeah, so no normally we don't provide money, so you can thank Alderman Gay for this, because for his affordable housing task force, he included $5,000 of administrative cost. It seemed like a good idea, because there definitely are costs that go with it. Most of the, most of the time is free, but you know, there's, there's paper and there's reports and there's editing and all of that. So, so we thought it would be good to get ahead of that and provide $5,000. So this makes us a little more uh, formal and a little less improv improvisational. Right. Oh, cool. Well, for, for, those of, for those of you who may not know, Alderwoman Finlayson, I think, has the patent on forming task forces. <laughs> so I have no doubt this is going to go full speed ahead. My, my only question is when you say um, Alderwoman Finlayson, if they want us or if this is a viable, is that something that's going to happen, you know, um, before the task force is formed? I mean, is this a conversation between the city manager and the county executive on do we want to even pursue this? I mean, is that conversation going to be had first? Well, I don't think we know whether we want to pursue this until we gather all the data. Okay, so and data first and then pursue. Okay. Right. I, I, you know, because we get concerns and questions all the time about why we don't do this, one of the first things we should be doing is having a discussion with the county to see if there's any consideration at all um, for merging our services and, and then getting into the implications of such a merger. You know, who's going to benefit? What would it cost? Um, how would the city residents be impacted? Those things are part of the discussion uh, when before we can possibly make a decision or whether the county will make a decision about whether they want us or not. 
And okay. I'll take Queen of Task Force any day. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, okay. All those in favour of amendment number six, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Amendment number six carries. Somebody please move amendment number seven. So moved. Second, please. Director Dickinson. Yes, this amendment will add $50,000 using the reserve for one-time uses. We'll add it to the city manager's office for a community survey to assess the priorities of the residents. Thank you. Alderman Manette had his hand up first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would um, remind and, and inform some of the newer council members, but uh, we had in 2012 a uh, whole dashboard and community survey system in place. And so in some senses, this is returning us back to a system we had. Uh, unfortunately, that went live right at the end of a term and, and got lost, but uh, it really did provide valuable information. I've heard criticism from some people as recently as in the paper over the weekend that this won't turn up anything, uh, <clears throat> that people are going to say, they want everything, they just don't want to pay for it. And, and that certainly could happen. But I would hearken back to what I just said a little bit ago when I did an exercise with my ward in, and sought out opinions from people. And people can surprise you. I mean, people do do a lot of thinking about these things. And it really is information we need to know. And I, I certainly applaud this. This was uh, the um, initiation of Alderwoman Finlayson during the Finance Committee meeting, but I think that it is something that we definitely need to do, and we'll see how it turns out, but I think we need to do it on a regular basis. Opinions do change, and um, we need to have some way to reflect that. And I think our constituents will, will appreciate mm -hmm. the ability to give us some direct input through this survey. So I, I strongly support this. I hope $50,000 is enough. We'll find out, but um, I think that it, it, we really do need to do it properly, but I specifically think we need to do it. Thank you, Alderman Finlayson, then Alderman Gay, and then Alderman Payone. Um, yes, I, I couldn't agree with Alderman Arnett uh, more, um, and particularly the fact that the community has the opportunity to weigh in. It's been a long time. Um, they've been relying on us to assume or we do our individual research. Um, but what they value the most has to be recorded in some form or fashion. And so this survey, my hope is that this survey will help us see what they prioritize. And if it comes back that they don't want to give up anything, that everything's a priority, then the question is how we pay for it and if they're willing to pay for what they want. So I think this is a vital uh, tool. I've been asking for it for a number of years and we got it. So thank you everyone for supporting this prematurely, I know, but thank you. Alderman Gay. Um, my concern, obviously I'm supporting it. I would hope that uh, the community participates. My concern is just making sure that it's not dominated by um, uh, some of the more prominent uh, uh, civic associations or, 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 or service groups um, and, and making sure that this is an equitable survey that um, hears from all residents uh, in across socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. And so that means that we will need to use some of this money at some point to probably do some boots on the grounds, you know, flyers or actually doing written surveys in communities, maybe in, in, in partnership with some of these um, uh, organizations that are out of the mayor's office working in uh, some of our uh, minority and underserved communities. Um, because I think that will also give us a better understanding of what's going on in some of the more working class communities. I feel like we know what uh, others are concerned about. Um, and those are often at the forefront of our conversations, in particular in this budget. And so I just think that, yeah, making sure that we hear from everybody is extremely important. But I look forward to uh, this report. Mr. Mayor, may I respond? Sure. Um, I First of all, I don't suspect that this is going to be done in-house. 
I think we will have to get an independent agency to do this, and they know the rules. But we will give them the parameters and make sure that every demographic in our city is fairly represented. And they're not going to all be reached in the same fashion. You know, everybody's not going to get an email or, you know, there will be people, I suspect, my hope is, that there will be knocks on doors saying, you know, we have the city survey, give me a minute, you know. So that's already part of my thinking, that every demographic in the city should have a fair representation. Thank you. you. Alderman Pound. Thank you, Alderman Thank you Mr. Turner. Mayor. I uh, frequently agree on finance committee matters and others with my colleague from Ward 4, but I have to say I strongly disagree here. I always thought that it was my job as an alder person to um, assess the priorities of the residents of my ward and uh, act accordingly. Um, I don't think I need a $50,000 survey to tell you what people in my ward prioritize. On top of that, it's really not that difficult to do what Alderman Arnett did a couple of years ago at his town hall meeting. I was at that meeting and it was done beautifully. And uh, I think we learned a lot, at least I learned a lot from that. And I know he did. I think this is uh, way more money than we need to uh, uh, set aside for this. I think that if you're really going to do it right, and the way my colleague from Ward 4 described it, it's going to cost a lot more than $50,000. But having said that, I don't think we really need to do any of that. We all need to you know, go back and, and uh, conduct our own polls in our own wards and get our own opinions. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Oh, attorney. Um, thank you. Um, this is my own personal view. It's, it's, you know, when I, I can just imagine if I'm going door knocking to my constituents and, and I ask them, you know, what are their concerns and da, 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 da. And I have this, and I don't mean to be just, you know, I have this piece of paper that says, oh, no, no, no. It says here that your main concern is da, da, da. I, I think that this is very impersonal. I, I think it's, it's, it's our job. Hey, we just got a big raise <laughs> that we, you know, we represent our constituents in, in all various, uh, you know, demographics and wards that this, this is, this is just going to be a big mess. And, and it's, cause it is messy. We all represent our residents and we bring their needs to the table. That's our job. And, um, I don't think this survey is necessary at all. Thanks. Hold on, Annette. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I appreciate the compliment from Alderman Payone. That really was a very worthwhile exercise. But I would, I would don't point, get used to it. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, but I would point out that Alderman Gay raises a very valid point and why we need professional help. That was a meeting of the usual. 80 or so people that come to my town hall. I have 5,000 residents. I hope they were representative of the other residents, but uh, Ward 8 is very activist ward. Uh, I think that, and of course I want Ward 8's druthers to be heard, but I think this is a citywide survey and we want everybody's druthers and we do need professional and um, Alderman Preyon, I'm afraid you might be right. I think we might find that to do this right, to do it the way Alderman Gay is suggesting, will be more expensive. Um, and if that's the case, we'll have to find the money. But I strongly subscribe to doing both. Alderwoman Tierney, I, I, certainly you should be doing your own legwork as all of us should be doing in our wards. But I think that that is not a professional survey. I spent a good portion of my career conducting nationwide surveys. I know how professional surveys are done. I know how you have to draw a sampling frame properly and you have to couch the questions in a way to eliminate survey bias or questionnaire bias. So um, if we're going to do this, I think we need to do it right. And frankly, I think we need to do it. it it's guidance for really will be the next council that is elected. And I think that when they take their seats, hopefully some of us will be doing that as well. Um, we'll be very happy to have this resource available to us. Thank you, Alderman Pindell-Charles and Alderman Savage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
two things I've learned since I've been sitting on this council. Number one, all wards are very different. I, I don't think there's a any discrepancy on that here. And number two, um, what I've learned is being on this council, things are ever evolving. And I think that has a lot to do with us being a capital city. And so something that may have worked three years ago may not work today. So it's, it's, it's a constant movement and a constant motion. And going back to all wards are different. And, and, and I can speak for Ward 3. Uh, we have a very large community association. They're very vocal. Um, it's a very working class community. And uh, we have our monthly meetings. And I think the last one we had close to 50. Um, is that um, their first um, request, quote, we need more police presence in War Three. And to that end, uh, the past few months, uh, the chief as well as the deputy chief have been attending the meetings. They've been extremely successful. People have been very pleased. Um, and so, like I said, every ward is different. Um, I can only speak for three at this point, um, but I know that much from being on this council and things are ever evolving. So this survey will give us a, at least a, a good look at where we are now. It may change in maybe three or four years. Um, it probably has changed in the past three or four years, um, but we need to recognize, I think, that fact and this survey will at least capture where we are now, and it's extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Savage and Alderman Gay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just to reiterate what both Alderman Pendell Charles and Arnett have said, um, you know, I, I've also done the, the kind of town hall meetings, the surveys that, that uh, Alderman Arnett's done, and, and he's right, it's a certain subset. It's the people who are most active. Um, you know, I think we need to be careful because there are people out there who are working two, three jobs who aren't going to have time uh, to come to our meetings uh, or the town hall meetings or even email us. People who are taking care of large families. Um, there's then there's also the whole the language barrier. I don't speak Spanish well. I can't communicate very well with them. And and um, you know, even if I go door knocking, it's going to be tough. But but also from door knocking, not everybody answers the door. They're just busy they just don't want to that doesn't mean their opinion should be counted any less um and i think this is a good chance for us to get that kind of this is going to be a true if we get a professional it's going to be a, a truly objective uh, uh scientifically based survey which we can't frankly do with our town halls or just door knocking it's just not so i mean this is i don't think i don't foresee us asking policy decision necessarily it's going to be more i think structural and and uh, um uh services based and, and I think that'll be helpful. Alderman Gow is next, then Alderman Turney, then Alderman Chandelmeyer. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Might be some lunch on the horizon for us soon. Amen, amen, good. amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I just had a, a, a quick question as it related to, to maybe the second half of this uh, task force. And I don't want to mix things up, but okay, so we do this massive community survey. We get responses back and we get an understanding of what our constituents would hope to see. I think then there has to be some uh, survey, or, or I'm sorry, not survey, there has to be some task force or a body put together to then, uh, you, there has to be a performance evaluation of the city departments to see where do we stand at meeting these goals. Because often what happens is that uh, we do hear from our constituents. We put in legislation and we uh, hope to change things and they never happen. Uh, I'll use the example of, because we've been talking about it all day, the uh, transportation and, and buses and things like that. We put in place the uh, legislation to make sure that that uh, th that moving forward, we were purchasing electric vehicles and all of this stuff, and a loophole was found, and departments aren't following um, that example. Um, we just uh, two years ago bought brand new police vehicles that were not electric or uh, hybrid or modified in any way, and then we turned around and bought um, those uh, brand new uh, Chevy trucks that the staff is driving around in. And so, 
uh, there has to be, we, we, we just can't get the survey and all of these results back from our constituents and then say, this is what they want and not do it. So how do we then monitor the uh, individual survey responses? It, will a task force be set up uh, over a period of time to say, by X date, we'd like to see uh, you know, recommendations or, uh, or some sort of plan from e each department's uh, director on how they will accommodate uh, meeting the uh, recommendations put forward by the citizens? How do we do that? I'll, I'll let the city manager probably answer, speak to that. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good comment because, you know, we're, we're setting up a performance management system here in the city and, and one of the best practices for those performance management systems is surveys. Not just a one time, you know, every 10 years, but maybe every other year or every third year so we can get feedback on how the departments are doing and meeting all their performance measures. So that should be incorporated into that system as well, the, the, the performance measures that we have to report to the, to the council every single year of how we're doing. But, but we need to keep doing surveys and not just do it now and then wait for a long time. Thank you, Autumn Turney. Yeah, thank you. That was my other concern is that to invest this much money in a, in a one-time snapshot of, of what is important to the community, I'm, I'm just a little concerned on what we do with that information. Um, so I, I asked the sponsors, what, what is the, the end game here? What is the objective? Is it to, to have that when we review policy decisions in the next budget? Um, you know, if it comes back that we care about um, public safety, is that to support the police um, budget? I mean, what, how is this to be utilized and, and worth the investment of $50,000? Um, I'll speak to that. Um, I'm only one voice, but um, I feel that it will give us some guidance on where we should put our policy making as well as our resources. You know, we hear these questions during the budget process. Uh, so do we hear from the community that they want enhanced policing in their communities while we're talking about cutting police officers? Is that what the community wants? This is where we get the direction, okay? So it's up to us to take the information and to use it to best serve the community. So do we create new policies based upon the will of the community? Um, we have a committee structure, and I contend that it is not as effective as it should be, you know? Um, Alderman Gay asked who would follow up to make sure that these new procedures that are uh, made policies or even just recommended, who hears it? Well, of course, the city manager is responsible for what all of the departments do, except for the law department, and the mayor is responsible for that department. Um, so we hold the city manager accountable. But the committees could also be involved. The public safety committee could be determining whether the public safety team is implementing whatever is being recommended or proposed by this body, the nine of us. So there's some checks and balances. The problem is that we don't always use them. Just because I think you brought up a really interesting point in how we use the committees. Um, which I, I, I would definitely, I agree with you, could be utilized much, much more in how we um, just evaluate performances within the city amongst our individual um, expertise or, or whatever we serve on. Does that then get into, and maybe this is some axing of the city manager, would that then put us in a position of violating the city code potentially? Because we as electeds would be I feel like crossing the line and reviewing and analyzing staff and setting measures for them. I mean, how does that work? Because I, I, as it relates to housing or public safety, obviously would be would love to work with Rhonda on, you know, okay, these are the 10 goals that the uh, public has set out. How do we, you know, create a plan with alongside working with police or fire to accomplish that? But then is that, we're, we're then getting in a, a role of we're creating direction for staff. Well, I don't feel, one person speaking again, that it's our role to direct staff. We know the code says we can't. But we hire a city manager who oversees staff. So if we create a policy for a given department, 
then it's up to the city manager to make sure that that policy is upheld. There's no reason why our committees can't bring the director of that department in to say, where are we with that? What do you need? And at that time, we would be able to ascertain whether there is a need. Maybe the funding isn't there. Maybe the policy doesn't work well. You know, maybe it wasn't the right policy to begin with. We, can, we should be hearing those things in our committees. And then if policies need to be changed, then that is brought back to the full council for those changes. But I'm not advocating that we direct staff. We have one staff person that we can, I hate to use the word direct, but I guess that is the right word, and that's our city manager. You, you just, um, that was a, a really, really good explanation, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, and um, yeah, you just, that was great, so thank you for that. Thank you for your question. So, um, we do have some pizza waiting for us, <laughs> Mr. City Manager. <laughs> yeah, if, if I could just say, because I think it's important that, that we all understand the council does have oversight over all the departments. That doesn't mean you can drug, but you have oversight responsibilities. So I think if, if something is identified in the survey that's a problem, that you certainly have the ability to say, how are we gonna fix this and come back to, with a plan of how we're gonna fix it. That's why I think it's really opportune timing that we do this now when we're trying to get the performance measures up and running properly to, to, to allow us to to, to check on how we're really doing with this from the citizens' view on all of these services. Um, so I think this is a great time for this. So I was trying to get us out of here for lunch for 45 minutes. I was trying to make that at 12.30, if that's okay. Um, I got a really yeah, quick yeah. point. So uh, Alderman Shanema was next, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I do want to echo uh, my colleague uh, Alderman Savage saying is some people work uh, two to three jobs and aren't able to participate as often. Um, I used to be one of those two to three jobs in order to make ends meet people. And, um, yeah, my schedule did not allow me to make a lot of community meetings that even though I was aware of, I didn't, I just didn't have the time to do so. So, uh, a little extra outreach, I think is a good thing. Can we ready to vote on amendment number seven? Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to take a 45 minute recess, so roughly we'll be back here at quarter past one. We just voted on it. Do we have to vote for recess? Mr. Mayor, did you order food? Well, yeah, we got some pizza waiting for you. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, five dollars. Huh? Does, does anybody want me to pay for them? Reasons. I have a ten. <laughs> okay, we'll see you all back here at quarter past. Thank you.
All right, ready to resume the meeting. Everybody set to go. Um, could somebody please move amendment number eight? Can we get a second? Thank you. Oh. Director Dickinson. Okay. This amendment adds a new project for Taylor Avenue traffic improvements. The project is funded with $310,000 of developer contributions in FY22 and $1,328,000 of bonds in FY24. I'm not sure if anybody moved approval, but if they didn't, I'd move approval. Yes. <laughs> okay. Second. Yeah. All right. Oh. Any discussion? No. Autumn no. Tierney? Yeah, I do. Um, I do have a question. Um, even though I'm a sponsor and I support this because of the 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 uh, involvement of the developer, and I, I deem it as a very successful project in that in those terms. But um, I'd like to ask Chief Romali if <laughs> surprise him if that circle was reviewed um, by the fire department because it does create a you know they come zipping from Taylor Avenue Fire Station and. I hear them all day. <laughs> now that Ellie lives there, she sees I, it. Yeah, no. But I just, yeah, I thought about that looking out my window and thinking, wow, we're adding a circle. I hope they are okay with that. Find time uh, to ask. Doug Romali, Fire Chief. And could you repeat your question? Oh, yes. We, are, we have a proposed uh, circle improvement of Taylor Avenue outside the um, police station that I hope that you're aware of. And that was my question to make sure that it was tested for your your uh, trucks making the circle now because yes we've been working with public works for the uh, circle that's proposed outside of the police department near the, where the new hotel is supposed to go so we, we have in the radius is for our fire apparatus is correct okay that that's all I wanted to know and I really didn't have any doubt but thank you for answering my question thank you on McGay then on Pern thank you outside of the three hundred and ten thousand uh, dollars given by the developer how much is the city contributing to this project it's about a million as of right now the out year of fy24 would have another million three hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars of bonds we'd issue for this project but i know there's plans to get more developer monies contributed to that st to that construction phase but n because we don't know now what it is we're putting in bonds. Thank you. And, and again, this, um, the Tail Avenue traffic improvements um, was not something recommended by the fire department. Um, I guess I'll ask the, the chief or, or the deputy chief that. Was this something that the fire department said, if we do not have, if the city does not contribute $1.3 million towards uh, this project for a circle, we will not be able to safely uh, put out fires or, or, or reach the, the families necessary along this street. Okay. Direct, Director Nash, do you want to come up yeah, as well? Thank that's you. what I was going to tell you. I believe this is more of a direct, Director Nash issue than mine. The fire department just reviewed the plan once it came to us. Okay, but my question is, is was it a public, it, 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 the current state of the road as it stands right now, are you still able to, if a fire was to break out on whatever street is near, near off of uh, Taylor Avenue, would you still be able to get to get to the home and an appropriate amount of time and assist the family if without the city spending one point three million dollars um, on a circle to uh, assist a, a development? So the traffic circle is, I believe, proposed because of the new development going in. Uh, currently, as far as I know, we would still be able to access it. I'm not sure what the yeah, thank you. So that, that was kind of yeah, my point in, in stating that it, this is not a public safety issue. You can still do your job as the road stands, and we could probably get to fixing it later on. This is a issue of a developer uh, wanting to create a, 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 some sort of pro uh, business here. I, I know we, I just don't want to be too specific. Um, 
and the city is assisting by contributing $1.3 million. So this is not a public safety issue. So once again, it's planning and zoning sends us the review process and we reviewed the traffic circle to make sure that we could access it for our fire apparatus because it was part of the project. If the tra traffic circle is not there and a project goes in, I'd have to review those plans before I could answer the question to you 100%. Thank you. Um, and so w w uh, my next question then is for the developer, uh, I'm sorry, for Jody, when would you expect to hear from the developer as it relates to additional contributions that would um, assist the city in not spending, um, you know, it, money on their. So project. this is this is not a Jody question. This is a Director Nash question. She's been working with the developer and the plant with the plans. And, and Ms. Nash, before you, uh, Director Nash, before you start, could you, uh, as the uh, Taylor Avenue currently stands before the developer submitted this project. In your uh, capacity, in your role, had there been any uh, safe public safety concerns as it related uh, to response times or, or anything like that with the uh, road as it stands? So the, the issue here is Westgate Circle. It, it gets backed up Thursday afternoons. So could that potentially harm response times from the police department that is right there? Theoretically, it could. The issue that our department was looking at was in regards to Title 22, adequate public facilities. But I will go back even longer ago than this particular development is back to the development of Park Place as a whole in 2005. After that project was put in, um, there were concerns about the curvature of Taylor Avenue, both um, horizontally and vertically and the safety issues as it approached Westgate Circle. When the police department went in there, it was again raised as an issue and it was entered as a capital project. Now, that project never went forward, but the Department of Public Works was and remains concerned about the alignment of Taylor Avenue. So when this project came along, we saw a good opportunity to leverage um, project that the city's wanted to do but hasn't been able to afford with the development that is going in there and the improvements that they need to make in order to meet Title 22. And so they have a few different options. We could have denied any left turns out of their site so they would not be sending any cars to Westgate Circle. They didn't like that option. So we proposed the, the roundabout, which they did like and the police department liked and the graduate hotel is also on board. However, in order to assemble all of the pieces needed for the roundabout, the city is still negotiating with the graduate to acquire land. If we are able to do that in the next couple of months, then the developer at, the, at Park Place will build the roundabout. If we are not able to negotiate the land rights, um, ever or at least in the next few months, then the hotel will be stuck with a no left turn out, which they don't want, but they will also be paying us the, the 390 or the, the 390 or the 290 for the improvements plus the trap, the sidewalk improvements. So they will still have to do some mitigation, but they won't be happy. We won't be happy. No one will be happy. So we're hoping and working really hard to get this deal in place. Okay, thank you for the explanation. I hope that um, happy comes with um, a less expensive price for the city uh, and more uh, for the developer. And I hope that you get that piece of land so they can pay for, uh, am I understanding correctly, if you do, they will pay for the entire project? If we get it in the next few months. Well, I'm still gonna vote no on this, but I hope you get that. Uh, there were a lot of hands up, uh, Alt, um, Alderman Shandlemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so Alderman normally Mayor. I'm very gung-ho on any kind of roundabout, um, but I, I got a couple of questions just for my information. So we're putting this in just to essentially um, reduce the congestion caused by one developer, correct? For the hotel project? No, that was an opportunity to partner and get private money to make an improvement the city's been wanting to make for several years. Okay, okay, that um, makes sense. And uh, 
what is do we have any idea about the the tax revenue we might be bringing in from this new developer it is a business hotel with 150 rooms yeah so it's going to give us some property tax improvements that we'll be able to get additional real property uh, taxes on I don't know what that is I haven't quantified that do we have an idea if that would keep up with the maintenance cost of a traffic circle or a roundabout or whatever we want so the answer to your question is no we haven't studied that I don't I don't know what the cost is we could compare the two um, there's also the cost of borrowing the money and having okay. to pay it back uh, we'd have to do analysis to see but uh, the the hotel would bring in uh, some hotel occupancy taxes too if this, this this development is a hotel correct yeah we'll get a hotel occupancy tax from them as well which is another revenue source okay on the thank you mr mayor this is a big plus for the uh for the neighborhood it's a plus environmentally it's a plus safety wise and safety is a big thing. It's a terrible intersection the way it is right now. And um, <clears throat> I think that it'll keep the flow of traffic. It'll slow people down enough that um, it uh, will make it safer. I mean, that's a very blind intersection coming up, up the hill on Taylor Avenue up to the police department. Um, it's hard to make a left turn into the police uh, parking lot. It's uh, hard to come out of the uh, access road to the Graduate Hotel and any other um, structures or purposes. Uh, park Place too, um, coming out of the uh, the access road. On top of that, they are putting in a uh, an extension of the Poplar Park uh, Parkway. It's part of the mayor's uh, bicycle paths. Um, what will happen is rather than cross right at that intersection, it'll be up about, uh, as I recall, about 40 or 50 feet. And it'll be more of a straight across. You don't have to look in six different directions at the same time uh, to make the crossing there. Um, overall, it's, you know, it's a good idea. Uh, in terms of working out the payments, um, I have to trust the city's department to do the departments to do the best they can. But this is a big plus, make no mistake. Alderman Annette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I strongly support what Alderman Payone just said. I was at the uh, hearings for this, and I was, first of all, very impressed by the uh, cooperative nature of the developer, but also, as Dr. Nash says, this is something that we've really needed to do for a long time, and it would be sh a shame to miss this opportunity to make a major improvement particularly as Alderman Peon says in safety, but <clears throat> I think it's aesthetics too and some of the things they're doing about extending sidewalks and things. I mean, this is just a, a, a great project, so I certainly plan to vote in favor. Thank you, Alderman Gay. Director, I'm not sure if you mentioned previously, why are we buying the land from the Graduate Hotel and why are the developers not buying it if they want to move forward with the project? Because ultimately it's going to be city of Annapolis property. Okay, and so how much is that? What are you're currently in negotiations for how much to purchase that land? We're asking them to donate the land. <laughs> and are they? Do you think they're going to? They are. They are willing. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of Amendment Number Eight, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Thank you. Amendment number eight passes. Somebody please move amendment number nine, the Tyranny PNZ review amendment. Second. Second, please. Second. Do I get a ULE or who? Oh, I guess. Um, Hold on, Tyranny. Um, I guess uh, for those who weren't at the work session, I can just re reiterate why I I'm proposing this um, just very quickly. Um, I think we all hear about our struggles with the permit system. Oh, I just thought of something. I bashed consultants, and now I'm proposing one. Oh, no. <laughs> 
But anyway, so, um, and you know, the complaints are really not specific, so we really don't know. And this is really to evaluate process. It's not about people. It's not about our good product. It's it's about the process, and we want to look at the flow of different project types and and the sizes of projects through the permit process and where um, just, just an eye towards enhancing and simplifying the process um, and look at the code requirements. Um, and it's interesting because since I've introduced this, I've gotten some correspondence from some constituents on what other cities do. Um, one was an interesting thought about just having a certain period of time and that was like just stay, stay stuck with a 60 day turnaround and if, it, if there was no if there was no objection, then the, pro the project was going to go forward. It was, it was just a lot of different ideas. But anyway, so this is a, to hire a consultant to do a process and regulations review in the building permitting office um, within the city. Um, it's a phase, it's sort of a phased effort. Phase one would be just to observe and make some, um, some, some changes in, in the process. And then, and then if, if the report states that there may have to be some organizational changes or regulatory changes, we can address that at a, with a, you know, by that time it'll probably be budget time again to look at what a, what a kind of expense that might be. Um, so this is really a, a, a consultant sort of um, exemplified by um, someone like Eileen Fogarty coming in. Not her, her um, you didn't hear that Eileen, but somebody <laughs> like that who has expertise from other cities and um, stay you know for two or three weeks of oversight um, you know at an hourly cost and, and a report to us so thank that's you. Why it's thank you mr. mayor uh, we did discuss this at length in the finance committee um, first I want to say that uh, there we discussed that probably uh, the delays in getting things processed have more to do with the populace than the staff um, we tend to get involved in these things depending upon the project. But um, I, I am concerned about two things. One, if this is enough money for this project. But two, I believe the Office of Law is also heavily involved in looking at um, reviving, revising code and looking at moving things from code to regulations as a part of process. So I, I'm just voicing that I hope we have a coordinated effort here and that we actually are uh, putting in enough resources to actually get the job done well. Lastly, I'll just say this is something I'm sure Senator Alfred has expressed an interest in this to others, but uh, definitely to me as well. So um, this is something where we can uh, have a positive uh, relationship with our senator. Uh, Alderman Shanama. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Alderman Tierney, so the end all goal of this is to simplify our zoning process because as it is currently uh, a very complicated thing to get through, which I think uh, turns off one, our current residents, and two, uh, home builders trying to accommodate or business builders trying to accommodate. So the, the goal of this is to try and simplify it, give a little more predictability for everyone involved. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because what I wanted to say too, is of course, you know, spending money, I, I want to say what, what the savings ultimately, it, it isn't a savings, um, but, but part of the objective is to permits bring in revenue and, and anything to simplify the process and to, to increase that revenue source is, is 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 my end game here too, um, and it's for it's for both residents, primarily residents, and and you know developers, um, um, and and yeah, when there may not be, a, I don't know what the problem is, but but as my colleague Alderman Arnett said, if we're hearing it from the state senator, there's something you know, the optics are reality somewhere in that process, so. Um, the end game is to come to identify what that is to streamline and to to uh, make it um, an easier process, whatever that might be. In that case, uh, I would encourage my colleagues to support this. Uh, I'm going to talk about this from a strict affordable housing perspective. One of the things that increases housing costs of any kind of um, new project is a very complicated permitting process, and uh, simplifying that will help reduce costs and add predictability for everyone. Thank you, Alderman Finlayson, then Alderman Gay, then Alderman Savage. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to hear from Dr. Nash. If this legislation is going to have a consultant 
to review the processes and regulations. Um, is that needed, Dr. Nash? Honest answer, Dr. Nash. <laughs> It's a tough question. <laughs> I often hear complaints about the permitting process. I believe that the staff probably has a good idea what's causing those delays. I'm all right with hiring someone to analyze those if city council is committing to implementing the recommendations of that consultant. Good answer. <laughs> Put it right back on us. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Let me go. Well, she flick it here, and I'm gonna flick it right back because my question is: is and what I get from you know constituents, and uh, just uh, obviously working close with Ross and his uh, constituents as well. They don't feel that the staff is implementing policies and recommendations from either the council or even hearing the concerns of the citizens. And so my uh, question was, I was thinking, is this enough money, one, because of the intricacies of this department and I mean, how many layers there are um, within this planning process? Um, and then two, that was my question. How do we then ensure that... <laughs> the recommendations or, or whatever it is, it is, is uh, from this consultant's review are implemented within the Department of uh, Planning and Zoning. Understanding that I know you just have a lot going on. Uh, we talk often and, and every time you tell me one of your responsibilities, I'm surprised because I'm like, I told you, you manage everything. You're like the third city manager um, with applications and traffic. And I mean, you're just, and so how can we, one, is it enough money? And two, how can we be sure, I guess we will be sure, just like you told us earlier, never mind, it'll come to our committees and we'll just have to hold the individual staff accountable. So I answered my own question, but is that enough money? I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with this kind of study and, and how much it would cost. Um, it's probably a good starting point. And if we hire a, a smaller firm, I think it would be reasonable but I just can't tell you for sure. And on a typical project, just because I, when, it's, when someone submits an application on a typical uh, a d a development project, what's the timeline that you would prefer? That I would prefer? For them to you know, get through the planning process and the public like comment. As the director, what would you prefer uh, for that? Well, it all depends on what you're talking about. I mean, let's do as, like a um, multifamily development in the Eastport Center Shopping Center. If someone was to fill out an application for a project like that, what would the timeline for you? You know, would you look at it and say, okay, it, taking in public comment and going back with some individual staff and traffic studies and all of this, would you about six months to a year? Well, that's what, it's, say, that's what the people say it feels like. I would not say like. eight years. <laughs> yeah. But um, yes, I mean, ideally something like that level of complexity could get through in six months to a year. But Alderman Arnett is exactly right that, that things don't. And that is because we take a lot of time to work with the constituents and hear their concerns. And I know we get criticized for not doing that enough. But the fact is there is a lot of public input built into our schedule from even before a project is submitted to our department. And, and that's the trade-off. You're, you're, you're choosing time and deliberation um, and, and process over expediency. Well, and, and, and so to your point, um, there's typically conversation before, during, you know, so how do you then say, all right, look, I, I'm the director. I want to see the, the show keep moving. We've got the public comment 18 different times in 19 different forums. Let's move forward with what we have and, and, and try to make, uh, make something work. You know, to my uh, colleague's point here, my fear is that development in, in, in particular for affordable housing uh, will be halted significantly um, in this city uh, because of the prolonged uh, uh, comment process and going back and forth with the individual staff and, 
And so you put together some good plans and Eric Lashinsky has put together some good plans, but how can you move forward with it if you, if there is no, like, I want to, if you just, if there isn't assertive in saying like, okay, let's get this done. Well, there does have to be consensus, and a lot of our projects do get through pretty easily because there is consensus about the location, the, the look of the development, and, and the impact of the development, like 2010 West Street. That, that went through relatively painlessly. And that's the million dollar homes? No, that's lo the low income housing project. Which one is 2010 off, West Street? I'm confused. Off Gibraltar. Oh, okay, Gibraltar. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, that, that went through relatively painlessly. But in a, in a city like ours, where most of the vacant land is vacant for a reason, it's not easy to do a project. And if it's a redevelopment project, again, you have a whole set of expectations and preconceived notions about what can and can happen there. Then you overlay that with state laws like critical area of forest conservation. It's, it's just the way things are now in a, in a city where there aren't just these open fields where they used to grow corn and now they're gonna put some houses. Like, that, that is an easy process, you know. Anything we have is not an easy process. And this is my last question. Have you compared your process to the process of other directors um, and cities with a similar size and, and demographics and things like that? Like, how would you rank your, your, um, yourself and your staff? My staff is excellent. There, there are no other staff in this country that are dedicated to getting projects through and to making sure the end product is something we can all be proud of. We don't always hit a mark, but we are always trying to make a better product through, through the system. For permits, we, we have staff that can get permits like trade permits in and out in a day. You know, we're, we are doing very well on a lot of our permits. And the reason why things get held up a lot of times is sometimes because the applicants don't know the system and how to participate in the system. So, you know, it, it's, it's not just staff, it's the whole, it's the whole system that so causes delays. Wh where are you standing on the storefront idea of like the permit spot being on Main Street and making it transparent for everybody? Where is that, wh what's going on with that? With what idea? Was I remember there was conversations of like saying we need the um, uh, the permit office to be uh, more open to the public or, or something like that. So where's that? Where does that stand? I I don't know that idea. Oh, okay, I rem I rem do rem vividly remember that from um, uh, when we were running the last time. But all right, thank you. Uh, Alderman Savage and Alderman Pindell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I think just to reiterate some of the things that Dr. Nash has said, because I think it's really important, especially for my colleagues from Ward 5 and 6. <laughs> my colleagues at Ward 5 and 6 here, because you both kind of had the same sentiment. I think it's one thing to be, we need to be careful about repeating anecdotal evidence and reports, because I worked with the folks in, in plan zoning and permitting for many years, and we can't just automatically assume that it's because it's a delay on staff's part. As Dr. Nash said, they're incredibly hardworking. They have targets in terms of reviewing permits in a certain amount of time. And, and in my experience, oftentimes you get the delay because the developers are the ones that are not wanting to listen to staff's input or they're not wanting to listen to the community input. Um, and so that's where I think the developments to Alderman Arnett's, I think, legislation is in the pipeline of trying to get them to go out to the public more. The projects that go through smoothly are the ones that have reached out to the community ahead of time. I mean, look, me, I'm, I'm often painted as Mr. Anti-Development, which I don't consider myself that way, but I've had a development at Bay Village, two developments coming up there, including a Lidl, those are going through relatively smoothly. Bay Village has been redeveloped the second phase anyway, pretty quickly relatively, because they reached out to the community early on with the community associations, with staff, and they got, they got the, the community on board and they made commitments. And that, that's how we avoid the delay. It's not that we necessarily go to staff um, and start blaming them, because I think I signed on to this because, similar to what we were doing with the uh, survey, and I think it's important that we get information 
And, but yeah, I'm completely game for identifying improvements and streamline. Um, I think we should always be open to that. I think that's good, but I just think we need to make sure we don't go into this assuming that uh, staff is doing the wrong thing and that permitting is delayed because I, I just don't think that's, uh, I, mean, I mean, granted, we've had again, plenty of examples. We've had Crystal Spring, we had uh, in my ward, uh, Chesapeake Grove, they've been in the pipeline probably 10 years plus. But again, I'd argue that's not because of, of staff. I know staff works really hard, but some of these large projects do take months of review time. They're significant in terms of how much you have to go into them. Um, but it's it's a lot of different working parts. So yeah, that's just my, my only caution there. Uh, and that's why I'm supporting this. But we need to make sure we, we emphasize it's staff's not, I don't think staff's the problem with this. I'm with Pindell Charles, I'm with Gay, and then I'm with said what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we've all heard the hue and cry about how long it takes and how the county's process is much simpler and faster. And I, I, I thought about it, and, and my thought was, in the county there's more, and, and Dr. Nash touched on it, you've got more open space. Um, in the city, we're all, for lack of a better word, jammed up on each other. And if you do something next door, it's right there. Or across the street, it's right there. Or around the corner, it's right there. So there's so many more elements and components that need to be looked at before we actually put a stamp on whatever we're going to do. So the county is much more wide open, much more open space. We're very compacted. And that, to me, is, is the kind of rub when, when we hear these, these things about city versus county. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, the other thing is, too, concerning the excellent staff uh, that planning and zoning has. And I recall recently Mr. Smith uh, brought up a situation where there were um, a lot of competing interests and he had to work really hard through it. I think it was the Annapolis Radiator Project, maybe. I don't remember which one it was, but got a huge national award for um, the way that we handled that project and the outcome and how pretty much everyone was satisfied with the outcome and so kudos and congratulations. I can't recall if it was Annapolis Radiator, but it was one particular project that seemed to be kind of um, caused some angst among some folks, but we made it through. So thank you. Well, Gay was next. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, add and clarify a few things. I think that uh, the public input is critically important <laughs> in, in all of these projects, and I agree that it should take place before, no. during, and after, no. No. you know, keeping in contact with th those that should be affected. But two things um, that I think happen uh, frequently um, is just how we should caution the, the planning process. You br brought up Alderman Arnett's uh, legislation. Uh, which you know, I'm talking to him about and, and just trying to get a better understanding of what your goal is because what I fear is that when, again, the public comment is critically important, but the public comment should not delay a development for five years or eight years or 10 years because at some point, both the city and the developer have to move on with their business. And if, what, what my fear is, and I'll be straight up honest, is that as we move forward to develop Eastport Terrace and Harbor House and Robinwood and these things, look around them and, and see what type of neighborhoods there are and how impassioned those individual groups are about particular developments. And I'll use the uh, Eastport Shopping Center as an example again. They shut that down. And so as we move forward to redevelop uh, public housing and make for a more... Um, a safe and livable community for us in, in, in Ward 6 and for individuals who have who've lived in some you know horrible conditions for a while I don't think that it would be fair because of the size or the amenities that this community would like to see in their future development for neighbors then to say because we have owned land or, or property here um, and because we have the money to go out and get an attorney and to fight your development, we will shut it down because it does not meet our needs. And so that's, on, that's my only concern with that legislation and as it relates to any public input. I just wanted to make that clear. And I want to thank Alderman Gay for that 
segue, but I, first of all, I agree with Alderman Savage. Early involvement with the community is essential, and that is the point of my uh, legislation on the community benefit agreement. Yet an organized set of citizens right after the pre-application meeting, before the application is submitted, to work out agreements with the community in advance and ahead of time so that the community feels a sense of ownership. And I think when we went into the mitigation agreement on the shopping center, and I do think the shopping center is an aberration, although maybe you could argue Crystal Spring is too, but um, when we went into mitigation, we did get some agreement between the developer and a segment of the community. There were, there were, uh, there were some adversarial positions between the developers and some of the community that didn't help at the front end of that. But I think all along, the more we can get things settled up front before we get into the process, it's gonna make Dr. Nash and her staff's life a lot easier. Um, because we won't have to be doing all these skirmishes along the way. The other thing I want to mention, because this is an improvement, we tend to forget all the things that our staff do that are major improvements, but the Environmental Matters Committee gets a monthly report from Dr. Nash on the status of all of the projects in the pipeline. It's been an extremely useful thing for us. It makes us, I think, feel comfortable. We know where things are. We see how they're moving through the process. So um, we have been making improvements as we've gone along, and um, we can't lose sight of that. This study may help us move it forward. It may find that we really are okay the way we are. Uh, I just think that it's something that I support because it's just taking another look under the hood to see if there's something that we can do better or reaffirm what we are doing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one thing that I'd actually be really excited about uh, when Alderman Arnett touched on community ownership, if we simplify the process, we can actually can really take advantage of that community ownership because it gives ordinary citizens a sense of stability when they want to try and implement a project of their own. Right now, if I were to try and um, put in just a small development, let's say like a four unit apartment, uh, in a community, I could not get the business loan or have the time to write out our process how it takes right now. And if we simplify that out, well, then me, an ordinary citizen of Annapolis, could potentially start swinging something like that, um, which would, one, help bring about the affordable housing that uh, Alderman Gay and I care so much about. But two, we take away the influence of these big developers that have the time to ride out these projects and then can just do whatever they want because they've written it out. So this is a good amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just quick on that point, because I think, Alderman, it's important to keep in mind that even with those projects, uh, you know, you're, the homeowners are gonna hire somebody to put together the design because of all the restrictions. There's too much code for a homeowner to really, really be able to manage themselves. Uh, and even, um, you know, for myself, we, we did a screened in porch. We had to hire somebody to do the design. And then we hired a contractor because contractor is also going to be the one, ideally, to go and get the permits because otherwise the homeowner has to sign off on and be liable for anything that happens after the fact. You want the contractor to deal with that and deal with the permitting. And they should know the process if they're doing that in the city. Um, and, and in terms of the um, public comment period, I don't think a public comment period has ever delayed something that long. The public comment period is pretty short. I mean, it's relatively short. It's pretty set, I should say, set in stone, right? A certain amount of days um, that the public can comment, and that's it. I don't think that's really delaying things. I mean, is that in terms of the period of time for public comment, that's not open-ended, right? It's just, uh, I mean, they can go to the public, the planning commission. In terms of when you post the notice signs. There is a formal public comment period yeah. but um we we always are open to taking public comments but um i would say that sometimes does mire us when we're trying to get responses to public comments from the developers and you know that 
and we can't work out an issue because okay. we, we do like to have there be some kind of consensus before we go to public hearing. Yeah. But there is a 15 day public, a formal public hearing. Um, yeah. I mean, public comment period. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're talking about years, these projects are in the pipeline. I don't that's think the public's holding it up that long. That's not the main yeah. issue that's slowing it down. It's usually staff wants something from the developer that the yeah. developer doesn't want to give staff. Yeah. So and and I th back and forth. I want to emphasize one other point that Dr. Nash mentioned, which I think is an important one you touched on. In terms of a lot of these lots we have undeveloped in the city, not all of them, but I think a number of them are, are really the undesirable properties. They haven't been developed for a reason over the years. Either they have steep slopes or, or wetlands, or they may be areas where they, that's where the stormwater flows, and that's why they haven't been built on. And so there are various things like that where, or it could be ingress, egress. I know that's an issue with some properties in, in Ward uh, 5 where it's just difficult to put something because you can't make left turns or right turns or what have you. Um, and so those, again, there's certain reasons, and I think we need to factor that in. That is going to drive up the cost, but that's because we've had over the years laws and regulations put in place for very good reasons um, to, because these areas are difficult to develop and have a lot of impacts and those regulations are there to mitigate those impacts. Um, that's all. I would also add that thanks to you we're transitioning to a new permitting and project software intergov in October and November and that won't necessarily speed up the process for projects, which are more complicated or variances, special exceptions, plan developments, but I think it will help a lot for the permit side of things because everything will be digital, it will be visible, it will, I think it will be easier to move through the process because we won't be looking for a piece of paper. Let me go. Just really quickly, how would this um, and maybe this is a question for the older woman and, and what she intends, but would this help in situations and, or instances a, a, as would happen? Oh, uh, I don't want to put out the name, but with the one particular development in Eastport where the, uh, and this is to my understanding, the permit did not allow for a particular fencing type and they did it anyway with the approval of the staff, I believe, or some, there was some sort of agreement with the staff, would that prevent instances uh, like that from happening again in the future? Or would it create a check and balance process? Is this a recent situation you're referring it's to? It's very recent. Okay. Um, there, because we have many fences in Annapolis in many different places, um, we do allow in certain situations a fence to be installed in a right of way if it's not a problem for the Department of Public Works. If, if they're not, you know, they don't need to get in that easement, um, they don't have equipment there, you know, there, there aren't any access issues, then we, in many situations, refer something to Public Works where they allow a fence or a wall to be constructed in an, in an existing right-of-way. If, a, if a, a, a individual or developer applied um with a permit in and their site or whatever says you know no fence is open to the public and then they put up a fence and then later on a, a, a go for a permit to for a permanent uh, fence you do you get how the public then feels that there may be some misunderstanding between what the community planning and zoning and the individual developer have discussed i'm not sure i understand your question. There, we would not, if a fence was not permitted in an easement, we would not al allow a fence to go into an easement. But in this particular situation, a fence was, was put up after the fact and is still up. I'm not sure I know what fence you're referring to. Okay. Oh, I just. Hold on, Tony. Yeah, I just want to respond oh. to that, but oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, go ahead. Somebody else. Rondo is next, but if you want to, if you want to respond, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, just to respond to that, I don't, I don't think that that's actually um, that's probably too specific uh, for this first pass at finding out what the problem is. I, I, the best way to find out what's wrong with our permit process is to actually 
do like a mock-up permit application. I mean, I know, I know from past experience in construction, I used to process the permits. I used to go schlop into DC and walk the permits through and I could find out where there was, I mean, you just know where the problem is, you find out. So I think that's gonna be the approach is that they'll, they'll you know, walk these permits through and just see where the problem might be. And again, it has no reflection of staff. Thanks. Thank you. Alderman Pendel Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, uh, following up on something Alderman Arnett said about uh, the monthly reports, thank you, because I know we all get the monthly reports. They're very important, but also we had asked uh, for GPCA to get them as well, and they get them as well. So thank you for those reports, Dr. Nash. Okay. Ready to vote on amendment number nine. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say no. No. Okay, could somebody, we've withdrawn amendment 10, moving on to amendment number 11. Amendment number nine passes. Somebody please move amendment number 11. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, Alderman Payer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have added considerably to this amendment. I was told that the last time we discussed these that um, I let everybody know we might as well pass on 11 or 12 because I didn't have the $800,000 worth of cuts um, connected with uh, number uh, amendment number 12 and that I would work on that and have it done before the last meeting. Uh, I was in touch with finance throughout my uh, efforts in the evening last, I mean, I, I probably worked 20 hours on this. Alderman Arnett indeed at the last meeting said uh, don't make these cuts willy-nilly like you did last time and I, uh, I certainly did not do that uh, at great effort. Uh, now I'm told this morning that that is a separate amendment and it has to be considered separately. That is not the case in my mind. I was adding to it. I don't think, I think the finance folks who did a spectacular job um, in general on, on this budget and, and in helping me um, I don't think if they were aware of that, that they, I think they would have said, well, Fred, you're kind of wasting your time, um, or you might be wasting your time. None of that ever happened. Uh, in light of what I revealed at the last meeting, that I wasn't finished with that amendment, that we had to keep on going, I had to keep, keep on going, I think it needs to be added here as opposed to uh, a separate amendment. I voted that uh, amendments, uh, had to be had to be uh, furnished by the 17th. My impression from my communications with the finance department was that I had in fact preserved that and simply needed to add until I got to $800,000, um, which I did at great length, great trouble. Um, so I would like ask that that be considered as as an add-on to this amendment. Uh, Amendment number 11, I've got four or five things in the total uh, comes up to almost $850,000 that I've asked be requested. That includes uh, uh, money from the snow budget, uh, from a couple of projects from your office, Mr. Mayor. And by the way, uh, your department, your office seemed to be about the only one that actually put down the expense of different projects that you're doing. I for one appreciate that. Um, it was much easier to read yours than anybody else. And we were told we kind of were getting an incomplete statement from you. That really wasn't the case. I, I thank and the you ones you're going to cut? <laughs> um, I also cut uh, some money from a, a position from the harbor master and the traffic engineer. Um, they're not complicated. I did my best to communicate with every department. Um, some did not return my call. Some were not, you know, made for all I know, they might be on vacation, but I did the best I could to communicate with everybody involved. Uh, I really went through a great deal of trouble just to be told this morning that, oh no, that's a separate amendment and uh, probably not gonna be considered. I'd ask that you consider the uh, plight of the taxpayers and at least give them a shot to be heard today. Let me go to the city attorney for clarification on that. Uh, the amendment before you is as written, 11. I, I'm, 
I'm not aware of any changes or amendments. I didn't write um, this amendment. The amendment before us is the is the eleven. Peon to remove four police officers. That's your amendment. No, that's part of my amendment. That's what I filed. Yeah, I mean, what I asked for several weeks ago, but I, I don't think any of the people that moved these actually wrote. I'll go to this direct, description. Di well, Director well, Dickinson. The, the, this motion is currently on the floor. It's been moved and seconded, so it's a, it's for consideration by the council at this time. I'm sorry. The motion amending uh, the amendment uh, eleven has been moved and seconded. It's on the floor before for consideration by the council, as as written. And we'll go to Director Dickinson for some more clarification. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I can comment on and why that was a separate amendment. When we had the work session, uh, those those were due by Monday, and uh, I think it was Friday evening into the weekend. I was corresponding with Alderman Payone about what he wanted to put in there, trying to find reductions to offset the constant yield change, which is in Amendment 12. And... Um, I had I had written down two police officers and I and I communicated that he would have to find more. But by Monday, by the time the the deadline, we, I had no more on that at, at the work session. He said he meant four, not two, which is what I had put down. So I put the four police officer positions in this amendment, but the rest of the the reductions were not even available as of the work session date, and so it. I, cor I, uh, I talked to the city manager about it, and um, I don't know if I contacted the Office of Law, but the adding on of more cuts, completely different departments, um, was different enough to me to warrant a separate amendment, not um, an editing of this amendment, and because the, the other reductions came so late after the work session. So if there is some legal issue with that decision making you know i'll defer to the office of law but these these cuts were more cuts uh, different departments um than what was discussed at the work session so, so just, line, just you still is there some reason why you couldn't have told me as many commun commun communications as we had Last week, I mean, even in the evening, I was talking to you so at nine o'clock at you, night, and you, you never would have once. gotten you would have gotten your drafted amendments Friday when we finished drafting all the extra all the extra potential amendments last week. We would have sent you an email with with yours attached. Let me go down the line, Alderman Arnett. So, first of all, to reconstruct my sense of history, it was brought up at the work session. I think it was to, at that time, my recollection is Alderman Payone said I wanted four. It was offered separately. If we're going to discuss this, and the reason I seconded it was so we could discuss this as its own independent uh, amendment, and I will um, be strongly opposed to cutting I mean, the last thing that the community wants to hear is we're cutting sworn officers. And I think the last thing that the police department wants to hear is that we're defunding them. Um, I don't think that's the direction we need to be going in now. So I, I seconded this so we could have discussion, but I am very, very much opposed to this particular amendment. Alderman Savage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I, I just echo that sentiment. I do I've spoken quite a bit with the police department lately, and I do think it's it's I do I think to go about it this way is not going to be helpful um, in terms of advocating for these kind of cuts. But but I think beyond that, I think the the dilemma we have here is some of the amendments introduced tonight today today have been changed in a minor way. They haven't been substantive, substantial changes. But what you're asking us to deliberate on right now, this amendment, it's, it's a very substantive amendment with a lot of different cuts from various departments. And the dilemma we have is we would have to call up each of the departments for each of these cuts and go through that long discussion again. And that was the whole point of having a work session. For us to do that big discussion today is going to drag out this meeting even longer. 
I think it's appropriate to discuss minor changes to amendments like we've done already. Alderman Woman Tierney's had some minor changes and we've had to get clarifications, but to go through that whole rigmarole again with each of the departments is just, I don't think it's fair to them or us um, when that's not really the process we agreed to. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but you should have gotten these in prior to our work session that was set up to do this very thing. I just, I mean, regardless of the merits of this, I just think it's, it's, it's bad timing and, and not the proper process. So we're on 11 now, but that is part of the cuts, right? So we'll stay with 11. We're, we're on 11, so we're, yeah. I'm just stating that that. Anybody else on this side? Because yeah. <laughs> I said Mr. I was Mayor, working my yes. way down. So. Mr. Mayor, yes, because I yeah. think there's a, a sense of confusion. Um, so, Alderman Arnett, is my is the following statement that I'm saying correct? Uh, uh, amendment you and 11. I'm sorry, Alderman Payon. My apologies. Happens to me all the time. Uh, <laughs> Wish I had his money. <laughs> um, so, is this statement that I'm saying correct? Because I do think there's a small sense of confusion on, on a couple of our colleagues. Uh, amendment 11 and Amendment 12, which are both put forward by you, are linked because you yeah they are, go together. You're on 11. But they are, I know we are on 11, but they are linked together because Amendment uh, 11 is one of many steps you are taking to try and balance out Amendment 12. You Correct. are cutting spending here to cut revenue here. Correct. Okay, so they are inherently linked together. Um, even though they're separate pieces, you gotta kind of look at them as part of a, a whole puzzle. No, I mean, I, I for the process, I, I don't know. I won't get into the process of it, I guess, but like, no. Okay, continue. Thank he you. has yeah. said, though, it is yeah. his intention that he is. Um, this is one of many and I'm saying this strictly away from the legislative process and Robert's rules and ideology. He has said that Amendment 11 is one step of many to pay for Amendment 12. And so they are inherently linked. And I think my colleagues should keep that in mind. Uh, Alderman Pindell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this point in time, I think um, we've gone through this discussion about 11. And I do believe it's time to bring up our police department at this time, representatives, to answer any questions or concerns that we have about this piece of legislation. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> huh? Okay. So we're going to second and call in the question. All those in favor of calling the question, you might not have to come up here. Uh, say aye. 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 Opposed to calling the question. Right. No. no. You call the, what they pass, Mr. Mayor. Huh? You call it. You pass and voice She's going to do a roll call, yeah. yeah. Okay, on the motion to um, call the question to end debate, uh, Mayor Buckley. Yes. Alderman Pendell Charles. No. Alderman Finlayson. Aye. Alderman Chandelmeyer. Point of clarification. Um, this is the motion to call the question to end the debate and vote on the uh, Amendment 11. Yeah, I, I think we should end the debate. Alderman Gay? No. Alderman Savage? Aye. Alderman Arnett? Aye. Alderman Tierney? Aye. Yeah, we want to avoid calling Alderman them up. Pam. No. No. That motion carries. Yeah. So we will be voting on Amendment 11, which has been seconded. Okay. Amendment number 11. All those in favor, say aye. I'm sorry. Okay, you, you, you might want to say aye. <laughs> this is the vote for Amendment 11. It's the upper ballot. Yeah, I would, I would point out, uh, Mr. Mayor, that this freezes the positions. It does not eliminate them. Mr. Mayor, the you're in the middle of a vote. Out. Yep, okay. So, so we're in the middle it, of the vote. Uh, you call the ayes. Yep. Yes, we're voting. All the, he called for all in favor and no one All answered. those in favor of this amendment, Amendment number 11, say aye. Can we discuss it? No, We've no, been discussing it. Let's record the debate. question. <laughs> Jesus. 
No, I'm sorry you don't like that. I had a legitimate question. Mr. Mayor, Mr. No, we, Mayor, we, we've you're in the middle of the question. Mr. Mayor, you're we in the middle voting. of the voting. Uh, are there any eyes on the question on Amendment Number Eleven? Aye. One eye. Okay. Any noes? No. 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 I, I have to abstain from the vote because I didn't get an answer, so I'm not a no. I'm abstaining. You're on now. You're on Number Twelve. Okay. Number 12. Amendment Number Eleven does not pass. Uh, somebody, please forward. Uh, amendment number 12. <clears throat> Can I get a second, please? Second. Thank you. Alderman Annette. Um, I have absolutely no cuts to support this. So um, I don't understand what this amendment is. It is moving to reduce approximately $750,000 of revenue, but with absolutely no substantiation. I can find no materials uh, to support it. And I think this speaks to a point that uh, Alderman Savage was raising earlier. The whole reason we had the process to get amendments in on a timely fashion and have three meetings with all the department heads to be here to you know, help us understand the cuts was so that we would not be at the 11th hour with something like this. That doesn't even speak to what the point of this is, is the underlying point that we are going to move to a constant yield process when we formulate the budget. Um, because I think that's even without having the supporting cuts, is an entirely different uh, question and is not really raised or supported by this. So uh, once again, I cannot support this amendment. And I'm just gonna let you respond, Alderman Pound, and then Alderman Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Obviously, this is connected with the amendment prior to that. I don't understand uh, why uh, my colleague from Ward 8, other than to rub my face in it, he knows exactly what this is about. He knows exactly what I am attempting to do, and I can't do it because he, among others, voted against uh, the cuts that I were proposing and wouldn't allow me to uh, make the others. I simply couldn't get it done before the 17th, and I got it done as soon as I could. However, um, I, I agree. There's really, I mean, we can still vote for a constant yield, I guess, and take it, take it from there, but the cuts that I had in mind obviously aren't there. Alderman Tierney, and then Alderman Gay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm gonna be repetitive to agreeing with my colleagues, Alderman Arnett and, and Alderman Savage, and, and I do understand what you're trying to do, um, Alderman Payon, but this isn't a grocery list for shopping that you can just make changes the night before. We've learned through this budget process it very for like almost the first time really this budget is used on what the d different departments do and where they need the money and and we've had this back and forth even meeting the deadline has been a difficult process i know in my own amendments it's been really generous of the department heads to 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 put up with me <laughs> but um to expect that uh, uh, in the 11th hour is is with no due respect it is disrespectful to the department heads to come up here and just swallow what you have to offer again understanding your intention thank you i i don't disagree oh all you got to do is vote on it and get, i don't see how it can pass but so I think Alderman Shanamire was before you, Alderman Gay. Did you have your hand up or not? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, Ms. Dickinson, we are, for our constant yield, uh, we, are, um, we are not raising the tax rate. The rate is the same, correct? Correct. And because of the increases in assessed value, the amount we actually collect increases. So this is entirely because people's property values have gone up. Yes, and the fact that we've had new properties added to the property um, uh, roles in the meantime, uh, in the in last last year, it'll also add to our our revenue. Okay. The constant yield is a calculation of what we'd have to set the tax rate at in order to collect the same amount of dollars on the properties that existed a year ago. Okay. Um, have these values gone up more than is 
traditional from a year to year basis? Uh, I don't know what you call traditional. I know the last time we were reassessed, we had uh, 3% a year on the three year reassessment. This time around, it's a little less. It's like 2.4%, okay. I was told by the state. So that's as much history as I have okay, up here. <laughs> they, on average, go up about 2 to 3% a year? In the last, I would say I would say that's in the last five or six years. I don't okay. know what happened prior to that. It could have been higher. It could have been lower. OK, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, um, good. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. I do understand what my colleague is trying to do here. Um, and he, he's eating his. Even if, uh, as early as last week, I was at a fundraising event and I had constituents, um, we were talking about their asset t uh, tax assessments and things like that. In particular, there was one um, who she purchased her home at like, it was just about four, maybe in some change. And obviously now that these, with these annual assessments at 3%, it is contributed to her um, uh, uh um, property tax increasing or, or i don't know she's having to just pay more and i think that as when we you, we did this the first time you passed out that sheet that was helpful and they're like oh it's really only 38 dollars you know more for the average homeowner and all of that stuff but you know 38 dollars to some people is a lot of money you know um to keep up with uh the property tax rate for your home and the value of your home so how can um, well, I, I know how we can. We have to make some cuts to meet the needs and the concerns of some of our our, our, our vulnerable um, constituents who are really feeling, um, you know, the hurt of this. It's just not the million dollar homes. It's some of the more working class families. Um, and so I definitely understand what you're trying to do, Fred. And I want to be um, an advocate in this with you. Um, I will support this, obviously, meaning that I mean, it means nothing at this point because they wouldn't even give you the decency um, to ask the question after I was scorned for doing so previously. Um, so I, I'm, 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 I feel for you there, but um, yeah, I understand the concern that you shared and what with our constituents share, and it, it hurts because you. Re what can you do? As we've discussed this throughout the, uh, the the entire budget process, as it relates to you, don't want to tamper with your tax dollars because then you don't have anything to spend you don't want to cut from the police because then everybody's mad you can't cut from fire because they only have uh, a, a less than a million dollars in operating budget everything else is 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 like uh, staff and salary you can't cut from planning and zoning because every they, they want to cut grass on, on abandoned properties you can't cut from transportation because they don't have the funding you can't cut from planning uh, from parks and recreation because then you are taking away for, so it's just like what the do we do like really you know, and so I feel you there and I feel for our constituents who are owning homes and having to uh, deal with the stress of this. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's unfortunate. Alderman Shanema. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Alderman Gay, to respond on what we could do, um, we, we're dealing with a little bit of a gentrification system here, um, which I think is caused by uh, a very high demand in housing and a very low supply in housing. And so what we can do is we can start actually getting, getting the population that we need or starting uh, to actually support these services because currently we've mandated on most of our city property or we've mandated on most of the land in the city that we can only build the least return on investment housing type. Um, and so I think if we start looking in earnest, this is obviously not something we can do in this budget. If we start looking in earnest on ways to get better return on investment on property in the city, we wouldn't be as dramatically hitting our citizens with these tax increases. And also we probably wouldn't be scrambling for money as badly every single year. Like we keep talking about the structural deficit. A lot of that ties down to we mandate some of the least effective return on investment uh, zoning policies out there. We address that, we address a lot of our revenue shortfalls. Alderman Nett. I do want to address what seems to be a common misconception, including by a commenter in the Capitol over the weekend, the state has not mandated that we go to a constant yield. 
and we are overriding that direct and directive and having a higher tax rate. The only mandate from the state is that we let people know what the impact of keeping the constant yield would be. So when people argue that we're taking dollars out of their wallet, that is not the case here. I would further point out that as we have more increases to the base, which is adding to the assessed value, we have more services we have to render, and we have to pay for that. Our costs are not static. Our costs are going up every year with at least the rate of inflation, and actually in our case, because of our uh, uh, benefit burdens faster than the rate of inflation. So I don't see how we can afford to think about anything other than the tax rate that is in this budget to balance it. Now, if we want to start talking about reductions in service, which comes with attendant reductions in staff, this isn't the way to do it. The way to do it is to bite the bullet and look at, like with the survey, like with the study, the task force we're talking about, what is it that we no longer do and therefore don't have to pay for through taxes? So I, I do think that we have to put to rest this idea that the state has told us we have to go to a constant yield rate. That is not the case. Okay. Um, all those in favor of amendment number 12, say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Uh, no. No. Motion fails. Amendment fails. Uh, can we, uh, Mr. Mayor? I, I can just go, go through it because I did it with Ellie. So we're going to skip amendment 13 going straight to amendment 14. Would somebody please move amendment 14? What? Yeah. What? Third. To clarify, I've, I've withdrawn that amendment. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't know yeah. that. Oh, I didn't know that. My apologies for the whole update. I will uh, make a motion to uh, bring amendment fourteen up. Thank Second. you. Can you give us call the quit? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to give us? Anything uh, on this, uh, just, just that it's a new project, Wells Cove, that's going to be funded with uh, 52,500 bonds in 2024. And I'll let Alderman Arnett talk about this. Alderman Arnett. This is to um, put in a placeholder with uh, hopes that we'll eventually put in a dock at the end of the public access at uh, Wells Cove. Auto attorney. Um, not that I believe everything you read in the paper. <laughs> Sorry, Brooke. Um, but well, there was some comment, I think, in the paper, and it might have been an editorial. Is there a legal issue here that we should consider? Or I guess I direct that There's to the city attorney. There's a writ of mandamus, but that doesn't deal with the So the one doesn't affect the, the other. Oh, that has to do with enforcement of the. OK, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any. Do you, would, do you want to answer that? Are you asking me a question? That was, that was my question. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry, could you clarify? It sounded uh, like is, two questions. There, is there a legal thing going on with this that we should be aware of before we vote yay or nay? Does there, it impact? There the is a legal thing going on with this particular piece of property. Um, do you want details now? Well, does it impact our voting on funding it? I, I can't say that because I don't really know what you're asking in that regard. I mean, if you ask me a specific question or give me, if you want details, I can tell you what the status is of the supposed easement. If, okay, I'll ask it this way. If I vote yes on this, does it jeopardize any sort of legal uh, activity going no, on? No, it doesn't jeopardize what we're doing. Okay, that's it. Phew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> on pay on. What exactly is the purpose of the $52,500. It's the feasibility study for putting in a dock at the end of the um, stormwater public right of way there uh, coming from Boucher Avenue out to Wells Cove. Do the 
Do the people uh, around that area want the dock? Well, it depends upon which people you're referring to. The, well, the is there anybody here to testify the, to the that? Residents, the residents who want access to the water want it. Uh, I don't. I can't speak for the uh, people in Blue Heron Condominium, or uh, I think that the issue with the property at 954 um, Creek View has been resolved by the uh, port warden, so I think they're okay. So I think, yeah, there are differences of opinion, but this is speaks to the broader issue of our policy of uh, creating and adding to water access throughout the city. This is spoken to in the maritime task force in terms of one of the water access points, and it's also something that uh, Director Wendy O'Sullivan from the Park Service is talking about as part of her global plan for water access throughout the city of Annapolis. Is there anybody here to testify about that? Might not be the test the pl platform for that, Alan Pound. I'm sorry. So it might not be the testimony. Uh, you, you mean? Yeah, is there any, anybody from the neighborhood that testify that they? I don't think they would be here. No. Well, unless they were requested to be here. It's the same question I got asked a few minutes ago. I think it's only fair. Um, uh, the, I don't see anybody from the neighborhood, no. What about the, uh, let's see, any idea what effect this would have on traffic? Um, do you anticipate uh, being able to uh, uh, launch any boats, or is it simply just a dock? No, well, what is the dock for? But to berth and launch boats. Well, it's of to tie up it's, boats. It's for, it's, to... it's for launching boats, yes. So somebody will be able to come and back up and with their trailer? No, and... this is not a um, access like at uh, t uh, Trucker Street. This is a walkway. It was passed in resolution um, 2182, uh, 81, I'm sorry to create a water access. It calls specifically for a four, four, four foot wide oyster shell walkway coming from the street to the water access point. This makes water access, which there's a catchment basis, basin there right now, makes water access possible by putting a dock over top of that catchment basin out into water that is deep enough to put a whatever craft you're trying to put in that would fit on a dock, kayak, paddleboard, uh, possibly a small dinghy, those kinds of things. But part of the money is to plan that very uh, aspect. Uh, if you're not going to be berthing, and I don't think there is room to berth alongside of the dock, how do you get vehicles into and back up out of the water? I'm suspecting a system of davits that would be at the end of the dock. Uh, and that would allow people to have the use of the water in Wells Cove. Thanks, as far sir. as traffic, um, I don't know that uh, you know it would be whatever vehicle is brought there to with carrying the paddleboard if you don't walk it there or the kayak or whatever. There is parking, public parking available on the street, so cars can park there uh, and people can walk their watercraft down the pathway to the water. Thank you. Jody? I wanted to clarify that um, the description on this amendment indicates the bonds are in 2024, but the project page uh, puts them in 2022. And I wanted to clarify with the alderman that he intended for it to be in 2022 for the feasibility. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so if you look at the description and the amendment, we put FY24 for the bonds, but the project page shows them in 22. And I want to make sure that your intent is clarified here so we can correct one or the other. I, I'm not understanding your question. Okay. If you're asking me, is my anticipation that this will be more than the 52,500? Will it be in 22 or 21? 
Oh. What we did here, the project is funded in 2024. Oh, 22. But I'm it, sorry, yeah. Yeah, one yeah it's 22. 22. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. So there's a typo on the end page. It's a correction. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't understand what you were asking. Yes. The intent is for this to be in fiscal 2022. Okay. All right. Um, all those in favor of Amendment 14, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. No. Amendment 14 passes. Somebody please move Amendment 15. Get a second. Thank you. Um, I I think I'm going to go straight to Ellie. I love flower pots. So. <laughs> um, yes. So this is, um, as I said, this is in the you know uh, pay now, save later category. We are, um, we will be having hanging baskets um, it, that are, I think, much appreciated after the pandemic. Watering has always been an issue, uh, and we currently have the parks and recs. Uh, department doing it um, pretty much they will be doing it daily and on weekends and, and it's you know in the th th pulling them away from other activities and then we're also using um, you know other people who have who have volunteered their time well not volu well they work for Parks and Rec so what this does is purchase this year uh, for hanging for using next year these self watering baskets which just basically hold the water uh, more and will minimize the uh, watering. Um, since the work session, I've worked with um, um, Director Trader and and our water usage uh, numbers and came up with a um, you know what possible savings of uh, sixty you know it would save about sixty five hundred dollars in watering each year. Um, but this is to approve the purchase of them only. And the flower baskets went up today. You should all get out there and have a look. They look beautiful. So yeah. thank you. Alderman Annette and then Alderman Finlayson. Are we um, going to be able to water baskets on the Eastport Bridge? S same same ones. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. That's the hottest spot of it. <laughs> Alderman Finlayson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, are these watering planters reusable or is this a one-time expense the intention is for them to be reusable okay yeah um in the past i know we have been in you know pretty dire straits and the downtown uh, partnership i think it was helped to sponsor the planters are they um still doing any of that um, actually, they will be downtown Annapolis partnership. Um, Eric Evans will be purchasing these baskets. It's, um, they will be they will be helping us um, not paying. They had I think what you're talking to talking about is a, a can, um, sort of a fundraiser thing. They had a couple and it just didn't wasn't successful. The hanging basket program or blooming baskets. Um, so I think that they're planning on. Um uh, supplementing it I think they're working on a couple of fundraising ideas for it with the garden club and and different areas maybe um, city so manager can give us a little status on where they are with the plants now that is my question whether we're supplementing them or what, what how are we doing so th this year we had money in the planning and zoning budget to, to buy flowers uh, so we provided that to, as uh, Alderwoman Tierney said, we provided that to the downtown program and, th and then they purchased it. So we provide that as a grant and then they did all the coordination and purchasing and oversaw the installation. So I guess that's our intention going forward is that that type of system. I'm not sure if they have their own money that they're contributing towards that, but, but we paid for most of it. Okay. Um, I guess I was recalling that they had offered um, to pay for them at one time, and this may have been in the distant past, um, and just wondered how they would respond um, if we would pay part of it, hmm. whether they're paying any of it. But it looks like we're paying the, the whole freight for it. 
and these are reusable planters. So next yeah. year we're just plant, paying for the flowers. Yeah, they, and they won't be used until next year uh, because we've already installed the ones for this year. So these will be purchased over the winter and then the, the flowers planted in these planters and then they'll be used year after year. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Hold on, okay. No. Okay. Uh, all those. Oh, yep. actually, I'm sorry. So this will be coming out of the fifty thousand dollars in planning in the planning and zoning budget under special programs for an, um, for the downtown partnership. Uh, so we also have money in planning and zoning to purchase the flowers. Uh, these these pots will be purchased using the reserve for one-time uses. We will purchase them once, but next year we will have to purchase flowers again to put in them. So we have the 20000 in planning and zoning. That's more towards the flower purchase, not towards the planters. We also, in addition to buying the flowers, have to water them. And this time around, trying to use Rec and Park staff to do it. Uh, but it is a little bit of a push for them to try to, to water these. So the the savings on their time and the savings of the water cost and using a self-watering planter is going to help. Yeah, and, and this I is get, just for the one-time purchase of the pots. Yeah, and I, and I get that. I think it's a great idea. All the women tyranny sent out a thing. It'll save us $6,500 annually, I believe. Yeah. My uh, question is it, 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 one of two things. In the planning and zoning budget, there is a, a, a special... Um, a thing that says events and programming and under that it says fifty thousand dollars for um downtown partnership that that's something separate okay all right that's, that's, what, I was, yeah, yeah, that's what i was just asking okay thank you so much um i think i found the answer this is moving funding from contingency to rex and parks is that correct it's using funding in the reserve for one-time uses, which is not the same thing as the contingency account. Okay. I don't want to confuse those two. We're going to use those some of those one-time reserve monies to pay for the pots. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all those in favor of amendment number 15, say aye. 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 Opposed? Right. Amendment 15 aye. passes with no opposition. Oh, uh, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Somebody please move amendment number 16. Thank you. Okay. This will definitely need some uh, yeah. explaining. Please, uh, Director Dickinson and Ellie. Yeah, this is this has been um yeah this is an example of um going back and forth with departments. Um, we talked about this at the work session. For those of you, this is uh, an administrative position that I'm asking uh, to be um, civil service um, just due to the um, the work that this person already does, what she did all through. Excuse COVID. me. I'm COVID. sorry. COVID. It's a personnel discussion. Um, I'm not sure you, how. You, you're talking about a position, not a name. Did I say a name? Position. You, you, you referenced a gender. Oh. Good point. I apologize. Yeah. So we're looking at a position to elevate. And um, at first, the amount was, uh, um, I think there was a correct, there had to be a correction in the amount and the source of the money. Um, in meeting the deadline, I didn't do a good job in trying to find the money. I since then looked um, at um, DPW contractual services and not to put Director Johnson on the spot, but we're down to twenty thousand dollars necessary, and I don't think we have it. So unless I don't know if he wants to speak to it, or out of courtesy, uh, maybe. Um, I took a close look at the uh, budget yeah. and uh, how the amount was formulated, and we really have no uh, slack in what we put forward in FY22. So there is no funding available for yeah. to be reappropriated for this use. Yeah, uh, um, it's, uh, this process I've, is a good process, but however, it's very frustrating as an alder person because 
um, I just find that there's something obviously wrong with our budget and our staff dollars if that we can't do this. Um, you know, we can't find twenty thousand dollars, and I don't. And it isn't anyone's fault. Uh, I gave it the old college try, but I'm just. Um, I guess I just have to. I don't know what to do. Do I withdraw it? Why aren't we calling Rob? <laughs> uh, so close, though. It was up at 70. <laughs> well, so Alderman Pan had his hand up first, so. Alderman Pan, you were next, Thank then, you. then Alderman Savage, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, now, this is $20,000 from the lighting fund, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, what's going to, how are we going to replace that in the lighting fund? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? How, how do we replace that in the lighting fund? Well, well, we can't. The, the amount that we um, put in in FY22 is pretty close to what we need to pay that. Do we always have a surplus in the lighting fund? We, we don't really have much surplus. I mean, the, the rates, of course, are set by BGE. And then we do have to account for funding for replacements of fixtures if we have a knockdown. Well, damage fixtures, things of that I, nature. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I got plenty of lights that don't work in my okay. in my ward, and I, I would think that we could put a big den in twenty thousand dollars if if uh, you know if I called them in. I know it's not cheap to replace lights. It's uh, really not cheap to replace light poles, but it's not even cheap to replace replace the lights. Um, as far as I know, is that a safe assumption on my part? That's a safe assumption. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this person doesn't work for your department, does she? Excuse me. Or, excuse me, the, this position is not um, part, of, uh, part of your department, is it? No, it is not. I'm just going go okay, to go to Director Gerald. We shouldn't have any lights out. bg &E should be taking care of that, right? Well, I wasn't going to address that, but I was going to address the bigger issue of not having available money in the budget for things like this. Uh, so just a reminder that for the last two years, because we've had budget deficits projected, pretty big ones, we've scrubbed the non-personnel part of the budget to, to where it's bare. I mean, it's literally we scrubbed every extra dollar out of there. So. Unless we want to start talking personnel costs, which is the lion's share of the budget, there's not a lot of wiggle room in this budget. We've just we've scrubbed it all out on the yeah. non-personnel side. No, I know, I know, I know. So I I guess I'll make a motion to withdraw it. Oh, you had your hand raised. Okay. Got some more discussion going on. I think I was on this side, Alderman Savage. Yeah, I mean, so. I guess first question would be to Dr. Nash. Uh, how long has this position been a contractual position? Good afternoon. This position has been contractual for approximately 20 years. Well, 20 years? Yeah. Um, contractual employee for 20 years. Um, well, I'll let others speak to the overall policy, but um, the thing that, so I thought that the council kind of set a general idea of five-year review, and I think that's you know, generally good to, to have a, at least some policy around this, because I think one of the concerns is, is in elsewhere in this budget, we have converted other positions from contractual to civil servant. And in some cases, those positions haven't been contractual for only a year or two, where this is 20. So it kind of gets to the question of just how, how can we do this in an equitable manner? I thought that's why the council had some kind of policy to, to have these conversions. And, and, I, and again, I, I, one of the reasons I withdrew my amendment was because, again, when I looked down, when I finally looked down, because so I was worried about the growth of contractual positions, but when I looked at the actual total full-time equivalent, we are actually have three, almost three less positions um, than we did last year. Like I said, that's not much, but it still represents, I think, a responsible approach. Ultimately, we need to possibly look in, in reducing that even more, but 
the point is, I think we, we should be able to try, we should be able to find the money somewhere to, um, it seems like if this position has been tracked for so long um, that we should take a hard look at converting it. Um, and I'm just wondering in terms of where to get the, the money, uh, I mean, we have, what about the, the bailout money, the federal money that we've received that can be used on, on uh, operating expenses? Um, this is just, this would just take $20,000 of that. Um, but I guess, um, in my understanding, Dr. Nash, is you did find some money to help go towards this conversion, but it was just kind of not, not, not enough to do a full conversion, is that right? That's correct. All right, I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. Um, Mr. City Manager? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to note that this is a part-time position, so it's been part-time for 20 years. We don't have part-time civil service positions, so that's that's why it's remained as a contractual position. And Director Dickerson? Just that some of the costs that it was going to originally be to bring this on as a full-time position, we, uh, Dr. Nash decided she could cover some of it with the uh, uh, community development block grant administrative monies that we get this position could help out with some of those duties as well and that was the other funding source and I think this 20,000 is what we've had it whittled down what we've whittled down the cost to so this is that part that would need to be picked up by the general fund well if I could just quick follow-up I didn't realize it was part-time position so you're saying we don't have we don't have part-time civil servants um, but is this position going to remain as a part-time contractual position? No. no, I was proposing to make it full-time and then um, the, the position itself as described now would brought into a more general administrative position and do other administrative work. Oh, okay, starting this year? Okay. So presumably then after five years after that it would be, if not sooner, reviewed to see if it needs to become a civil servant or not. Okay. We've right, got a lot of hands up. Alderman Pindell Charles and Alderman Finlayson and Alderman Gay and then Alderman Pound. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Gerald, is my understanding of uh, basically that based on new technology that more than likely as far as funding and the, and the lighting that we will be having some savings um, when it comes to the lighting. Is that correct? So we've had the uh, new LED lights for a couple of years, two or three years now. So we've, we've realized some of that and we've adjusted the, the budget downward to reflect that. Uh, so that's why Director Johnson said that, that that's already incorporated those savings that we expect from LED lights. Okay. Thank you so much. Alderman Finlayson? I, I guess I have um, several questions. Um, this position was a part-time position that we want to move to full-time. Is that correct, Dr. Nash? Um, so was it a contractual position part-time for 20 years? Well, we did not technically have a contract for that position until two years ago. So what, how was the position classified prior to that? It's a gray area to me. I'm not <laughs> sure if, um, if well, I, I'll, Jody or I, I'll let you. It, off it was that the position had existed for so long, paid out of our salaries. It just continued on, and then when Mr. Lyles came on and, and said we should have contracts for people, that is when the okay. the official contract period started, which was actually this would be the second year of the contract. I asked because Alderman, um, Alderman um, Arnett has raised the issue, well, shared a number of times the fact that uh, we had a committee that was charged with moving contract positions to permanent positions. These are folks who had been in contract, on contract with the city for anywhere from five to 25 years. And there were, I want to say, 110 people on that list. And over three years or so, we moved most of them into permanent positions. So that's why I was surprised to hear somebody 
that was on contract for 20 years because I'm sure we took those that were had been on contract the longest and moved them first. And then we ran out of money and didn't get to the last group. So there may be still a few out there. Um, but I also recall a um, couple of administrations ago when the economy tanked and we eliminated all administrative positions in all departments. And this is one of the departments that has managed to get an, an admin position back. Many have not, which is my concern, because we still have any number of departments that don't have administrative assistance. We have staff that's rotating through, answering the telephones, and taking messages and the like. So I would like for us, and this is aside from this amendment, to have a plan, create a plan, to restore those administrative positions. Because we see, like, this one is coming in now. Uh, we had one or other earlier, I think, today. Depends on the alderman and who likes what department they put forward uh, supporting that admin position. I think we should be consistent across the board. I believe every department deserves their administrative positions. So I think we need a plan not to piecemeal it, but to make sure that everybody, every department has that support system. So thank you. I don't have a position yet. <laughs> Alderman Gay, then Alderman Pan, then Alderman Arnett. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I get what my colleague is trying to do. I think I just share the concerns of others, it is even as Alderwoman um, Finlayson just pointed out. So do we do this for every? department in, 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 in creating some sort of administrative office associate to assist them. Um, I, I guess when I think of um, this role I, in the current form that it's in, if it's, you know, the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's been like this for 20 years, um, what, it, what was your concern now? Or were you just trying to ensure that um, the position just could be moved for to to full time, or was there any pressing needs behind it? Well, first off, this experience has taught me not to get into personnel issues. Even though, as as older woman, going to a lot of commission meetings at night and getting involved with departments where I see a need, um, I just don't feel like it's in my place after this learning experience to direct staff to make changes with their staff. And I didn't want to make any implications that there's money in the budget that you know is hidden or anything. I'm just sharing my frustration in the whole process. Um, that this is a position that's been you know under underrated, I guess is the word, um, that I've witnessed and, and very integral with um, with uh, planning and zoning function. So um, that was my intent. I mean there's I can't speak more than that. So, and then my question for the director, because I don't want to get in the current role, um, do, outside of it, if it stays as a part time position, do you foresee any challenges with the current role? So the, the reason why I asked it to become full time is because the amount of time we have and come to spend on administering our boards and commissions mm -hmm. has grown over time. Mm -hmm. As each case becomes a little more litigious, we, there is a lot more work involved in getting the exhibits ready, getting the documents here. Um, and right now, it is our seniors planners doing a lot of that work, which is not a good use of their time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it would probably help speed up our review times if we could have them not do as many administrative tasks, move that to this position where this could be added on to other responsibilities. Um, we had an administrative position that was cut that we, we never got back full time. Um, we still have a part time receptionist that you know I'll be back next year asking for. Uh, um, spoiler alert. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we do a lot of administrative tasks 
Um, we all do a lot of administrative tasks, and, and that's fine, we can manage it, but if, if there's pressure to get things through the process quickly, if there's pressure to get things to, to court in the exact right order, um, you know, we can't rise to those pressures yeah. if we don't have the right people. And, and you've done great work at those planning commission meetings the staff has. I've had a chance to go to a few planning and all of that stuff, and it's always great. Um, and you, you guys assist us well. So I will vote for this um, amendment. I do have, I don't want to say caveat because then it's making it seem like a quid pro quo, but could you um, just commit to looking at some sort of grant funding to help assist with um, you know, uh, uh, the, the financing of these roles similar to what um, Director Simmons has done with um, the Office of Emergency Management? Sure, if, if such a thing exists. Well, I'm not sure, but the, yeah, that's what I would like to, to know. I mean, I'm not sure what, what it, who, who does your grants? We all do our grants. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, well, I, I don't know. That's just something I'd be interested in seeing if there was monies available to assist um, uh, with the cost of the staff and planning and zoning. I mean, we, we, I am also proposing that this position work with Teresa Wellman, which is how we are able to use some of the CDBG money um, to pay Teresa's salary, and then some of the money we have now programmed for Teresa's salary would go to pay for this position, because this position would help Teresa with some of her, um, we'd like to take a, a more active role in our MPDU processing um, to help the county out. They, ACDS, they do a great job, but they're really overwhelmed. We, we would like to take a more active role in managing those. So we'll be, uh, now, that I'm, now my ears are perking up because you know, are you taking dollars from community block development grants to pay for, uh, or so is this out of is this separate money or is this um, once they allocate funding to us, right off the top, you take out uh, money for administrative staffing? You can take money for administration. So how much would that be? Like, so if we got, I'm just using the number that we got in the last one due to COVID, if we got like 250,000, do you take like 50 right off the top for administrative staffing? Uh, 15. Oh, 15, okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Little pen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you may not be the right person to answer this, but what, um, how does the uh, uh, full-time uh, civil service position compare salary-wise with the contract? And also, if someone were to be selected for that job who was a contract employee now, would they be able to buy back their retirement? I ask that because that can involve a substantial amount of money depending on you know, where they are, where they start. Um, would that person, might that person get credit for um, step increases and start at a higher salary than um, someone, uh, someone else who was not a contract employee? I, I don't know. I'll have, to, I'll have to step in here. <laughs> you probably don't want to answer that. Because any, any position that's created in civil service has to be competed, right. has to go out to the world, and a position has to be created by human resources. A position has to be created by human resources, which has all the benefits attended to it as though it's created from the ground up. It's, it's impossible for, for this council and for the administration to consider a new position to be based on something that already exists because that would be illegal. So Look, I asked a very legitimate question about buybacks. It involves potentially a substantial amount of money, and I think I'm entitled to get an answer to well, it. Well, maybe we can do that in a closed session. We'd be happy to uh, I'm sorry? You. We'd be happy to answer your question in a closed session. I, I don't... All right. Okay, Alderman Annette, then Alderman Savage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It seems to me at this point we have a defective amendment in that we have heard from the Director of Public Works that this money is not free from his department. So unless we find another source for the $20,000, I don't know how we can uh, continue to talk about 
making this conversion. I, I certainly am sympathetic to planning and zoning. They've they've actually suffered the biggest permanent cuts in staffing from way back when we had our financial difficulties uh, in 2008, 2009. But until we have a source for funds for this, I don't know how we can continue to talk about this conversion. So do we have an alternative for $20,000 here? Mr. City Manager? Not that I'm aware of. Then I don't see how we can, with no no source of funds. Uh, Jody, can you clarify that for us? Clarify whether or not there's another source of funds recurring. Um, not immediately, no. I mean, unless one of the departments knew they had too much in one of their accounts, and so far none of them have said they're overfunded. Um, you know, the only possibility would be finding funds within our, uh, for instance, uh, one t using more of those one-time ARPA funds to cover it for this year, but then we'd be faced next year with trying to, you know, get the, uh, find the funding for it again. So, um, <clears throat> Definitely not a one-time only spending. Um, Alderman Savage was next. And, uh, Alderman Turney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Nash, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was getting confused. I was reaching over to check the budget book. But um, how many contractual positions does your department have? Five. Oh, five contractual. Okay, I thought it was only, okay. Do you know them off the top of your head? We have a part-time plumbing inspector, part-time electrical inspector. We have a assistant chief of historic preservation. We have a recording secretary, and we have an administrative assistant. Okay, and this position is the administrative assistant? This position would be an called an administrative assistant but would have the duties of the recording secretary as well as additional duties but okay but you but you said you are you have you already have a recording secretary until the end of the fiscal year we do okay so that position is going away at the end of the uh oh no sorry we we have that position right so that this is proposing to deduct the amount we pay for that position from the total I'm confused so, now. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that it is proposed that that position would be eliminated. The recording Money secretary for that position. position move over to an administrative position in okay. full time in the department. And you also mentioned a receptionist. That's right. That is an an additional position we have part time. So that's an additional contractual, but it's part time. Yes. Okay, but. Um, but you said the administrative assistant, I thought you said is also part-time currently? The administrative assistant is part-time. The assistant chief of historic preservation is part-time. And our plumbing and electrical inspectors are part-time. Oh, right, right, All of right, our contractual yeah. positions are part-time. Okay. All right. Yeah, you, you know, I... I was considering supporting this, but now I feel like I'm more confused than I was, and I think we need to take more time in the future if this needs to be looked at. But uh, yeah. So, uh, point um, point of order, Mr. Mayor, uh, I don't know how we can consider this without a source of funding. Jody, is there a source of funding for this for us to consider? Not from a repetitive uh, so revenue source, no. Not from, um, you know, continual yearly annual revenue sources, no. <clears throat> yeah, if we, if we funded it this time with a one-time source, next year it would add to the, uh, to the structural deficit because we wouldn't have a continuing funding source for it. Except for next year we have more ARPA monies, but then the following year We'd have an expense there for a civil service employee without a continuing funding source. Thank you. Alderman Tyranny was next, then Alderman Payon. Well, I can't revise that funding source 
on the floor, can I? In other words, can I revise this funding source as a one-time expense? Oh, uh, no. The that, funding source. <laughs> that's That would be a legal question. Can we change the description and the funding source of the amendment on the floor? That Harper, that Harper money. The city Am I getting asked a question? Yeah, yeah. Can can <laughs> we <laughs> can we change the funding funding source on the floor? I don't think we can. Well, well, what you have the amendment you have is the amendment you're considering. There is no other amendment available to consider. So if this amendment has no funding source, that's what you're considering. An amendment with no funding source. Well, is it one time funding source? Yes. Well, there is no funding source that is being considered currently in front of the council for this position. It doesn't appear even in the amendment. <laughs> okay, Elmer Pounds next. Thank you. Uh, you're right, Mr. Mayor. It's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> you're right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I call the question at this point. All right. All those in favor of calling the question say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Ayes have it. Debate's finished. Everybody ready to vote on uh, Amendment 16. All those in favor say aye. 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 I'm going to go aye. <laughs> I think we'll do a roll call. Yep. Yes. How is it? No, Ross, it has a funding source for this year. It doesn't have a funding source for next year. Technically, it doesn't have a funding source at all. No, it it's has a funding source. And there is a funding source stated in the amendment. And if you pass it as is, it will remove from that funding source and move it over to, the, to this oh, I didn't purpose. see it in the list. No, what she's what she's what she's doing is point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Okay, so we've got that's going to do a roll call on this. Okay, Mayor Mayor Buckley. Uh, aye. Alderman Pinnell Charles. Aye. Alderman Felason. Hmm? Alderman Shadamire. Aye. Alderman Gay. Aye. Alderman Savage? No. Alderman Arnett? <laughs> Alderman Tierney? Aye. Alderman Payon? No. The yeah, eyes have it. Amendment number 16 carries. Oh boy. <laughs> I guess I won't get a pothole fixed in the near future. <laughs> it's going to help us in the short term. We'll fix it. We'll work. Yeah. We'll do something. So. All right. Uh, Jody. I just wanted to follow up a comment. If we get further along in the year and we, if the director, Director Johnson was correct and there's not enough money there, we're going to have to find a way to, to, to fix this eventually if that happens. I just, don't worry, we won't forget about it. Yeah, that, that, that that's why I said it wasn't fun. It's not even funded for the whole year. <laughs> Point of information, please. Is there room in our process um, at the end of all of the amendments to see what um, funding still exists in the contingency fund that we could then return to Public Works, the $20,000? Each year, we, out, we have an appropriation in a contingency account, and we keep it there mainly for th things like snow. If we have a bad winter, we need to, to use some of that money, DPW, or other unexpected needs. We budget that every year, so that is a recurring appropriation. And there, if we got to the end of FY22 and needed more funding in the street lighting, you could take it from the council could approve to take it from contingency, but it's something that has to come back to council. My question is, can that happen today? 
at so the end. So we don't need it today because FY, you mean today, like? Like today. <laughs> yeah. So there, the, you, it would require an additional amendment that would take an appropriation out of what we've proposed to be in the contingency fund and move it to Director Johnson's budget for street lighting. It was, so it would require another amendment to move that appropriation. Okay. So can I make that request by the end of our discussion today? You well, you I'm can you, that you can I mean, you, you can request amendments. The council has to decide as a body whether or not we offer we accept whether or not you're going to hear ex other amendments today. Mr. Mayor, I just want to be clear because I heard um, discussions about monies being taken from one department for another without the uh, support of respective departments. Then I heard discussion about there not being a funding funding source for an amendment. So now I'm just trying to figure out how to restore the funding that we've taken away um, from a given department. So I, I think we need a mechanism to do that. I think that would be a suspension of the rules. Is that right, Mr. City Attorney? That's right, to me. That's right Mr. Mayor. So you can get... give it some thought. You don't have to yeah. <laughs> tell me at this moment. No, that, that's correct. It has to be included in any amendments you consider on the floor. So I can make a verbal amendment at the end of this whole, all of our amendments. Yes. I can make a, a, a motion to. Um, Sus suspend the rules to consider more okay. amendments after that were submitted after the deadline. Okay. I'm good with that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. We're moving on. To, um, someone please move um, Amendment 17, please. Well, can I just do a point of clarification for Alderman and Finmeisen? That... I think they explained mm -hmm. it to her that she'll have to. Well, sus suspending the rules is going to have to be unanimous. Exactly. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So I, this is, it's a flawed amendment. As much as I initially supported it, it's a flawed amendment that has inserted chaos into this budget process because now we have to fix it because it's flawed. I'd really encourage one of the original, one of the yes votes to make a motion to reconsider because this is, it's again, it was flawed. That's one reason why we we, we asked uh, Alderman Payone, um, you know, he didn't have all the information in, but we have this flawed amendment we just ended up passing. I didn't realize it was this flawed till we got into it. I, to what I mentioned, Alderman, is, is we'd have to get a unanimous m a vote to suspend the rules in order to fix this. Um, so I'm just saying that's what the, the city attorney has just said. So I think we should really try to avoid that by reversing this decision on the amendment. It may, I, may I respond? Uh, I am not interested in suspending the rules because I know what the implications would be for us. Um, so there may be another mechanism that my concern will be taken care of. So not to worry. Okay, moving right along. Uh, somebody please move Amendment 17. Good news is that was just $20,000. You guys were doing that with $2 million before we got here. Right. Yeah. Um, so moved. Second. Did you do second? Yeah. Okay. What? Okay, we've got a first and a second. Any. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Alderman Tyranny. Um, yeah. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. Um, this uh, this um, amendment, we reviewed at the work session and um, I, since the work session, um, um, Kwaku and I have been discussing on what is the inventory we have, this whole bus thing, and how can we make it work and not have to wait till, um, and wait for the e-vehicles, the e-buses, or wait for the um, you know the city dock action committee to have a transit plan. We the fact is is that we have underutilized buses. They exist. We have smaller buses. So what this does is it's a one-time expense to invest in the necessary software uh, to fund um, to implement um, a micro transit pilot program. In target areas to get to get residents um, 
that that want to you know to get them on the bus, but using um, an on-call system, um, and that will really take off. Um, but we need the jump start on it uh, with this with this um, this this one hundred thousand um, dollars. Would Kwaku like to speak more of it? Because <laughs> um, I really applaud his his. Um, I really applaud him for, for really targeting a need and, and finding a great idea, I thought. Um, thank you, Kwaku. Thank you, Kwaku. Thank you. Um, uh, this morning, we did hear that what is happening to our, uh, our, our transit development plan in terms of the implementation. And this is one of the short-term uh, recommendations to do it. So it's a micro-transit system. It's a pilot project. Uh, also called the general demand response, which I, I did also hear Alderman Annette talking about using that one to expand the transit system and move it into a new era and also increase ridership. So in the plan, it makes recommendation of converting the orange route, which already exists. Uh, it is part of the current operating budget uh, and then turn it into a micro transit pilot project. What it does is that it goes to those of those areas where the overall transit demand is less and therefore it's not feasible or cost effective to have a fixed route. So they will use their phone app, um, book an appointment, we dispatch the vehicle, pick them up, and then take them to the next major transfer point, i.e. eSport, and then they can continue the um, bus trip to say the mall or to downtown. So once we do that, because we expect this uh, uh, micro transit to be part of the future transit system, we will build upon that, especially to serve those uh, communities where based upon our transit needs analysis, there is not much demand for it, but there is some, and therefore we can tailor the, the service to, to their needs in these uh, areas. Thank you. Um, Alderman Shanomar, then Alderman Annette, <laughs> and then Fred. <laughs> um, a lot of hands up. So we basically, we, we see a need not addressed by our current system that this amendment will take a small bet in trying to address, correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay. So this is, I think, exactly the kind of uh, risk we should be willing to take. Uh, it's a very small investment. If it works, we can start ramping it up. Uh, if it does not work, well, we tried to learn something. And um, I appreciate the, the curiosity and willing to try something new with this. Uh, so um, I, I am going to be supporting this amendment. Small Thank bets. <laughs> Alderman Nett is next, then Alderman Pern, then Alderman Finlayson, Alderman Gay. As then. is usual, I'm in complete agreement with Alderman John Omeyer. <laughs> 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 um, but I do have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I know exactly the meaning of the word micro. I, I'm assuming it means smaller than a regular bus. But I am wondering what the resource is. Now, we, we do have private sector ready-made resources called cabs, Uber, and Lyft. But this would imply some kind of a voucher system or something like that. Uh, I'm assuming that we're, we're uh, approving $100,000 and we'll seek out answers to questions like that. Uh, Microtransit is another term for what is called general demand response uh, uh, service. Uh, we, there are two types. One is uh, focused on people with disabilities, where we do um, care to care pickup. Uh, this one, there is no limitations in terms of whether you have disabilities or not, so it's general. And because it's focused on specific, specific geographic areas, that is why the word micro comes in instead of just running around. Uh, a classic example is in Mon Montgomery County where they did identify specific geographic areas and then also they have a pilot project 
that will pick up people who will need to go to certain places to their next major transfer point and then they will continue their trip. So the micro is uh, as opposed to your normal overall transit system. So that's where the term comes in. So, so thank you for that. Um, yes, I, I really strongly support this. I think also as we um, get into self-propelled automobiles, I think this is gonna become even more feasible um, so I will be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Alderman Payon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Du, I, I have to apologize if you've already answered this. For some reason, I have a great deal of difficulty. The acoustics are terrible in here, but even with my hearing aids in, I have a great deal of difficulty understanding you, and I apologize if I um, go over something you've already covered. Um, where do we get the $100,000 figure from? <laughs> uh, we worked, we collaborated. <laughs> we okay. thought that was a safe... Uh, well, that, that that's was... great, but that doesn't really answer my question. Um, do we... Well, if we, it, we're, basically the way we looked at it is we're going to buy what we can with the $100,000. Um, it, it possibly could cost more, but the pilot it is a pilot based on what we can afford for the hundred thousand dollars as far as the software um, and utilizing existing inventory of buses and um, you know it's sort of out of the box thinking I mean one day the circulators may be available and we'll be able to use them for point-to-point -point service uh, did you study what other cities have done yeah that's where this came from and it's morphed since since the conception um, they've been um, other cities have done something more broad and not focused on just um, micro transit, meaning you know filling in the blanks. They've been able to utilize their existing services, Washington well, D.C. and in Boston, Mass. And um, well, we uh, we haven't voted on the budget yet. Why, why isn't this money in your budget instead of in out of the reserve fund? Because we again. <laughs> Whoever wants to can take me up on this. Well, the whole premise of this was that we have an underutilized um, bus system, and that's kind of a given. Yeah, I'll say. Right. So, what do you do? I mean, do you just do you just give up on it? No. Do you try to elevate it? Yes. That was the first approach. Was wow. Let's just do ninety days of free buses. I mean, we weren't losing that much money because of the ridership. But then when we looked into it, we realized that one of the reasons that people aren't using the buses is that they can't get to the line. They can't get to the green or the orange. They just need that ride. Um, and um, so we're, and again, we can use different, we can use existing inventory to fit that need. We're not buying additional buses or whatever, but it's so that they can get to a bus route and they can use it. Um, to get to work, et cetera. And then hopefully right. the objective is to increase ridership. Does this tie into the uh, the parking? I mean, that's a transportation function, the way we have it divided up uh, also. I mean, can you use the same app for to find a parking space? I don't know that, but I believe the developers so, can. It's okay. That's why I'm asking it. <laughs> but, but definitely it could be an integrated yeah. piece sure. of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. It could be integrated. Okay, so the idea is to call the uh, transit uh, Department of Transportation and uh, get a bus ride when you need one? Is that is that? I mean, can you explain pretty, in pretty, a little bit more detail? Pre pretty much. It's similar to an Uber model that will have a, you know, um, Annapolis City Bus app. How cool is that? That um, you can get on and request request the closest pickup. It might not, you know, won't come to your house like an Uber, but at least. Um, so you'll have one like driving around the. It might come to your house, actually. Sorry, <laughs> what? Driving around the city dock, and uh, you call, and they pick you up at uh, in front of Steve Yeah, Samaris's I place. mean, eventually, yeah. But the first thing is to to again uh, um, optimize our existing lines you know, get to our existing lines. We sort of have a fragmented, not fragmented, bad word, but just sort of, um, you know, rigid bus route. Um, so if we can get people to them uh, with this on-call, um, with this on-call method, it, it 
you know, we're, we're pretty hopeful it will increase the ridership to people, you know, to reaching out to communities, um, you know, that are out in, you know, the communities that are, are not downtown, they're, they, and they want to get downtown, um, you know, that are outside, um, just outside, almost, just almost outside the limits of the city. Well, I think there's tremendous potential with this. I'll, I'll yeah, be honest with you. Risk, yeah. um, the buses come into Ward 2 in one place exactly. and one place only, Point. and that's West Street right on the border of Ward 2. And I think there may be, there's either one or two stops, that's it. No stadium, no West Annapolis. I mean, it's really not usable for, for, yeah. for most of the people in Ward yeah. 2. And heck, the people that complain the most are ones who live down on Clay Street, and they're probably closest, not close, but closest to a bus stop uh, yeah. of anyone in my ward. I, you know, I can, I yeah. like it, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's exactly the need. I think Alderman Finlayson was next, then Alderman Gay, then Alderman Savage. Uh, thank you. Um, this 100,000, um, which I think I heard you say, you didn't, it wasn't a rhyme or reason as to why this amount, um, is to be used to design software or develop software and design an app. Yeah, it goes together. Yeah. And then that software, the app, will be used to request transit. Yes, ma'am. So what vehicles will be using for the request? Uh, currently, we have a, a small uh, bus, uh, which is uh, what we used to have it on the orange route. So that is the one that we will use for that. So it's they will, I'm sorry. It's not the large bus, it's just one bus that will be used. Okay, so there will be one bus. Yes, ma'am. Um, and after the pilot, then what? Uh, after the pilot, we assess the successfulness of the project. We will look at the strengths and the weaknesses. And because it will not be additional cost, uh, if we believe that it's going to help people get to where they need to go uh, to work or to shop, we will continue with that. So the whole idea of a pilot is to determine how successful it will be so that you make a determination to continue with it in the future. Okay. And if we determine that it is a, a worthwhile uh, program, would there be a plan to expand then the buses? Because it sounds like it's going to be difficult to have one bus and you know people going into the app to reserve their ride and they just have to mm. wait until it's their turn initially i i don't see the need to expand the buses because uh we do have what is called spare ratio and because for this particular service you need to call and schedule we will be able to make accommodation for that uh, typically, your spare ratio is about 25% of whatever that you have. And because of that, if there is an increase in demand, we should be able to use some of the spare buses to basically accommodate that. Uh, another possibility is that for the ADA paratransit bus, basically the buses are all equipped for ADA purposes. Uh, because they are also scheduled, we know the schedule. So if there is a gap or the software will be able to make help us determine that okay, from point A, if you drop this ADA person, uh, this bus can actually be sent to this particular location to pick up the person to the next bus stop. So there is a lot of room to do integration with this general demand response uh, service with our existing ADA paratransit service. I'll be honest with you, I'm very hesitant. First of all, I think 100,000 is a lot for um, something that's pretty kind of unknown to us. Um, and no others are using it. I think in Montgomery County, though, they're pretty targeted in um, their, I guess, districts or whatever they're called. Um, but 
and and that's what I wanted to explain to uh, Alderman Payon when he did indicate that the buses keep on running around. That is really not the case. As I said earlier, uh, we do target it to specific geographic areas in the city where there is some demand, but it's not cost effective to run the fixed route. So similar to Montgomery County, they, we are going to target it to specific geographic areas. So as the system catches up and many more people have interest in that, we will take a look at the whole entire system and determine that we may want to run more services on the so-called arterial system and use some of the buses to do more of the micro transit, which will bring them to the transfer points so that if you want to go to the mall, we pick it up somewhere uh, just well beyond where the giant is. We can drop you, drop you off at the eSport uh, uh, transfer point. You take the eSport bus and then go to the mall. So this, this is a concept that you have. So it's not just running around the city uh, like a taxi. Uh, you need to call. Typically, there is a two-hour window. So if you are planning to have your trip at, say, 10 a.m., uh, you need to call by 8 a.m. so that we make arrangement. And because of the software, when you call and you want to schedule you, it gives us an idea who has called for that particular time slot. So we will let you know that, okay, we may have to wait a little bit longer because Mr. X or Ms. Y actually has that specific time. So we need to pick up the person before we actually pick you up. So we, with the software, it will help us to operate it much more efficiently than doing it manually by calling and then you will have a, a paper and a pen and then you go through to determine if the time slot that you have asked for is uh, taken by another person or not. Yeah. Last question, how, how do they pay for this service? Uh, the, 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 the buses are equipped with uh, fare boxes. Uh, the what, I'm sorry? Uh, fare boxes, so you, fare box. uh, yeah, currently you can pay through the fare box. What we are also looking at is that we are taking another look at the entire fare box system where basically we will be moving uh, into a more electronic or mobile payment as a way because our current fare box system can be reconfigured to accept a mobile payment. Uh, so you buy the pass on your phone, you get to the bus, you tap it, it records that actually you have paid and then you get on board. Okay, I'm sorry I said it was the last question because now I do have another one. So would the expectation be that there would be an increase in the fare box? Well, Since this seems to be on the uh, kind of on-demand service. Uh, are you talking about, about the fare itself or the fare box? Because the fare box is the, is the mechanism that accepts the fare, validate that it is the right fare. In terms of the actual fare, how much you pay, there is no change in that. Oh, okay. Exactly. And because increased relationship has some kind of positive correlation between uh, your fair revenue. So the actual fare will not change for this kind of service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. On we go. Appreciate that. Um, Ellie, are you an Aquarius by any chance? A Say are you an Aquarius? No, I am. Oh. Aquarius. Your astrological sign. <laughs> Are you an Aquarius? Oh, I had no idea what you were asking me. I'm a Sagittarius. Oh, okay. Why? I thought we had something going on there because we tend to. Oh. Yeah, I thought you might have been my Aquarius oh, thank sister. You. <laughs> um, Kwaku is too. You're a Aquarius? No, he's, he's oh, on Sagittarius. That same, okay. He's okay. On I that. know me and Gavin are. Yeah. Um, oh, you are? Okay. Welcome to the club. That number. <laughs> um, just keeping it light, you know. Um, but in all seriousness, though, I think this is um, exactly what we need. Um, I am so pleased that you uh, introduced uh, th this microtransit pilot program. I think t to some of the concerns of uh, the colleagues are very valid because this is one of the more conservative approaches to microtransit, uh, understanding that, one, we are utilizing one vehicle on a case-by-case -case pickup when you go to cities like Pittsburgh, you just, yeah, or, yeah, or where you're in um, places uh, like, oh, oh, uh, Lexington does it too. They have individual vehicles to the point that you were making where it is more just like you type it in and a car will come pick you up at your front door and drop you at the line. And so I think this is the best approach to go to. We aren't going out and buying a fleet of 25 
uh, vehicles, we are trying to see if the interest is there. And if it is, um, then move forward with maybe a, a, a real investment um, down the road of some smaller vehicles um, that can assist in uh, the additional pickups. T uh, two last points. To the point that my colleague, um, Alderman Arnett made, there are um, also these autonomous vehicles now that are starting to take over um, several cities. I actually just reached out to um, Domino's Pizza's uh, government affairs organization because I keep seeing these commercials where they have, you know, like that little uh, autonomous vehicle that drops off the pizza. And I'm like, it's a drill. well, why doesn't Annapolis have that? So I reached out to him and he, he was saying, well, you don't have the... Um, uh, the uh, it's not legal basically to uh, you know have these vehicles tested in your streets. So even putting in legislation like that, which I plan on doing, to assist uh, businesses in, in trials of you know this just amazing technology that is helping uh, with transit in many many ways. And so I'm so happy that you introduced this. And then my last question is, I did believe I, I, I read somewhere that there would be a voucher provided for no 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 that was that not for this um not for this that gets into um the operation of it where we got to they can be at a later date okay it can be at a later date we've got to implement it first and you know the hundred thousand dollars is sort of an allowance and okay what can we buy for that yeah. if we have money left over from the software um i'm kind of going off tangent now but to get into your Aries thing, we can, we can like, you know, we could put in cool bus stops mm -hmm. kind of places and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the voucher system is definitely a goal. That was my initial goal, to, mm -hmm. to get a voucher system to get people to ride the buses. But this might just be the first step. Awesome. I, um, I'm excited about this. Thank you. And we might add water vehicles to it. <laughs> Alderman Savage, uh, next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm just not. I support the uh, the uh, idea of going towards microtransit, <laughs> but I'm just not sure this is the right way to do it. Um, you know, we don't have a director, a full time director here. This seems like something we should really be doing with a new director, a full time. Uh, I'm sorry, instead, not just an acting director. Um, and it, you know, I just I can't help but to feel this is not the, the most responsible way to 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 uh, legislate uh, programs. You know, we we've done this earlier in the meeting with various things, uh, including the survey or um, uh, you know money to go towards the task force. But I think that's a little different because that money is going towards either a specific body or towards going out to uh, ultimately to a consultant who uh, in terms of like the permitting review that's going to be going out to a consultant but this money apparently is just going to the city itself but we don't know we don't have any kind of estimate on how much to Alderman Payone's point like how much is it going to cost I mean we have in here developing software for a phone app that that could be an expensive venture I imagine uh, but do we even have an estimate on how much that's going to cost? Um, where in the city this this pilot program is going to be done? Is it going to be the whole city? Um, I mean, we're talking about developing software and a phone app, and I mean, it just seems like this is a very irresponsible way to do this kind of program initiative. I, I, I just, I mean, I mean, we asked the acting director, and he didn't even have good answers on this hundred thousand dollars because I'm guessing it came from the council woman. This is not a good way to be doing business um, on, on on this council. I just I, I can't. May I, I like the idea, but it just doesn't seem like a good way to. Let me respond to your question of the fact that we do not have a director. Uh, this recommendation was developed when Regordian was here. Yeah. The idea was to get this done uh, about a year ago, and then the pandemic came in. Uh, the concept is not what we are developing, and therefore, when we do have a new director with a different direction, uh, the person will say, oh, no, we are going this way. It's one of the short-term recommendations in our transit development plan, which this council actually approved. So it is at the implementation stage. And if you go back to look at when we did implement something from our transit development plan when we didn't have a director. 
go back to 2010, when we did restructure the whole uh, transit system from the pole system to the current interior system. Uh, that time we didn't have a director. Uh, I was still acting, uh, but we were able to work and make it happen. So we are at the implementation stage. In terms of costing, uh, we have talked to several technology companies, including the company that actually made our current electronic fare bus system that they can easily integrate uh, with that. In addition, we are also looking at other transit systems that have similar technology and see if we can pick it back on their contract, that will make it even much more cheaper. Uh, you are talking about not developing a plan in terms of which specific areas. We do have identified areas uh, that we would like to serve. So as the plan gets fully uh, 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 completed, you will, we will do a presentation, we will do kind of marketing to determine or to let people know that, oh, this service is for this areas in this city, but not for the city wide. So uh, perhaps you are not aware of the background work that we, we have done, but we have done all these things. Well, I mean, I just feel like we, we should have that information. I mean, all we have is our, our two sentences here. Um, in this amendment, um, I mean, who's been spoken to, what kind of estimates, what parts of the city is this going to be, be done with, what kind of equipment? It's just so many things that are just not answered in, in here. And I feel like, you know, because when other departments bring forward proposals, I mean, this is coming separate from the budget, right? I mean, if we have, uh, in terms of separate from the, this is not being pushed by the department, it's being pushed by the council. Um, you know, I'm thinking when we go to, to implement certain programs, we usually have a lot more information. I just, I'll end, I'll end it there, but I'm not comfortable with this. So, Alderman Pindell Charles, then Alderman Shandlemeyer, then Alderman Gay. So Thank you, Mr. Hands. Mayor. I'm going to start my comments by saying, first of all, I love everyone in this room and I enjoy working with everyone. And we are Thank all you. very oh, no. Oh, professional. No. What's coming next? But I take issue in saying that Dr. Duwa, who has been here for many years and has run the transportation department as acting many times and has done an exceptional job to say, and look at this legislation and say we have no full-time director, in my mind, is disrespectful. Now, maybe the person who said it didn't mean it that way, but I take issue with that. He's done a fabulous job filling in, being there. I stopped past there. It's in my ward. I see him doing many jobs. He has a doctorate degree. I, 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 let me finish. I'm not attacking him. I've worked with yeah. it for the past 12, 15 years. I'm just let saying we finish. don't have a, we don't have a I love you all. <laughs> but I had to say it. Otherwise, I was going to fall off this chair. <laughs> and I take your apology. Thank you, Alderman Savage. I love you, too. <laughs> Always. Anyway. Um, I would assume, uh, Dr. Duwa, that based on um, if we put our all into this, this pilot project and um, we do the best that we can, which I know we will, that there at the end, if we have really good and successful results, that there's a possibility that we could eventually get a grant for um, carrying this even further and expanding the program within the city. Is that true? Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Shanema. Uh Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Alderman Savage, to try and um, sway your fears uh, slightly, and I, I hope this does so, what we are trying something new, which is scary and has potential for, um, you know, to not work. And we all are trying to be good stewards of the city's finances. But if we don't try something new, we can't evolve. Um, 
A book that I've read and I recommend to all my council colleagues is uh, Strong Towns. And one of the things that they recommend is, as I said earlier, taking little bets. And the perfect metaphor that they used is, uh, we are in a room with our eyes closed, and if we take a small step forward, we learn a little bit of information. Now maybe that small step forward has us bump into a wall. Well, we learn there's a wall there and we can't take a step forward that way, but it's a very light bump. Uh, so I would say this is a small step forward and if we end up bumping that wall, it will be a very minor, um, a very minor lesson learned. I think this is a small value and it wouldn't be as the other metaphor they gave, taking that giant leap, where if we took that giant leap and hit the wall, it would be a very bad learning experience. It wouldn't be a little bump, it'd be an actual slamming. So uh, did, did that metaphor make sense? You could, you, you can know, or smile or not, that's, that's all good. So that's, I just think this is one of those little small bets, small risks, uh, small step forward in the dark that is worth us trying to explore with. Um, another thing I would like to uh, respond to, and this is just a general interesting thing uh, and how people respond to a lot of projects. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Alderman Finlayson, said, well, how will we pay for this? Which is a very reasonable question. But I think something that we should start shifting our focus into is we always ask this question for public transit and we very rarely ask this question for uh, auto oriented transit like individual private drivers, which we subsidize very generously at all levels mm -hmm. of government. Um, so I think if we get away from asking uh, how do we pay for these public transit projects and start getting away from uh, getting into a mindset where we go, how do we can continue to keep paying for subsidizing driving and individual car owners? We can make our city a little more resilient. Um, it's just an interesting shift of perspective. Thank you. Is this the part where I say I love you all? Okay. Sure. This, uh, <laughs> this, this uh, comment with regard to whether it's successful or not. Um, Eventually, what I see is we can, in terms of the software application, integrate it with our ADA paratransit, so that when you call for ADA, it will take you to a different menu, and then you, your schedule is, your trip is booked. So even in the worst case scenario, which I do not expect that, prior there was there's much less demand that we hoped for, we can still have a useful, uh, we can still use the application for the ADA service. And I do expect the ADA service to grow over time, given the aging of the population and cost of owning vehicles and stuff like that. So there is another plan. If it works successful, we integrate it. If not, we can move the software application to the ADA, which will make it much easier for special people, elderly people, who have familiar with their phone, can use it instead of calling and staying on the phone for a long time. Just to throw it out there. It's not a dead end street as we may see it, but we have made a provision for the worst case scenario where we can reapply the technology to our ADA service. Thank you. Onman Guy was next. Just find, um where I was, I apologize. Awesome, thank you. This is from April of 2019. This was even before I got elected, so you had it way before me. Implement new microtransit service. Smartphone technology is transforming how people access public transit. Building upon the privately operated transportation network company, service delivery model, public transit providers across the nation are incorporating an on-demand dynamic routing and scheduling e-hailing component known as microtransit into their operational practice. The primary objectives are to serve as a first and last mile connection between low density, low demand areas and transit facilities slash activity centers, improve system-wide efficiency and productivity, leverage technology to connect customers with on-demand services. Um, and so this is a part of the uh, transit development plan um, and so I'm not sure why everybody's acting like they've never, we didn't discuss this. Uh, this was given in April of 2019. Then I got elected in July of 2019 and we had another presentation in October of 2019. And so, um, it, it, this is nothing new. The, they've clearly done the research. This is also, um, uh, been done by, uh, who is the, uh, 
the KF Age Group, they're the one that put together um, uh, this in partnership with the Maryland Department of Transportation. I would encourage my colleagues to look at it. It's in our emails. You can go find it. It has the information. It even has a, um, a fiscal uh, breakdown of uh, how they uh, plan to uh, fund these programs. Um, and so please look at it. Um, it's there. That's one of the things that people always say. We spend money on these task force and these large groups to get together. They make excellent recommendations and they sit on the shelf. And so I really look forward to uh, working with um, the older woman and the director uh, on, on making this a reality and no longer a dream in the city of Annapolis. Alderman Tierney, then yeah. Alderman Savage. I just I want to address Alderman Savage's concerns. Um, first off, this is an opportunity because it's budget review and it's very, you know, we very rarely have the opportunity, was it once a year, to have input into, you know, ha introduce policy that's important to us or an idea that's policy. And, and the money. Um, what I didn't mention is because of that report, um, Director Gordon then in turn wrote his report and, and, and reiterated the same thing. So I didn't give enough credit to, to, to Director Gordon for giving, giving us, you know, having this on his to-do to -do list. But the, the other way I looked at this is the, the cost, if you will, of not doing it. And the cost of not doing it is that you have people that are not able to get to work or go downtown or go to the mall because they don't have a car. We have congested um, streets and this is this would alleviate that. Um, the other um, we also have as as um, as you said, we, we have existing inventory that we're not optimizing. We have a paratransit service um, that you know does its thing and then you know goes back to the to to Chicopen or wherever it's you know stationed or the other buses that do their thing and they go back to you know um, to the depot. So so this will this will optimize our existing inventory and and that's and that's getting a value out of something. Um, so that that's that's the way I, I looked at it is what what is the cost of not doing anything and and we are where we are so I I think it's it's a really um, good it's thought out um, it's just you know how much the question was how much money could we ask for so that's where we are. Alderman Payon was next. Um, I find it ironic that everybody can't wait to vote for this thing yet we have almost no information on it, the very same reason why I wasn't allowed to proceed on a matter this morning. Um, having said that, uh, I wish it weren't $100,000. I wish it were a good deal less than that. Uh, I, for one, think that uh, if we continue to do the same things in the same ways, we're going to continue to make the same mistakes. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to uh, stick my neck out a little bit here and go along with this. I think that uh, actually, if I hear the same thing repeated one more time, uh, forgive me, Mr. Mayor, but I might jump up and scream. I think it's time to vote on this thing. Um, Alderman Savage had his hand up for a. So, I mean, with all due respect, Alderman, I mean, you say it's well thought out, but again, all we have are two sentences here. Um, where are the details about how this program is going to be run and 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 how much what where the cost estimates are i mean i i want to go in this direction don't get me wrong like i want to move towards microtransit, but i don't even know what we're taking a risk on this is so open-ended i just don't know um we need to have, get more details somewhere some accompanying report proposal anything i mean um and I mean, to, to Alderwoman's point, um, Dr. Dua, he's acting director, incredibly capable and qualified, but he's still acting, which means he's doing two jobs. That's not a full-time director to me. That's somebody doing two jobs. Um, and so what I was referring to is having somebody who's actually in the, in the director position, dedicating 100% of their work, their time to that. Um, but. I'm just I'm just not comfortable, but apparently most people are. <laughs> um, yes, I, I am wanting to support this. I'm still concerned about the dollar amount. 
Uh, Alderman Gay pointed out that there's a report that has a budget in it, um, but that budget wasn't given to us. Um, as the Alderman just said, uh, we have two sentences. So um, it's unfortunate that we didn't get more details about this if the budget is in a report that we already have. Um, I, I'm still having trouble figuring out 100000 to create an app and, and a software, maybe the software, I don't know. But surely we can get more information than what's presented on this piece of paper. So I, you know, I don't know what to say. I'm done. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I, I, you know, I'll be voting for this. Uh, you know, on-demand uh, microtransit is the future. You know, we've just conditioned people in the city through COVID to walk a block or two or three. So that is microtransit as well. Obviously, trails and paths that get us to the main lines of transportation. And also, we have uh, an administration now that is going to be putting money into infrastructure. And we have a uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg in charge of that exact thing. So I think if we have a plan, um, we'll be in a lot better place than other places who don't have plans. So this is a start. I know it's not, a, not, not obviously a final product or anything like that. So I'll be supporting it. So all those um, in favor of amendment number 17 say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Thank you. Amendment 17 passes. Amendment 18 has been withdrawn by Otto Maturney, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. That was a roll call, yeah. What number is that, Alderman Shanamai? It was on 60. Yes. Um, the, the, the more I'm thinking on it, the less comfortable I'm feeling just kind of leaving it to, leaving a $20,000 gap in one of our departments. Um, what? I actually voted in favor of it, and I've, I've just been kind of tinkering and thinking on it now, and um, I would like to change my vote on that matter. I think we have to reconsider it. So what's the process? Second. Okay. Motion to reconsider. Uh, amendment 16. It's a motion to reconsider. Yes, sir. Second. Okay. Okay. Um, motion to reconsider, we'll just vote on it. Yeah. If, I, I have no more to add beyond what I just said. I've kind of had some time to think and tinker over my mind. Um, as much as I really want to get this position for planning and zoning, um, as we currently have it sit, we put a pretty substantial gut to um, our public works department with that. And I just, I, I don't feel comfortable with it. And if possible, I'd like to do one more round of voting on it. For so we have a motion and a, mo and a second for that? It will not? No. Okay. Because well. um, we voted yes, and you're going to change the vote to no? Yeah. So um, it will be four, four, and all the women, all the women, uh, no, I mean, all the women, Lason, um, abstain, so the vote will be defeated. Unless somebody else changes. That is. I reconsider my. Yes. She, um, you abstain. Don't, don't, don't. Here's the only. Um, there's, there's currently a motion in a second on the floor. To reconsider. Okay. All those in favor of a motion to reconsider. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I know. I need to know what. What are we voting on now? To reconsider amendment number. You're voting to bring amendment six back on to amendment sixteen back onto the floor okay. for another vote for a new vote. So, okay, it's so it's a motion be. to reconsider. It has a first and a second to bring Amendment 16 back onto the floor. All those in favor of doing that say aye. 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 
Oh, All those opposed say no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like it, it carried. Okay. It, right. Okay. Amendment 16 is on the floor. We're in the same position we were last time. I don't Finlayson. I don't Pendel Charles. You you're ready? Thank you. <laughs> now, now you need a we've motion. been the chatty cat. Yeah, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna own we've been the chatty cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we'll do a roll call. First you need a motion. Huh? You need a motion now. Can I get a motion on, on to move amendment sixteen? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Can I get a second? Uh second. Okay, all those in favor of of what? Of motion 16, the 20,000. Okay. Yeah, right. If okay. Mayor Buckley? Uh yes. Okay. Alderman Pinnell Charles? Yes. Alderman Philason? Aye. <laughs> Alderman Shadow. No. Alderman Gay? Yes. Alderman Savage? No. Alderman Arnett? No. Alderman Tierney? When are we voting on? Um, <laughs> your 20,000. Your <laughs> it's motion, motion 16, the 20,000. Amendment 16, reconsider date. No. no. We voted no. on that. We're voting on the actual yes. amendment. Yes. 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 Five. And Alderman Payone? No. So it stay <laughs> five to four, and it carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, what's what's the verdict, Mr. Mayor? It, the motion so, carries. So we've got one said, more. Eighteen has no, skipped. Yes, um, Nineteen now. We can take a break after nineteen. That's it. That's you guys want to do a coffee or or a quick ten minutes or not? Mr. Mayor, that's the last amendment. On the, oh, That's a good point. Let's let's go. Okay, well, okay. You know what? We're going to hold on. We're going to go through. We're on nineteen now. Everybody ready? Can I? Someone please move uh, amendment number nineteen. Can I get a second? You can do them however you want to do them. Thank you. Could be part of your motion. Alderman Finlayson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is to move. Well, first of all, you, you all recall last year we created uh, a full-time uh, social work position, uh, and we all have recognized how just inundated she has become with the task. And so this gives her. Uh, the mayor put was gracious enough to put in his uh, budget a part-time position administrative assistant, and this amendment creates a full-time position. Thank you. Um, Alderman Pindell Charles? Yes, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor, please. Okay. I think Alderman Savage had also requested to be a co-sponsor, and Gay's already on it. Okay. And Arnett? Sorry. Uh, Alderman Arnett? Um, Ms. Dickinson, could you respond to how we're paying for this? I had originally thought I was getting it from police, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary to take it from police. When they hired the social worker, we had a certain amount in our budget for that position. Uh, the person was brought on at an amount that was less than that. Mm -hmm. So there was enough additional funding left over from that decision to make this part-time full-time. As long as it's contractual, there's no pension benefits. I'm sorry, as long as what? It's contractual. See, it's a, it's, it's moving, it's a making it full time contractual, which means there's no pension added to it, which is why we can afford mm -hmm. to do it within the funding that we had for the social worker position. So it will come back next year for a civil service position. It, it would and be considered depending on you know the, the you know the, I'm sorry if it meets the criteria for a position that needs to be considered civil service yes it would come back but you're referring to next year not right now correct okay. there's a certain number of years we review them on to see if it's going to be a continuing position that kind of thing 
Okay. And that's why we have this to prove that we need mm -hmm. it full time. Oh, I'm not sharing the meeting. I can't call on you. <laughs> um, I will. So go ahead and ask a, a quick clarification question, and I apologize if you covered this and um, I, I missed it because it was I was also being a chatty Kathy. Um, in in the uh, budget amendment, it says uh, strike 905-500 and substitute 905-500. Is that an error, or I, I, I'm just not understanding where the, the... That's a question for me, I think. Because there's, we don't need any additional funding, but we are doing an amendment to that line item because we're making a part-time person full-time. We have to recognize in this amendment what line item it affects. Oh, we don't okay. need any extra funding, so we strike that number and replace it with the exact same number, and then in the verbiage down below, we explain what it's doing. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, Mr. Mayor, may I also add, there is a um, wonderful document I think Ms. Farrell provided us this morning with um, the uh, services that's provided by our community service um, department and i.e. our social worker. Thank you. Alderman Pendel Charles was next. Yes, I just want to reiterate what Alderman Finlayson said. This is an excellent document and you can see that our uh, community services team has been working extremely hard, and we know that these numbers will grow. And we had a great article back in February in the Capitol concerning um, uh, what Ms. Lee and her team and Ms. Farrell and as the assistant city manager are doing on behalf of our residents. So just, we're grateful. Thank you, I'm gonna play on. Thank you. Could I ask when this amendment was filed? Okay, I don't, I'm just asking. Okay. <laughs> All right. I believe you. Say no more. Uh, Alderman Turner. I'm, when, yeah. I, I, I'm still not understanding how something can be a part-time job converted to a full-time job and not cost any more money. Are there? Is it being held down by two people right now or something? I, I don't get it. No. When we originally had an amount in our budget, we, set, we start this budget process in January, and we developed a list of positions that we were going to fund for FY22. And on that list that we used to build the budget, we had not yet filled in the, um, the name that had taken the position of social worker. When we have vacant positions, we slot that, um, that cost at the middle of the range, at the middle of the pay range, to be conservative because sometimes people are hired at a lower step, some some are hired at a higher step. So we, the amount that we had on that listing was middle range. This person started at the lower end of the range. There was the difference. There was a savings there, and that savings was enough to pay for the administrative position that we're considering here moving it from a part-time to a full-time. Okay. Thank you. Any other okay. questions? Okay, Alderman Turney. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, can I get clarification on who all wants to be co-sponsored, please? Put your hand up if you're a co-sponsor. Well, I'm sure I'm on there, am I? No, no. <laughs> Who doesn't want a sponsor? Put their hand up. Put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Buckley. <Yeah. laughs> Is this civil service or will it be? No, no not sir. yet. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So I, just to clarify, I have Finlayson, Alderman Gay, Pendel Charles, Arnett, Shannon Meyer, and Tierney. Anyone else? Buckley? Thank you all. No, you had it. Done. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of amendment number 19 say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. Thank you. That is the end of the amendments is that, passed, that were presented. Is that passed, Mr. Mayor? Is that, that passed? Do we, do, do, we, do we want did, did you say it passed? It passed, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. All right. <laughs>
Then bit number 19 passes. Okay, that's the end of the May 17th introduced amendments. Next step. Any other amendments? So I need, do I have to suspend the rules to introduce my amendments? Or I don't believe, is that, that's a question for the city attorney? Is that stated what was your in the question city again? code somewhere? I have to submit, I mean, I have to um, ask to suspend the rules to submit my amendments? Yes. Yes. What? Because the, the council voted on a, its own rule to put a deadline for amendments, and that deadline is passed. So the amendments okay. that were considered. That's fine, today. I just didn't know okay. uh, why well, I had to. Could I ask about that, though? Because uh, the, the, the uh, adopted rules were just in a resolution. So they're not actually in the code. So would that still need a, because I'm just want, to suspend the rules, we need an actual rule. And I'm not sure that has well, the weight of that. Resolution action. is a rule. You resolved to have a deadline. That deadline for amendments, many of you submitted amendments by the deadline. That deadline is passed. The reason that you submitted that rule, that resolution, you resolved giving a sense of the council, which staff acted upon, which was to give staff enough time to consider all the changes and do the calculations and come back with sufficient time to make all the changes that would be considered by the amendment. So um, it's my interpretation that your resolution is your rule that you passed on yourselves and many of you complied with that rule. Okay. So should I make it now or after? I think you should make it now. Yeah. Can I get a second? We need a second to get to discussion. I will go ahead and uh, second it to get to discussion. Okay. I shall second. <laughs> Alderman Shadowman? Yeah. How many amendments are we talking? Listen. I'm about, I'm about to go through. I'm removing the UBI amendment because everybody's obviously so worried about that. So I will take away the universal basic income amendment for a later date. The uh, other amendments, I think there are how many, Katie? 16? I believe there's 15. 15. One second, I'll double count. So... With all, with all due respect, um, that is a lot of amendments put forward. Okay, so let me ask this question since they want to play this game, and I'm going to play it with you for the remainder of the year too. Um, outside of this, I would have to then just introduce everything independently at the end of the year, um, just looking at how much uh, financing the city has available. Is that how this... Director Dickinson, are there other options if this doesn't get the votes to suspend the rules? Are you talking about before the final budget is struck? Or after, whenever, just how would I then later so, on? It, it is my understanding that after this process today of considering amendments, we come back with our balancing amendment and then that is advertised as amended and we vote on the final version of the bill next Monday on the 14th. That is the final process of setting the budget for next year and um, setting the tax rate. Then after that, new initiatives can be proposed in other forms of legislation. Um, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the uh, City attorney, to say, I mean, if you if you want to change the budget during the year, you have to come forward with legislation to do that, in whatever form. Okay. It, it would be, I think, in an ordinance form. And so I'll work uh, and, with you and the staff to put every single amendment I have, all sixteen of them, in uh, ordinance form. If we could do that. So uh, I would refer to the the city attorney for that. That's. 
So I'll hand over the amendments to you. You have the information you need. I like it in the amendments. So we don't we don't draft legislation. The only I'll hand it over to the city manager. Yes, the only piece of legislation that the Office of Finance handles during the year is the budget ordinance and the resolutions that are related to that. Other than that, the Office of Law handles any other proposed legislation. And this deadline that the um, city manager recommended is not. I'm sorry, that the city attorney, I believe he requested that. No, sir. Um, that's not city council resolved to have it. No, deadline. no, no, not this deadline. I'm saying the other one for it. you don't want. Um, you said you didn't want ordinances in after a certain period of time just because it'd be a little difficult. No, we was the the council. Uh, is on recess in August, and we were advising those that asked when would something be able to get passed before November election, and we were giving our estimate that if something came in, you've got 90 days to pass it. Okay. That's assuming it didn't have to go to certain committees, planning commission, and then sit out, then a public hearing, then come back. Yeah. It, it's likely, unless you suspend the rules and pass something on second and third reader in one meeting it's unlikely that you'd be able to get anything passed in the normal course between any time after the end of july and november so i'll work with you then to introduce it um a, because it can be uh, handed over to a new council correct so if i was to put in legislation and get reelected, i could still continue to work on that outside of the um the 90-day rule if the council approves, yeah, sure. Awesome. All right. Well, that's fine with me. I'll, I'll I don't. <laughs> I will work on it in a um, in an ordinance form for a, a new council. Regina. Yeah. Okay, um, Alderman Gay. I just wanted to say that any legislation that you introduce, if you get reelected and it's already been introduced to the council, it dies because we have signing die legislation. So you would have to reintroduce it after you win the election. All right, so I'll wait till after the elections to then introduce it. We do have a motion and a second to suspend the rules, but we're in uh, discussion. I just wanted to clarify what I could or could not do. And so, I, I, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I'll so get this voted on. All those in favor of suspending the rules say aye. All those against, say no. 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 Right. Thank you. You abstaining or are you voting? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I was a yes, my bad. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I think we should yes, we'll vote on substantive review. Well, what else is yes, there other there. than. So is there a motion to vote on whether the amendments of 20 10 21 are substantive? I thought we've already voted on. We we will have this a balancing a amendment. Vote whether it's substantive, just this procedure. No. Oh. no, thank you. Do we go on to this now? Should we take it? I, I'm just looking for clarification. I thought that the amendments um, were going. You were going to say they were substantive. And then we're going to have a public hearing on them in the next meeting. And then you were going to vote. I mean, Jody was going to create the budget, whatever, to make it correct. And we were having a public hearing on Monday and voting on the final but, budget. But what if the council said they're not substantive? Huh? What if the council said they're not substantive, which is what well, they're voting? We can just finish the vote on the, the bill. I think that's what they just did. Yeah. Yeah, but I still have a balancing amendment to bring yeah, so you at some time that, that needs hours, right? to finish so, yeah. this process and yeah. adjust all the subtotals and grand totals so that they're I'm just going to vote reflective. this through. So uh, is there a motion to adopt 0-10-21 as amended on second reader? So moved. Second. <clears throat> second. Huh? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, point of information, those, please yes. explain. <laughs> Are we voting on all of the amendments that we just approved out of the list of one through 19? We are, right. okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, voting so on the budget. clear. As amended on second reader. Mm -hmm. Are we voting on the budget right now? No, it says 01021, annual budget and appropriation property tax levy. Yeah. As, amended. As, amended. As amended. So we're voting on the budget. 
You're, on second reader. We're in the middle reader. of a vote, Mr. Mayor. We're in the middle of a vote. We haven't got to the third reader yet, so we're on second reader as amended. Right, Regina? Yes. yes. Okay. Got a first and a second. Let's try, let's try that vote again. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. Actually, no. No. Two no's. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt 0-10-21 on third reader? So uh, what I'm holding is I still need to bring you the balancing amendment before you pass this on third reader. Am I correct? Okay. So we, Stop. at some point in time, either, I don't know, you are going. You wanted to take a break. Uh, Katie and I will at least need an hour, maybe longer, um, to come to you with a balancing amendment tonight. Well, do, so, we, do we need to do the uh, resolutions too? Yes, and you still have t three resolutions to vote on. So I don't know what order you want to do all this in. We will need one to two hours to, to figure out the balancing amendment and double check it. All right. Well, I think we'll take an hour break, yeah? And then we can we can get the resolutions done when we come back after the budget vote as well. Do so if it, huh? do, do those first and then do the Okay, when we come back. Okay. So we can come back in one hour. We'll start with the, um, we won't vote on the budget. We'll, we'll start with the amendments and then we'll um, vote on those. Motion, sir. Point of information well, I'm again. So, Mr. Mayor, did I just hear Jody say she needed to one to two hours? So are we giving her sufficient time to do what she needs to do? So we still have amendments to vote on when we come back. So I thought But I'll have to be here. I'll have to be here when you come back. So we may have to take another break if we're not done. Resolution, sorry. So the only amendment that's going to be voted on is a technical amendment that balances the budget. So we've got to do you can do the resolutions first. Yeah. Then do your balancing amendment. That's budget on third reader. So that's why. That's amendment. Yeah. So let's say we're still going to come back in one hour. Uh, we can have a cut. If, you, if you're not ready, you're not ready. We can move I, on the resolutions, everybody. I have a question. Yeah. Before we, now we just voted on second reader on 01021. Okay. As amended. As amended. When we come back, we're going to vote on resolution 1221, yep. 1321, yes. 1421, and then the third reader for for the budget. If, Is that correct? If they're ready. Yeah. Second reader. No. no, no, no second reader. No, no, Hang on. No. Let's no. get it from Regina here. Okay. Budget. Jody needs to create an amended amendment to balance the budget. Okay. So that's an amendment that the council has adopted. Then we're going to adopt the budget on second reader as amended and adopt it on third reader with a roll call and then the budget will be adopted. I thought we just I voted know, it was 70. Out of order. We need to consider her yeah. amendment too because it pulls the whole thing together. So, so the resolutions have... pull everything together? No, no, no. I'm not even talking about the resolutions. Okay. I'm talking about the ordinance, 010. Okay, so. She's going to create an amendment. Right. Bring it back. You guys are going to adopt it to make it the final budget. Right? We're going to adopt the budget as amended on second reader, including the amendments you've So what on. we just voted is no. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't worry okay. about that. All right. We're going to okay. adopt the budget with Jody's amendment. Then we're going to adopt it on third reader and do a roll call, and 010 will be complete. And balanced. Okay. And then, I think what, what she was asking is, can we do the resolutions first? Right. Absolutely. Right. So if something, so we can do those if something now. went unusual on one of those resolutions, uh, in one hour. it may yeah. impact budget. Right. So, do we can we come back and do the resolutions yeah, first? They should be yeah. asked. Then, yeah, then consider the amendment. If I'm ready, if I'm not, I will ask for more time. Okay. Okay. And, and just to be positive, there's still daylight outside. That hasn't <laughs> happened. <laughs> right, Katie, Old Katie has already been drafting it, so we may be in pretty good shape. So, <laughs> hopefully, uh, but we have to double and triple check everything just to make Old sure. Old Finlayson. Would it make sense to try to do the resolutions? Before we take the break? Yeah, it's up to you. It's up to you. Well, I think we're going to come back and see how far they progressed in one hour. So we can kill some time with that. Huh? I don't care. Yeah. So this, this, that, we're going to. Yeah, she wants, she wants to make sure they don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's just take a break. Okay. <laughs> we'll just take a quick break. Thank you. See you back in one hour at 5.30.
Welcome back. Okay, Mr. City Attorney, please present the next item on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is R1221, Position Classifications and Pay Plan. Um, is there a motion to adopt R-12-21 on second reader? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. second. Is there a discussion? Um, I don't even know where we are. What's the resolution? R-12. <clears throat> You know what would be helpful in the future? Just really quickly. They, we, when we print this out, if you see the attachments underneath, first reader, CBS minute sign, we should have all of that. The staff report, fiscal note, that would be helpful. It's and the physical Granicus. copy. I, 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 did, I know it's on Granicus, but I'm saying it'd be helpful if it's in the physical copy. Oh. It's Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Outside. Mayor. So the. <laughs> Classification system, this is two parts, classification system and the uh, pay schedule. <clears throat> we have several items here in the classification system, the social worker, care coordinator, fire protection engineer, forensic services, unit supervisor, crime scene investigator, senior emergency management planner, and exercise training and community outreach um, <clears throat> these, I believe, are changes in classifications. For example, the, uh, the uh, fire protection engineer is moving from contract to a uh, civil service position, if I'm correct, city manager, or? That's correct. Right. So we've, we've taken that position description through the civil service board, and um, the intention is to use funding from one of the firefighters to to pay that that salary so on that one specifically uh, <clears throat> I have some questions and concerns which is why now since this has been successfully done for a number of years I, uh, Chief Ramali gave us an explanation on that but um, when I look at the number of cases that are actually heard by um, both the safety engineer and the five um, <clears throat> fire marshals. I think there's was it was reported 540 cases for the whole year. Um, it, it does seem like there is a, a fairly light burden. I almost could be more comfortable with the fire safety engineer being somebody who is a supervisor, but I would like to see the fire marshals go to contract. Uh, we have people that are, uh, as fire marshals, that are drawing pensions, uh, which is expensive to us. And so I would really like to have some discussion about that whole juxtaposition. Uh, I think there are a number of, of uh, retired <laughs> fighter fighters who could be very easily contracted to be um, uh, part of the fire marshal service and dividing five into uh, five, 540, I mean, that's 120 throughout the whole year. It seems like that's a very excessive force to be allocated to that. So um, looking at that is something that I would really like to engage in a little bit of discussion about. Uh, <clears throat> the senior emergency management planner, I think there's two of those. We've had Director Simmons here to make his case about why it is hard to retain staff when they're um, contract staff as opposed to civil service. And we certainly have had a number of people that the city has trained and made into really good um, emergency management people and so in terms of thinking about recruitment and I see uh, director uh, um, 
Hopkins coming up to the fore here, I think these are, are things to talk about. We do need to think about recruit and retention in emergency management, um, but in the social service care coordinator we already talked about in amendments, and uh, that's something that we really want to espouse in terms of changing the way we're thinking about policing globally in the city of Annapolis. But um, these are a number of conversions to civil service that come with them uh, some expenses in terms of pension costs and those sorts of things. And while Alderman Savage withdrew his amendment, um, I do want to re-raise the question, is this something that we want to do as we're trying to recover from COVID and move into uh, the next set of negotiations. The more people we make civil service, and I agree with the work that all the women Finlayson and I did years ago about converting people to civil service, but being civil service means that it is much harder, harder to eliminate these positions. So. Um, I'm, I'm calling to the council some attention to this and um, some discussion and consideration of whether uh, these are things that we want to do in this particular budget. And, and Alderman Annette, would you like to speak to anyone particularly on? What? Well, I, I saw uh, Tricia Trish. coming up and I think... Uh, sure, please, please come forward, Tricia. Yeah. <clears throat> So you, that was a lot of parts. Yes, it was. <laughs> so, you know me. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether you want me to go through. Well, let, let's just go, go through them one by one. I okay. mean, the social worker care coordinator. To me, that is a part of a rethinking of the council in general about how we police uh, and think about policing and think about the underlying causes that go beneath. <laughs> Um, crime incidences, and we want to address that. So I am uh, certainly one of the people that was an instigator of getting this going. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that, but I do think we need to discuss it. Yeah. Well, we certainly have hired that position at the employment agreement level right now, and that, so this is a desire to give that greater stability and, and demonstrate a commitment to that function and to that, um, um, well, what it will eventually become a division. Uh, and so we talked earlier, or you talked earlier, about taking the part-time contractual position to full-time. That position would be uh, done at an employment agreement level. Um, that's strictly backing up the expectation and the um, the belief that the city needs to engage in that level of service to constituents, and that's a, a great investment for the city. Um, you want me to move on to fire protection well, engineer, just, or do you want to stay there? I want to invite comments from other colleagues, particularly Alderwoman Finlayson. Um, gunfire and crime don't happen in the absence of causes and underlying causes. And if we don't address those, if we just arrest people and throw them into jail, give them a record, we're not doing anything to change the situation. In fact, I think we're making it worse. Well, so, I think there's been a recognition that the police department has had to take on responsibilities that are sociological in nature, not really, um, you know, totally focused on their their mission as a result. Um, right. It or, or a partner organization in the city. Well, and, and not everything. In fact, I was watching CBS uh, Morning, and they had the whole thing was devoted to policing and all the thinkings that all the things that are going on. And we really do ask police officers to do an inordinate amount of things yeah. that are well beyond their capability or any reasonable expectation. Well, it's what can be handled in the instant, and so this is more of a grassroots commitment to um, coordinate care. And, uh, Sorry. And uh, I don't know whether that 
the purpose or the mission or anything is what you're after, Alderman Arnett, here in this discussion, or whether you're talking more about um, this being a civil service position, or where, where are you going with that? Well, I want to talk about all of it generically. To this one, I hope I've clearly indicated I'm viewing favorably. Um, and I think that not only that, but we think we need more there. Mm. And as you mentioned, we're alluding to creating a whole office that will backfill and um, support our policing activities, but more importantly, support our community, yeah. support people. In, yeah, and this is need. a commitment to that by showing that you're right. going to put the position in the civil service. So, so for me, unless other colleagues have comments, uh, and I see some that do. <laughs> Are you finished? No. Well, on that one, yes, but I welcome input from my uh, colleague. We'll go to Alderman Gay because he had his hand up first, and then was it Rhonda or, or Sheila first? I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question, and then I'll go into Is it possible in this amendment, I'm sure it's not because I don't know what the hell was going on with the rules in this budget and the attorney's office, but can we add a, like I, I want to vote on the emergency management planner because it's grant funded. I don't want to vote on one, two, or three. So how can we make that happen so that Kevin can get the position that he's been asking for for years to get funded? It's grant funded, but I'm refusing to vote for a social worker, care coordinator, forensic service unit supervisor, exercise training, community outreach coordinator, um, in this position, fat class, uh, classification and pay plan, you know what's missing from this? Um, something that we discuss for public works in the career ladder, not in here. Because we, we have steps to go through. Um, the career mm -hmm. ladder, and any, any of the positions here that are civil service, let me just explain that we're required under the code to review jo all job descriptions in the civil service with our civil service board. So these have already been through the civil service board process. Okay, so when we had the conversation regarding public works, and I asked for, was, was uh, what happened with that? I asked for information on it. I, it could have been presented uh, or, or brought forward. Is that not, I mean... So what happened with that is that uh, Director Johnson and, and I have been discussing how to, what kind of structure to put in there. We need, we've talked about, um, because a lot of those positions are in the union, how to go through a management and labor evaluation uh, review so that we are also taking into consideration the interest of the collective bargaining representatives. And so it's, it's just not as easy as turning around and bringing that back to you in, in the, so, I mean, in the so session, but this was, it is in progress. Okay. It is in progress. I understand that. Yeah. And I'm asking, so you couldn't have just said, okay, well, we want to maybe not do the career ladder, but increase their grade so that they're it paid for the work that they do? So at a, at a so higher amount, a, I, I should say. So there's a number of, of things that are related to that. So that one, one element is to look at comparative jurisdictions to see if we are competitive. That is a compensation study, but, but honestly what we're really should be examining here is are the duties and responsibilities to really build a career ladder that identifies coming into positions at an entry level, a journey level, and maybe a master level depending on the, the skills associated with the work. So you so did that is something that has got a little bigger build to it, and it's not really just a matter of going in and looking at the grade assignments of the. So position. Was, was that work conducted for one through three by your office? For when you say one through three, social worker, care coordinator, forensic service yeah, so, unit. So, so you couldn't have added public works in that. How did this get done in the amount of time? This was before the amendment deadline. This, this is. Actually, a lot of this work was completed. Um, well, I asked year. about that before the amendment deadline, and that was no, a direct, and I asked the city manager and your office. Uh, I, I hear you, but we're talking about work that was completed in the early part of 2021. Okay, and, and I understand that, but I'm just saying I asked before the amendment deadline, and I would have appreciated some um, follow-up from your office or director of public works.
Anybody else? Uh, Alderman Pindell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to um, possibly have not only Ms. Hopkins kind of to weigh in on this, but as well as the um, city manager and if our, any of our public safety team members would like to weigh on, in on this, um, that might be extremely helpful. Okay. Lieutenant McGuez, Chief O'Malley. I know the Chief O'Malley loves to talk. <laughs> he loves being in the spotlight. As well as the city manager again. And MPD, thank you. Sure. Uh, Doug Romano, Fire Chief. I guess for the record, I want everybody to know that I heard you loud and clear. <laughs> loud and clear being that if you want to do something different, you got to find it within your budget. All of you in here know that uh, I have a hard time converting a uniform firefighter position into a civilian position that's not going to do firefighting because I can't take that person and call them up and say, go put this medic unit in service, this fire engine in service. But ever since the first Main Street fire, big fire in 1998, I believe it was, um, and you all went into this earlier, we had these committees formed. And we have these committees formed and we don't go through with the recommendations. The recommendation for this full-time fire protection engineer dates back to that time. This position is an engineer. It's not a firefighter. This person is a trained, qualified, certified engineer who does all the plans reviews. We have managed over the years to do some contractual stuff. Uh, third parties, tends to be very expensive and that gets passed on to the people doing the projects. I've talked to Dr. Nash. I also hear all the time about the uh, bad rap the city sometimes gets when it comes to the permit process. I truly believe having this person down in the fire marshal's office, which is located on Gorman Street, working with planning and zoning will help the permit process. You also know that one of the older persons up here wants to do a sprinkler ordinance. That was sort of pushed back because of COVID, because it's going to be very costly to some of our business owners. If we ever move forward with that, I truly believe with the unique experience we have in the city and wanting to occupy the second and third floors on some of the main street occupancies, we need somebody who full time on our staff that can do that. Our plans reviews now are done by a contractor fire protection engineer, but they only get the big stuff. So we have two people in the fire marshal's office, or three of them, that have trained to do some plans reviews. They're not engineers. My goal is to have the engineer do all our plans reviews. That way there's no questions. Well, we had an appeal that went through last year that we lost. Uh, in my opinion, we never should have lost it because we were right. But I do believe that if the engineer was involved early on, that it probably wouldn't have been an issue. You asked the question about um, being civil service and in the pension plan. This person will not be in the police fire pension plan. They'll be in the state pension plan because they're a civilian employee. So they won't be going into that. The two inspectors in the office that are full-time inspectors are civilian employees. They are not in the fire police pension plan either. They're in the, the state plan. So we have a captain and a lieutenant who are supervisors down there, but they wear multiple, multiple hats. They are public information officers. They are public educators. They, uh, one of them is bilingual, so they go out here and do a lot of stuff and training for the bilingual uh, community when we have to do some public education or when we have concerns about fire safety. So allowing them to do those other jobs um, and get away from the plans reviews is where I truly believe we need to be. And it is, obviously people don't think it's cost neutral, but it's within our budget because we are converting a position that already exists uh, to, to fund this position. So if I may <clears throat> follow up, Mr. Mayor. There. So I guess um, my concern is that we have uh, two officers who are basically working during the day, a seven and a half hour shift, who are drawing out of the police and fire pension plan. And I would much rather see them on a truck or in an emergency vehicle. It, it feels to me like that is not the best value for their time. Uh, I do think that we can get people who are not in the pension plan, who are available, readily available out in the community, there's oodles of them, who could do this kind of work, 
but not be drawing down on the pension plan. So um, if there, if you, you, and I've heard you, and I know this is what the fire department does. Everybody wears multiple hats. They're doing plenty of things. So if they're doing things other than a seven and a half hour day stint, the captain and lieutenant that are helping other fire activities, that is something that mitigates my concern. But I haven't heard that. I've heard there's five fire marshals who are there in the office. I see the fire marshal cars parked in the garage all the time when I come in and out. Correct. And now we're adding somebody who is civil service um, who, you know, I guess I have some concerns about the level of effort for full-time civil service, but I accept, I accept your, your premise that that's required and that this person is really going to help in anything we can do to help Dr. Nash in processing. I'm all in favor of that. But six people <coughs> in the same area feels like a huge concentration of but people. It's, <coughs> it would be five people with an office associate. Now, the office associate does just that, gets the permits into the track it system or it'll, the new system that's going to be brought up and that stuff. So that... That person um, does does that in the fire marshal's office. There's two civilian inspectors. Uh, they are not firefighters. I can't call them up and say, hey, you need to go put this fire engine in service. Commissioning week last night, the captain was assigned to details throughout the week. He wasn't out there doing inspections. So this will allow us, and I'm hoping that eventually the fire protection engineer can basically run the fire marshal's office, and it'll allow us to have those civilian inspectors in there because it is cheaper to have the civilian inspectors, uh, but for us, it limits my capability of putting additional units on the street. But it, this is something that I truly believe in, and it's, it's, it's hard for me to even to suggest taking a uniform position and turning it into a civilian position. But I truly believe in this position, and I think that it's going to help us with the permit process, because that, that's what this basically is. It, it has, it's involved with development. It's involved with renovations. It's involved in all that, uh, that goes along with that. And this person is there to, to make sure our plans and our review process is done properly. So you understand that I've had some fairly urgent input on this from someone who has a lot of expertise in fire and firefighting, and it does seem like a lot of people devoted to processing permits as opposed to putting out fires or riding in ambulances. So. I think my takeaway from your dis, your input is we make this conversion into a civil service person and that's going to obviate the need for some of the work by these other people. It's, it's going to allow can, them to do other parts of their job that's necessary, yes sir. That's what and, I needed to And about. we have in the past, it was all uniform people down there previously and we've slowly been able to, with the budget, watching the budget and other avenues like that, to. Uh, we converted those two positions to civilian fire safety inspectors. I don't have to pull them out of the field to go to EMT research every year. I don't have to pull them out of the field to go to hazmat research. Their major concerns are doing the permitted based inspections for us. And that's truthfully the two people. The captain and the lieutenant have multiple, multiple functions down there. Thank you for that input. I feel reassured. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to continue this line of questioning. Um, and I want to make a comment, and, and I think I've said this before. I know I've said this before. You know, we, 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 we respect the people that do the job. Chief O'Malley's been here a long time. He's seen every aspect of the job. But we sometimes fall into the trap of saying, and I'm not being critical, but maybe I am. We've talked to somebody who said. We've talked to somebody else in another jurisdiction who said. Why can't we take... <laughs> Why can't we take the, the, the information that our own gives us, who does this job in the city of Annapolis every day? And I know I've said this before, we're not Chicago, we're not New Jersey, we're not Atlanta, we're not Baltimore, we're Annapolis. We're unique, just like every other jurisdiction is unique. And I, I, I get really, I mean, I'm being honest, I get irritated when I hear us Talk to Chief O'Malley, who does this each and every day. And it's not like 
we've, we've had issues with the information that he's given us in the past. He's reliable. And, and, and I've said that to all my colleagues here. If there's an environmental issue, I'm gonna go along generally with Alderman Savage. That's his expertise. If there's a construction issue, I'm gonna listen to Alderwoman Tierney. That's his area, that's her area of expertise. If there's an education issue, long-term teacher, that's Alderwoman Finlayson. I'm not gonna necessarily burst my brain power on something that's not my area of expertise if I don't do it every day. I mean, I was a prosecutor, and if, so as Alderman Payon was. And if there's a question, I'm certainly sure that between the two of us, we can answer it. But I, I sometimes really think we do ourselves a disservice. We talk about how wonderful the staff is, but then when they give us something and we have no reason to disbelieve it, then we start questioning it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't question it. Don't get me wrong about that. But he's come in here multiple times. He's, and, and, and Chief Stokes, the same thing. Why can't we take what we hear with some questions, but not always compare it to other jurisdictions? We're not them, they're not us. Thank you. If I may Thank respond, you. Mr. Sure. Mayor, because I feel a little disrespected at this point. Uh, I have reliable sources that are expert in fire that have raised questions. That's what I'm doing. I'm raising questions. I have the deepest respect for Mr. Romali. I've known him for years and years, but this is budget. And this is our responsibility. And we are stewards of the city's money. And we have the responsibility to talk about delivery of services. I was asking questions about that. That is my job, my responsibility, all of our jobs and responsibility. I'm not questioning his expertise. And in fact, I ended my comments to him by saying, thank you. I feel comforted by your response but I don't feel apologetic at all about asking these questions. I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. And I can agree with you on that. Um, sometimes maybe I'm misinterpreting what's being said, but that's what I've heard in my mind too many times. And, and so I just want to say that publicly. And if I misunderstood you, Alderman on it, then I, I apologize. Um, Alderman Guy was next. Then Alderman Tierney, then Alderman Savage. Again, I'll ask, is it possible to remove three and four and a separate amendment? Those are the only two that are grant funded um, with minimal cost. I don't see how individuals can sit up here and complain about the bloated cost and the staff and the pensions and then turn around and... Um, you know, f vote on positions, uh, forensic service in particular, $32,300 in health and pension benefits. I mean, isn't that what, why we couldn't even find $20,000? It's crazy. It's crazy. Is there a process for that, Mr. City Attorney? No. I didn't hear the question, sir. So the question was, he wants to pull out everything but the two grant funded positions on well it'd be an amendment to the adoption of the motion that's on the floor you can amend it if you want okay just just want to get that information for you appreciate um, that old one tyranny was next oh, okay um thank you chief romali so just just so I understand the process, um, getting back to the fire and fire protection engineer, so the way our our process works now is that that the fire marshal is the one that stamps the the, the permit drawings. He's sort of the last stamp of approval. And where I see the fire protection engineer helping is that he would be involved before then. So it isn't the the, the delay sometimes is the drawings come so far along and time-wise and have progressed to construct, you know, almost construction documents almost, that then they get this possible rejection from the fire marshal. So having this fire um, um, fire protection engineer would would help in that process, would we'll get involved in the design of early, in the application early, right? That would be what? Yeah, not only that process, but they have pre 
and Dr. Nash will have to tell you what it's actually called, but they sometimes, when somebody is proposing a project, they bring it in beforehand just to sit down and discuss it. Well, our fire protection engineer wouldn't be involved in that early on in the process. And th this will help some of these projects early on, just continuing to move through the process where they, they don't yeah. run into an issue. Also is, yes, the fire marshal will be stamping, it will be working in conjunction with the fire protection engineers. Just we'll have an engineer reviewing 99% of our uh, yeah. in plans reviews instead of having a firefighter okay. doing that. Okay, yes. which leads me to my question. I was talking to my colleague at the break and there, there appears to be a lot of dwellings that don't meet code, you know, and that could possibly have a life safety implication. Would this free up the fire marshals to take a more proactive approach in um, in in reviewing those situations, in 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 reviewing life safety situations that that may possibly exist in the field, outside of just typical inspections? Would so it free it, them up more to do that? So under the code, we have a one to three year cycle depending on the occupancy of of where um, they get their inspections, business inspections. Now, we can't go into a private dwelling because we have no uh, jurisdiction there. So Understood. We, we can't go into a dilapidated structure that's more in planning and zoning. If it's a rental property, they have some they have more jurisdiction there. The fire marshals don't have that. But this will allow our fire marshals to be out on the street to, to look at projects like that. But the fire marshals that are down there, and it's basically the two civilian inspectors uh, go out and do permitted based inspections. The engine crews, we have them go out and do the, the fire safety inspections during the year. And then if there's a problem or there's a technical issue, they bring in the fire marshals for that. So the people in the engines and truck companies go out and do your just standard safety inspections where they'll walk through the building and sign off on that. But the fire marshals themselves have to do all the permit based stuff, the daycares, the uh, hospital or nursing facilities, uh, any new construction, any permit based construction, that's what they're involved in. Okay, thank you. And Chief Romelli, I've seen like whole fire engines pulled up next to businesses when those inspections happen. Does is that sometimes happen or not? That that's correct. That's when the these each station has a number of inspections to do monthly, and they go out and do those safe inspections. Not only are they doing that safety inspection, but that's getting our people into the building so they know the building if in case we run into an emergency in the building. So they do a, a fire hazard survey, and they can also do some pre-planning while they're there. Okay, thank you. Alderman Savage, I think, was next. Yeah. Oh, and then Alderman Finlay said, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to you know, thank the directors and the chief for you know, sticking with us through this break. I know it's going to be a long day. Um, and to Alderman Pendle Charles' point, excuse me, I do appreciate your comments, uh, and I do think that we all need to know that we're, we're being heard and listening to each other. Um, and so to the department heads and to the chief, you know, we do hear you. And I, I'm also glad to hear that you are acknowledging some of our concerns that we've brought up in the past. And as, as Alderman Arnett has said, you know, that overall it makes me feel a lot more comfortable with what you said in terms of this position. Um, so I, I really don't have any further questions for you. Um, I did have some other questions for, um, well, first of all, about some of the other positions. I know two of the positions are funded through grants, um, but I had a question about the social work care position. Is that a grant funded? Can someone just explain how that's being funded in this year? Is it just out of operating? Is there any grant component to that? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sure. The uh, social work care coordinator, mm -hmm. just inquiring about the funding source, is that just that's just it's surely out of operating yeah that's okay. just operating costs in the general fund has that had a, a grant component or is that being looked at for that position i not i not that i know of uh, yeah we're, we're going to see the, grants for for that whole operation so including okay. salaries and and any other outreach and you know, supplies those types of things i think you need to use uh uh, uh director simmons is uh uh, grant ninjas the two uh, help with that. <laughs> seems very effective with getting grants um, my other question though had to do with the police the forensic services unit supervisor I just wonder if you could just speak a little bit to uh, my understanding is that there are two forensic services positions right and one of them I think is currently a civil servant this is a contract position 
Uh, can you explain more of the just the rationale for? The and I know you've had some concerns about. Um, uh, Ms. McCoy's mentioned concerns about recruitment for this position. Can you explain a bit more about your? Thank, thanks, Captain Mingus. Thank you. That's correct. Uh, so originally, well, currently, we have two police ID specialist positions. Um, in the past, one of them was filled with someone who was overseeing the operations of our forensic services unit. When, when that uh, individual was trained up enough to be the supervisor of the unit, um, they were offered a better package at an, a different agency. Um, and with the time that we had, we were not able to put together something in order to keep that person here. Uh, over the past several years, there's been at least two, if not three people in that position. So, And over how many years? Uh, I want to say six or seven years, something okay. like that. Um, so when we did the compensation study, as uh, Director Hopkins had talked about earlier, um, we, we redid the position to create this uh, civil service position because we recognize that we're not going to be able to get someone and keep them uh, contractually. And it really throws, it's, it's not just one person leaving and just bring somebody else in. Uh, you know, overse overseeing the forensic, uh, forensic services unit with you know, the development of policies, uh, staying with um, accreditations and standards that are recognized uh, through the criminal justice system um, is, a, is a huge undertaking. And so what we decided to do was uh, use one of the police ID specialist positions to uh, basically as, as a trade-in for this. Um, and, uh, and then the other one is the one that's just it's just being renamed as the forensic services investigator. And, and that's mostly because it, out in the world, other jurisdictions, they have a crime scene unit. Everybody understands crime scene. And so when you're recruiting and you're trying to attract people to your jurisdiction, it helps too to call it what it is. Yeah. And, and then people can, through name recognition of the title, know what they're applying for. A lot of people are searching. They're using search engines to find out um, where they're available vacancies. And, and so it's not only about the name, but it was also making sure that we had a good job description that was updated, was really kind of brought more to a contemporary level, and then make sure that the certifications that are needed for that and the, you know, the, the credibility that you then need when those individuals go and testify in court. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to make sure that you've got the certifying agencies accounted for. You want to make sure that the credentials that person holds is going to uh, give them status um, to make any of the, um, both the work and the continuum of the work, which is, again, to the point of making sure that you have a unit that's described properly, that has, it's grounded in all of the of uh, what the industry is expecting, and then um, that you keep people. You keep people in those jobs so that they stay with the case, basically, when, it, when it's initially gathered as evidence and eventually down the road gets, gets to court. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a those are very compelling reasons to give some stability to this unit yeah. by the changes that are being proposed. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's worth emphasizing your point that um, you are trading position so there's no net increase from what I recall uh, in, in the in the employment numbers staff numbers um, so uh, you know that, that at least makes me yeah. feel and you've better been carrying the vacancies that. too yes we, we well, current, yes we currently have uh, in the basically filling the responsibilities of the police one of the police ID specialist positions is a sworn officer so that's, you know, the other reason is to get these filled with civilian personnel so that uh, kind of the same tune as the fire department, we can get our police officer back out doing what they need to do as a certified police officer where you don't need those certifications 
uh, necessarily in the forensic uh, services unit. So both of those, the forensic positions as civilians are on the state retirement? Yeah. 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 Good. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Pound. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, I notice in the fiscal impact note that the very last sentence, uh, for a crime scene investigator, uh, the police department will cover any additional costs with vacancies. What does that mean? I, I believe that's just the 5,000, as it mentions there, the $5,000 impact um, that is additional in salary and benefits for the crime scene investigator uh, position. But, but I think well, I'm looking for... I'm looking at the list of vacancies right now, and I don't have crime scene investigator. Are you taking the, one of the vacancies for another position and using it for that? No. So in the current staffing summary, there are two positions that are po named police ID specialist, and those should those are both vacant. I'm looking for that and not seeing it. Um, you're looking at the vacancy report, Alderman? Yeah, I'm Dan? looking at what we got from Mr. Gerald, the city manager. Which is a vacancy report, or is that? Yep, 6121. Yeah. Let me see if I can find mine. I'm pretty sure they're on there. Is this is a new position, right? It's a new title. It's a new title. Correct. Mm -hmm. So Police it would ID be. ID specialist. Because it's a new title, the new crime scene investigator is a new title. You're approving it through this resolution. It will not be in a current vacancy report because it's not a current title. That's right, coming but, right out of our system, our payroll system. But police ID specialists, if you look at line 14 and 15, they're both there. Well, I'll be honest report. with you. I'm very concerned that the police department uses vacancies to fill, they use that money for whatever purpose they want. Is that correct? I would say that's incorrect. That we well, there's that no we use it for anything there's we no want. police crime scene investigator here. Now there's some pretty detailed titles, you know, throughout this thing. Uh, it, MIT administrative support analyst, project coordinator yeah, slash MCIN manager, forensic services supervisor, Alderman which is a different position from yeah. this, and then uh, professional standards director. Uh, I get that there are no names, but the if fact you, of the matter is you, you use, the department uses those oh. things to do whatever they want with that money. Isn't that correct? So Alderman Payone Look, on the I'm vacancy. I'm putting you on the spot. I know that. And I, I don't. Right, right. So, so when we go before the Civil Service Board, part of, part of the um, expectation of the Civil Service Board is for the department to also explain how they're funding the request. And so the police ID specialist on line 14 in the comments section says, reclassifying in budget to crime scene investigator. So it's, it's, all, it's there, it's already been identified. Um, so, so it's not ago. going to be in your budget documents when you look at the staffing report because it requires the action with the position summary to even to to create the title of crime scene investigator, the probably the confusion is that in the in the position summary, it's just literally listing titles and grade assignments. It's not telling you, oh well, this used to be called that. It is it is really just identifying it in the position summary. What we're doing with the staff report and when and the fiscal note is explaining how we got from from X to Y. Well, I appreciate that. I'm pretty thoroughly familiar with the police department over the years. Um, I think that, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm the one that's confused. Okay. I think that, uh, I mean, I'm looking for truth and budgeting, to be honest. And I've got, I catch uh, unmitigated holy hell when I say there are 104 police officers and sworn officers um, in uniform, not in uniform, but on the on the force right now, we're budgeted for 124. We're not ever going to get up to 124. And when I say we ought to cut a couple of these positions, give the taxpayers a break, I, I hear 
oh, how can you do that? How can you reduce the force? Well, the fact of the matter is, I don't really think the police are trying as hard as they should be to fill these vacancies. And I think they use this money to, you know, whatever they feel, whatever they feel the need for. I'm not saying the money's being wasted. I'm saying that this is not really what the money is for. And I just want to have a little truth in budgeting so that the council and the public knows exactly what the money's being used for. I mean, we give them $21, $22 million a year. It's not a gift. I understand that. It's what they need. They think they, they need to function. And, and I, by and large, I've got no argument with that. I just want to put down what exactly this money is being used for. And I see something that appears to jump right off the page at me. And, uh, you know, forgive me for getting a little bit excited, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, let's call it what it is. That's all. Well, uh, in, in response. Um, I, hope you, I hope, you, hope you can prove me wrong. <laughs> Lieutenant McGill, let me try to address it, and then you can add on to, to my comments. Sure, Val. So, so just by way, way of clarification, so when there's savings in the, the salaries line in police, well, we've already taken a certain amount of savings, about 700000 uh, from that budget, because we know they're not going to fill those. So we don't even budget for that amount of money. But there, if there's additional savings, uh, that can be reprogrammed, but that e either has to be approved by me up to 25000 or it has to come to the council for approval. So the police don't have the authority to just to sort of move the money around to do what, the, what they want that has to be approved either by myself up to a certain amount or by the council. So if they come to the council for approval of excess salary money to be used for other purposes, then it's up to the council to approve that. Well, it just seems at the very beginning of the budget, they're planning on this happening. I understand during the course of the fiscal year that expenses come up that were unanticipated. You've got to find the money somewhere. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't have any problem. But here it seems that, you know, really there's almost a smoking gun that they plan on using vacancy money to, you know, to fill spots that aren't in the budget. And that's just not right. That's all. Alderman Payone, um, if, if I might, uh, we, we do try to fill our vacancies. My goal as being in charge of hiring, recruiting and hiring is to fill every position in our department, every vacancy. That's my goal. Is it realistic? Maybe not, maybe, but that's my goal. But when we're given a dollar amount in vacancies that we have to keep for throughout the fiscal year, then we have to start juggling where are we putting those vacancies? Are they on the sworn side or on the, on the civilian side? Is there, is it going to be, it's going to have to be a mix of some. Um, but we're, when you, you mentioned one of the positions that you mentioned was uh, forensic services supervisor, that was the contractual position that we had. So we're going to be giving that up uh, in filling this uh, civil service position. We won't, we'll no longer need that. What I would rather have is a supervisor and two basically technicians in the forensic services unit um, because I think that's what we need. But realizing the financial constraints that downtown has impressed upon us that the city is in, we are trying to find ways to utilize the positions we have and the funding we have in order to get what we're going for, but which we know we're not going to get by just a, you know, outright addition to our, uh, to, to our position summary, to the extent that we would like. Um, I don't think, I understand your point, and I, I certainly agree that, uh, that it's not the way to do business. I think in this specific case, when we're talking about $5,000, uh, I think we're way on, on the far end of the spectrum. I don't think we're anywhere near the dangerous territory um, that, that you're talking about. It's not the amount. I mean, I'd be a lot more concerned the, if it were 50000 Yes, the principle, though. I understand. Right. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. I just, I just wanted to add as well that by the time we get through all of our 
necessary code requirements to create these positions. You've, you've carried a vacancy, a, a long period of time of vacancy before you're actually implementing the change. We will still, after, uh, you know, council willing and this passes that we still have to go through a recruitment process you know we'll still have to go and advertise and then seek and evaluate candidates and then make a selection before you're there so that also is turnover money before i understand you get, to, you get it from another source if yeah you know if in fact the money is really needed especially toward the end of the fiscal year police are out of money and public works or if fire has an extra certain amount of money available, of course you're going to transfer it in. Um, if that money happens to be job vacancies within the police department, you've got an, uh, an excess there. I get it. It's toward the end of the fiscal year. It's kind of silly to have that money sitting around not being used. But we're talking about from the very beginning of the fiscal year here. And that's, that's my point. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. On my next, next, then Alderman Pindell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I do take my lead from Alderwoman Pindell and Alderman Charles. Alderman Finlayson after that. <laughs> Thank you. Each of, us, each of us bring a little bit of expertise uh, to the council. And in this area, Alderman Payone uh, brings a lot of expertise and, in fact, made <clears throat> very compelling arguments at the Finance Committee deliberations about how important it is to close a case and to have good crime scene management and that uh, we can do all the best policing in the world but if we don't close the case we're not going to do a good job so i i accept that this is something that we need to do um, i do feel we have an obligation to ask these tough questions uh, but um, on this one I was very much convinced by Alderman Payone that we really needed to make this investment. So um, I'm, I'm prepared to go along with this. I do want to have some further discussion on the rest of these positions, but I was convinced by Alderman Payone that we should make this change. <laughs> and, and with real life experience that he gave to us about cases that he tried. so. Um, I, I kind of feel like we need to do this one for the police. Thank you, Alderman Pindell Charles and Alderman Finlayson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Alderman Arnett must be reading my little mind as well because I was going to say the same thing. It is extremely important in any case, and I'll go so far as to when you talk about especially the chain of custody. When you're talking about retention of officers and you have a case that comes along a year or two later for whatever reason, and you don't have that same officer, it can compromise any case. And so when it comes to chain of custody and, and the retention issue, that's extremely important. And when you have a, a turnover, like you've indicated in that, in that, uh, in that section of, of the police department, that's critical. That, that can really compromise a case and, and that brings up all sorts of problems. Um, but no, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and it's based on <laughs> real life experience. So thank you. Yeah. And one thing I would like to add, Alderwoman, is that there are many positions that for which there's not a dearth of applicants. You know, when you get into specialized training and education and certifications, your, your labor pool is kind of tough to come by. And, you know, you, uh, the Annapolis Police Department invested in developing that talent, you know, in part in the past, and it did not work out, you know, to retain that individual. But I, I think we need to understand too that even though we'll be recruiting for positions, we need to make sure that we're we're trying to be contemporary here and that we're, we're looking at what kind of skill sets we need and we're going after um, an aggressive recruitment in order to get um, the talent and uh, to make Annapolis Police Department an attractive place to be. Thank you. Alderman Finlayson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I'm very pleased that we're able to um, include COLAs in this year's agreement um, for all of the unions. Um, my question is about the social work care position. 
Um, I'm a little concerned, and I'd like to know how the Civil Service Board grades. Um, someone with a master's, and that was one of the qualifications that we set, that they would have to have an MSW, um, is at such a low grade. So the Civil Service Board does not determine the grade assignment. I do that through survey. I do that by looking at comparable positions in other jurisdictions. I look at information that we have um, through our evaluation system. This position started out as a one and only. This is a program that's growing and developing. And um, Lynn Farrow and I have been in conversation about re-reviewing the job description and the pur purpose and goals and the like so that it's it has potential for that to be adjusted. And so I, okay. I, I promise you, <laughs> I will go back and do the good work to, you know, to make that determination and, and uh, we'll do the right thing. Well, I appreciate that. And, and now that we're adding another position to that department. Which was not there before. Yeah. Yeah. Th those are the elements that change the value mm -hmm. of jobs as well when you're, when you are um, doing a function as opposed to being responsible for a, a unit. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you you generally look at a supervisory relationship of two to one, meaning that you're not really under the Fair Labor Standards Act even considered a supervisor for exemption purposes unless you're supervising two or more individuals. But, you know, we'll look at the development of this program, you know, as we go about that, um, you know, because part of it, it's a creative element too, mm -hmm. you know, policy development perhaps and, and programmatic development that may also add value to the position. Okay. Thank okay. you. Alderman Pendel Charles and Alderman Arnett. Uh, one other thing I meant to mention, we were talking earlier about, um, I guess it was something on the line of, of uh, re-entry and, and support after that. And I do know that I've heard from the police department that uh, those who have gone through the re-entry program through the police department do have some sort of support for a period of time after that. That's always a huge benefit because oftentimes when folks come out of re-entry, they're just out of re-entry and there's nothing to support them into whether it's a job or family issues or counseling or whatever it is. So there is a bridge um, that goes in that direction that does help them out. And that's what I, uh, the information that I've received from the re-entry program. So that's extremely important um, in this situation. So the police are providing that that opportunity for those who take advantage of it, and, and that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Annette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to thank Captain Romali and Lieutenant Miguez for your helpful input, and um, you, know, you helped me see my way through on this, and I think all the rest of the Council, I'm personally ready to move on to emergency management, uh, if my colleagues are. And <clears throat> by way of doing that, I will say that there was no one even close to being as skeptical of emergency management as me on this council. And then we had a hurricane, a derecho, an earthquake, a mass shooting, uh, and we now... Pardon? A blizzard. A blizzard and concerts. Pandemic. <laughs> um, and so I've watched emergency management over the years. And one of the things that I, the lessons I took away is you don't staff for day to day. You staff for the emergency. And what I've also watched is um, Captain Simmons, Chief Simmons, uh, Director Simmons, all of those titles he's held, bring in, nurture, and train uh, a lot of very good staff <clears throat> under contract and had them hired away. And uh, that seems like a, a pretty big waste of our resources. So when I look at these two positions, as much as I've frankly tried to resist these conversions, I do have to agree with Kevin, Mr. Simmons, Captain Simmons, uh, that we need to staunch the flow. We, we can't keep training people 
and passing them on to uh, higher uh, to other places. So um, this is the fifth of six bullets here, and um, Kevin was smart enough to not be here. <laughs> but um, in in analyzing this, I have to yield to his uh, appeal that these are positions that we really do want to keep keep around. So. Um, that's my only comment on on bullet number five, which I think is two positions. It is. It is the senior emergency management planner and the exercise training and community outreach coordinator. But however, I should say that really what we're we already have an emergency management planner title that's been approved in the budget. What we're doing is uh, renaming that to senior and then creating an emergency management. We're actually changing the grade assignment on the emergency management planner to a 12, which is putting them in the proper alignment to one another. And uh, so that, those are really three changes that are happening related to emergency management. You know we converted the emergency planner uh, in the past, so we, we managed to get one civil service position uh, from an employment agreement conversion a, a few years back. And then last budget, we were all right on track to do these two, and then it didn't happen. And so this is probably, I guess, round three, uh, trying to bring it back before you. And um, even though we have laid out in the code now, um, so it's in the law, not just in a resolution, but in the law about how we do deal with contractual, what we formerly called contractual employees, employment agreements, um, we're not waiting for the five-year plan because I could, I've been here eight years now and I'm just in my head counting how many personnel changes he's had in emergency management. And I, and I think I can count at least on one hand what, what has passed through there um, with great credentials. They left with great opportunities afterwards, so we are a good place to grow, but that's really not what the goal is here. Uh, the goal is to have some stability and some longevity and show uh, I'm trying to channel Kevin right now and I'm sure he would say that this gives him an opportunity to have invested in people to stay tell him what I said <laughs> <laughs> okay okay we have a first and a second on R-12-21 it is a roll call Body ready yes Mayor Buckley. Aye. Alderman Pendell Charles. Aye. Alderman Finlayson. Aye. Alderman Shannemeyer. Aye. Alderman Gay. Alderman Savage. Aye. Alderman Arnett. Aye. Alderman Tierney. Aye. Alderman Payam. Aye. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney, please present the next item on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is R1321, fiscal year. 2022 fees schedule. Is there a motion to adopt R-13-21? So moved. Second. second. Um, I'm going to move an amendment. Can I get a second on the amendment, please? Second. What is it? And I'm going to pass it over to Jody. R-13-21. <laughs> R-13-21. R There is one set of amendments for 1421. There are no amendments for 1321. Um, is that right? Oh, we're on 1321. Right. Hold on. Are there any amendments? So not on 1321? Or 1321. Are these the Buckley amendments? So yeah. we're looking at no amendments on R1321. We didn't have any from our own that we need to correct. Okay, there. okay. any discussion? Mr. Yeah. We shall let we shall. Oh. Alderman Savage. Yeah, there, there are some amendments in Legistar. Hold yeah. on, let me see. Buckley amendments. Yeah, they are. I have. Oh, they're, pla they're planning and zoning fees. Yeah, oh, that's right, yeah. I just wanted to hear some explanation oh, from uh, yeah, they're all Director Nash. Nash. I'm guessing these just reflect increase oh, in service costs. The deadline, right? So they don't need to be adopted. 
They don't need this, to do this. that. No, they were not they don't need to. Was it a long time ago? Yeah, they were. Do you need a motion? Okay. No, not yet. So, no, no, these weren't the most them. recent ones, right? Just, we're going to have, we're going to need a minute here. Yeah, All right, let's make some small talk. <laughs> yeah. Pretend you didn't hear that emotion, that, that amendment. Yeah, sure. Mm. <laughs> How about them O's? <laughs> and it's computer. Good evening. These are <laughs> point of information. Are these all planning fees that we're looking at? So there's a set of amendments in these in, 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 on our 1321 that that um, show what planning and zoning originally intended to go into the mayor's proposed budget. Mm -hmm. There we had only incorporated some of them, and we discovered that what had been uploaded into the system did not include all of Director Nash's changes, and the finance committee discussed those and recommended that they approve our 1321 along with these changes that never got into the original R1321. Mm -hmm. So we're documenting those changes through these amendments that you see listed here. Can I? Uh, Alderman Savage had his hand up. I just finished my question on that, I guess. Um, so just to clarify, it looks like a number of them are being increased and then some of the forest conservation ones are just being um, reorganized, but it doesn't look like they're actually Right, they were increased. just in the wrong order. Okay. So th most of these are just to add a, um, a fee to applications because we're gonna start paying for the newspaper ads in our department, so we needed to pass that fee on. Some of them are just um, cleaning up our fee table, which um, didn't match the code and reordering it and um there are a handful of those where we're bringing hpc the historic preservation fees um in line with other zoning fees okay that sounds good to me thank you alderman annette thank you mr mayor so the finance committee did spend an extensive amount of time with dr nash um, quite frankly i think we don't charge enough for fees in the city we don't come close to recognizing <clears throat> the real cost, but, <clears throat> and my colleagues on the committee can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we found each and every one of these ones to be warranted and uh, offered our approval, a recommendation for approval to the council. Okay. So we have uh, got a vote on the amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Is there a motion uh, to adopt? Is it roll call now or not? Uh, to adopt this as amended, can I get a motion? Second. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor, say, okay, this is a roll call. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Buckley. Aye. Alderman Pendel Charles. Aye. Alderman Finlayson. Aye. Alderman Shadowmeyer. Aye. Alderman Gay. No. Alderman Ar Savage. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Alderman Arnett. Aye. Alderman Tierney. Aye. Alderman Payam. No. <laughs> Mr. City Attorney, please present the next on the agenda. Yes, sir. The next item on the agenda is R1421, Fiscal Year 2022 Fines Schedule. 
Is there a motion to adopt R-14-21 on second so moved. reader? So move. Do you get a second? Second. Oh, it's me. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, it's funny, I learned a new term this past week from, um, um, who did I learn it from? From Rhonda McCoy about how deterrence sometimes work more than trying to change human behavior. Um, or you can't change human behavior, but so you offer deterrence. So my my thought process on these were just raising the fines, um, and yeah, I as more of a deterrent, if you will, um, as much as I could on issues that are important. So just can you just move a, a motion to amend? Oh, okay. I don't have to say that again. Okay, I'll move. Uh, so moved. Someone okay. second. Can I get a second? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So there you have it. Um, that they, um, you know, selling to a minor, uh, false alarms. Um, if anyone's seen a false alarm, you know, on Main Street, um, you know, the five trucks show up and it costs us money. Um, fair housing violation is self-explanatory. There's, you know, that there's no fine that would, you know, be enough for that. Discharging firearms. I know it might be real unrealistic that somebody's going to pause and say, "Hey, I wonder if there's a fine for shooting my gun." Um, but dangerous structural conditions are really important. Um, so I raise those to the maximum. The maximum is $1,000. Alderman Shandlemeyer is probably one of the minors we've served. Just joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> sure, I go after the bartender. Although I guess uh, that joke answers my question. That was um, selling alcohol to a minor, correct? Yeah. At a restaurant? Yeah. yeah. Cool. I want to point out I always ID'd. <laughs> no, I meant you, you were the minor. <laughs> oh, no. You're so young. You're so... <laughs> no. But so, so that's alcohol, not like tobacco products or anything else, no. or does that cover all the stuff that we have age requirements for? Right, correct. Alcohol. Serving to a minor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So once again, Mr. Mayor, the... Um, Finance Committee went over this um, pretty extensively, and uh, we found that we would recommend favorably approval of each one of these amendments. I think there's also a report from the FAC. Hmm? Um, uh, yeah, final one. Well, that's Good. not relevant to this, so is it? So we have a motion and a second to amend R-14-21. <laughs> Finish discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, is there a motion to vote on whether this amendment is substantive? Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt R-14-21 as amended on second reader? So moved, Mr. Second. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mayor Buckley? Aye. Alderman Pendel Charles? Aye. Alderman Finlayson? Aye. Alderman Shandlemeyer? Aye. Alderman Gay? No. Alderman Savage? Aye. Alderman Arnett? Aye. Alderman Tierney? Aye. Alderman Payon? Aye. Could, Mr. Mayor, um, I've noticed that Alderman Gay has voted no on, on this, and, and um, I wonder if we could give him an opportunity to let us know what his concern is. If he wants to. I didn't like the amendment. Okay. Good enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Jody, how are you? We have produced our balancing amendment for O ten twenty one taking into account all the amendments that were passed earlier. And this is amendment number 20. I hope everyone has a copy in front of you. What this does is it corrects the total change for the general fund appropriations and the transportation fund appropriations that are in the ordinance. It corrects the legal name of the affordable housing trust fund we've this is wrong. Been calling the home, we've been calling it the Home Ownership Assistance Fund, and there was a, an ordinance a while ago that changed okay. that name. This is wrong. 
Hold on one second. So are you finished? And then I can go to Alderman okay. Gary after that. And it renumbers the capital projects listed in section 22 of the ordinance because we've added two new capital projects and we want that section renumbered. And it corrects the subtotals and the totals in the departments in Appendix A. And the total for the reserve for one time use is in Appendix C. Okay, hold on, okay. Yeah, this appears to be wrong. Uh, the homeownership assistance trust fund is the current trust fund that is managed and run uh, by Teresa Wellman. The uh, affordable housing trust fund is where the 3% will go that the state is allocating uh, to us. It's a completely different trust fund. They have two completely different um, uh, 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 roles. And if that wasn't made clear, then it should be made clear before you put this in an amendment and pass it. Okay. Because you don't mix those two dollars so up. Ordinance, what was it, 19? Ordinance 2119. I'm telling you what the this, definition what I worked on with the state and what we voted on for correct. that 3%. It shouldn't but be going I'm into. I'm not doing it in accordance with that. I'm doing it in accordance with an ordinance that the council passed more than a year ago to change the name of the home ownership fund and uh, throughout, which, which section was it? Director Nash? Which section was those, were those changes made in? I understand that the state legislation did refer to a fund, but this was before that. Right, that, that was when we changed the home ownership, the name of that fund in Title 20 to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I understand it is a different fund than the fund you were referring Correct. to. And, and we also understand that there's two different sets of purposes for the, our original housing trust fund and what the state is giving us on the 3%, and we have to track those separately. And, and, and is there a pathway to get a correction for Alderman Gay after this? What, is, obviously, we need... It's my understanding that that fund doesn't, does not, hasn't been set up yet. So why okay. would you change the name from, okay, whatever. So, okay. No, the, the new fund does I, not. I, I, All right, I, so. I get that the new fund hasn't been set up yet, but why would, if the new fund is titled the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, why would? Okay, so I, I, I'm, okay. I, I would like to clarify this. A year or so ago in 2019, the council passed an ordinance which included changing the name of the then existing Home Ownership Assistance Trust Fund to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. That happened a long time ago. When the state recently passed the legislation providing 3% of our occupancy tax um, to be used for affordable housing purposes, it cited the section of the code that defines this particular fund. It refers right to this section and it says the fund discussed in that section of the code. That is the, and it calls it the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So it does point to the same fund that we currently have in existence. However, the two purposes of each of those pots of money, the old existing pot of money and the new that would be coming from this occupancy tax have two different established purposes that it can be used for. So we are going to have to track those two pots of money separately within the same fund, which we can do is going to be difficult, but they point to the same fund. It's all set up part of that same section of our code. Okay. So, and this is always my problem. When you ask the city manager to, to like, I don't want to see this money mismanaged. The afford don't put the homeownership assistance trust fund dollars with the affordable housing dollars. The homeownership assistance trust fund does not assist with affordable housing. It's completely different. It's for revamping, modifications, all of this stuff. They're two purposes, two completely different purposes, and it'd be just a mistake to put them in the same fund. I thought when we initially made this request, I put in a request, I find the email to create the draft legislation to create the affordable housing, uh, the affordable housing trust fund, understanding that there were two separate uh, duties for these uh, trust funds, the home ownership and the affordable housing. And so I don't know what happened with that. I'm like everything I've asked for. I'm Give us some clarification, Mr. City Manager, maybe. 
I, I, I don't have any information on that. I can definitely research and find out what the uh, what the request was, but I don't I don't have any recall. But Jody, it's the state that's tying our hands on this. The right? state referred to the same section of the code where we discussed the other pot of money. So it refers to section whatever. It has the same fund name and the same section of the code. So for right now, the state has directed those occupancy tax dollars to that same fund. And we can, through legislation, create a, a split and split them into two funds. We'll have to call them something else. Um, and we can do that. But in the meantime, the first dollar that goes into that fund from the state occupancy tax is going to have to be separately managed to a different purpose. And, and you can assure Alderman Gay that we're going to separately yes, manage Yes, it's, it, it, it's more difficult when you put legislation it, it, to separate it. Yes. And, and except, except that the state legislation is very clear on the purpose and use of the fund, of right. those funds. And it's more restrictive. And, um, right. And it says it is to provide funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund as defined in section 2030.070 of the city code. And so um, that is what is in the legislation. So I'm not sure we can, we can change that without changing state legislation. That would be a question for the city attorney. You stated it very well. And, and, and my purpose isn't to try to you know, commingle this money or anything. I just noticed we continue to call that the Home Ownership Assistance Trust Fund, and over a year ago we changed the name, and we keep calling it the wrong thing. So I'm trying to fix that with this amendment. It's a cleanup item. So Alderman Gay still has the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the and, and again, I, I, I'm not sure what the uh, she keeps referring to something in 019 I don't know if I was present to vote on the name change or whatever I could have been but I, I was also under the impression and it's still listed in your budget as the homeownership assistance trust fund and so I was under the impression that that was that and as she just mentioned the state alluded to the affordable housing trust fund which to my knowledge wasn't created that's why when I called I called them and they said, well, what fund do we put it in? I said, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and we set up parameters for this because there weren't any. I mean, unless there was some, oh, just okay. a massive miscommunication amongst everybody, that's. Well, I was surprised to see our codes cited in the state code. Um, they, I, I don't know where they got those specifics from, but if you look at page 71 of the operating budget book, where, as you say, we've called this by the wrong name, the Home Ownership Assistance Trust Fund, we have revenues programmed to go into that fund of 67,500 for FY22. And that is my estimate of the 3% occupancy tax that will come in for this purpose. And, and I'm saying, I don't know why it's going there, but maybe we can fix it offline. It's easier for me if we put them in separate funds. I'm just directing, maybe we change our existing monies to another fund and move it over somewhere else. The, the, the state should probably change. We should probably get the state to change its language. Yeah. Alderman Tierney? And then Alderman Chandler. Yeah, just um, my understanding and was that the state was only going to um, allocate to an existing fund, an existing fund that we already had. So that's what created this problem. Yeah. Regardless of it being, you know that that's why it went wrong. Basically. Okay, Alderman Shanamar, then Alderman Payan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, for my clarification, um, the Home Ownership Assistance Trust Fund, all the finances and the money from there was rolled into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, is it correct? Yes, we just simply changed the name of the fund. And the 3% occupancy tax uh, also goes into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Correct. And the goals of these two things are... The state separate. legislation was very restrictive as to what you can spend the 3% occupancy tax on. Um, it says rental assistance payments or something like that, where our home ownership 
money that's been sitting in that fund for a while is less restricted. We can use it for many different home ownership related purposes. So needing to change the state legislation would only apply to the money from that 3% occupancy tax and the money we had in what was previously the Home Ownership Assistant Trust Fund, we have our own flexibility for. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, do we Although it those? is also restricted by city code, the, the use of that money. Okay. Uh, but the point is we have control over one of those. Like we have a little city council flexibility, but the 3% we have to rely on the state. Um, do we have those in like at least a separate account so it's easy to So track yeah, or? what I will have to do is establish different projects or orgs within that fund so that we keep track of each pot of money separately. Okay. And that's um, possible. We do it with uh, the general fund. It just makes the accounting a little bit more complicated, but everything spent can be allocated to one pot or another. Okay, but it would make your job easier if we separated that out again. Is that a correct interpretation yes. of what you are saying? And I don't know if we can create a, a second fund here called um, something else that, that puts these older home ownership assistance monies um, in a separate fund or not, if that's easier than trying to change the state's okay. legislation or not. It, so I don't think we can put that in at the budget time like today, uh, but I am agreeing with my colleague that we should separate that out again. Um, I'm just trying to call the fund what it actually is because as of right now we don't have a home ownership assistance trust fund. Okay. Would um, separating that out, it's just an estimate here, uh, separating that out again, would that add any cost to the budget? No? So it's something we could very easily take care of and start the process rolling. Like I can send an amendment, or not an amendment, uh, an ordinance to the law office tomorrow and we can just write that out and separate it out? You, you, you've got several options, but we'd have to think about it because interestingly enough, when I look at the code, there is a, a reference to a homeowner assistance trust fund, but there doesn't seem to be a code section that establishes the fund. Mr. Lyles, there, there is a, currently an ordinance working its way through city council to change that because when we changed Title 20 <coughs> in um, 2020, we did not make the changes to that name, to that trust fund name throughout the chap throughout the chapter. So there is an ordinance currently going through the process to correct that. So it will all be referred to the same name, the affordable housing. Okay. So what what there may be a simpler solution, and that is we change what the affordable housing trust fund does, right? So there, it can do several things, including what was considered home ownership yeah. assistance trust fund. Because otherwise, you got to go back to the state and have them change their code. I don't know why we would do that when we can just change our code to make it more general. And you know, we can keep the restrictions in the state code, but we do we can put them we can commingle the money if it's if that particular fund has a more general applicability. Uh, I yield my time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Alderman Pound was next, then Alderman Gay, then Alderman Thank you. Arnett. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. I just wanted to make sure it was okay for us to consider this since we voted uh, earlier in May to make all amendments that the council had to consider, all budget amendments consider, had to consider uh, prior to May 17th. I just got this. This is, this is a technical amendment because the code requires that the budget balance in order for the budget to well, balance more only technical amendments too in order for the budget to balance based on the calculations from the amendments that passed finance had to go and make sure you had the appropriate number so that once the amendments that came in before the deadline passed you'd have a number that reflected those votes so this does that mr S mr uh, city attorney thank you i was i don't want you to get the impression that i'm bitter at all about the <laughs> earlier ruling that's this is your counsel sir you can do what you want i, I was i was asking you tongue-in-cheek but you gave a very good answer <laughs> alderman gay thanks 
Um, no, the purpose of it is not to mix the two. The homeowner assist, uh, uh, homeownership assistance trust fund, as it stand, was not assisting the individual families that it was created to assist. So we, the reason that they alluded to this trust fund is because we, we didn't have any place. We, we couldn't mix up the money, and it took three days to get this done. And I'm trying to find the letter that was sent from the mayor's office. Uh, suggesting that it be in included in this. The, and the reason I don't want to mix the two up is because, again, we're trying to help two different populations with one. One, the homeownership of trust is fund is what it says, homeownership. The other is affordable housing, helping with security deposits, rent, and those things. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be mixed because after a while, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what's going on. You could start taking it and putting it somewhere else and use it. It's just, I, I don't understand what happened. There was an, a, 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 somebody dropped the ball here. I talked to the city manager. I talked to the mayor. I talked to the mayor's chief of staff in depth about this and, and, and colleagues as well, because they were concerned with the state mandating what we did with our dollars. And so I don't know what went wrong here. I just don't know this isn't right. I can tell you it is possible to track two different pots of money within the same fund. And you can promise us you're not going to mix them up. Thank you. Um, I, I thought this had been moved. Could somebody please move this? Amendment uh, 1021. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. I think we've been having a lot of discussion already. So anybody else need to weigh in? Uh, Alderman Annette? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I understand Alderman Gay's concern, and I'll support that when we need to make the legislative fix. But I want to see if I understand, in essence, we're talking about a change in both uh, Appendix A and Appendix C of $262,000, and largely those are monies that are coming from the one-time only fund. Is that a correct characterization? Correct. The only change in the total was the, the new amounts that are being funded by the one-time use, the reserve for one-time uses. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, on, on one attorney. Um, yes, for, for interested people, what is the um, remainder of the reserve for one-time uses? About $4 million. Do you If you look at the second page of your packet, oh. we detail the schedule that Katie gave you in that packet with all the amendments. There oh, were a couple oh, okay. schedules. Oh, the second okay. schedule. It's in there. Okay. Okay. That's. I will find it. And uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. We good to go? Yep. Got it. Thank you. The roll call. Okay. If you look at the bottom number on that, the bottom amount on that schedule, I can't, what, what, what is the total? The total reserve after all the amendments is $3,012,800. Is okay, we have a first and a second for amendment 20. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. Amendment 20 passes. <laughs> do you need to do some calculations now? Uh, no, once you pass this, we, uh, I don't know if you have to decide if it's going to be advertised um, or if that's been done already. Uh, the amended version, do, does it get advertised? Can, can I just move it on the third reader? Sorry, that's what I was stating. Basically, at a certain point, typically if the council votes that the amendments to the budget um, were um, substantive, we would have an additional public hearing on the amendment, the budget bill with the amendments in it on Monday, and then adopt the entire budget. But we went past that point, we adopted, well actually we could adopt on second reader and still if you wanna vote if the amendments were substantive today, we can advertise it, I guess. 
Yeah, and and have the um, hearing on it on Monday, and then vote on the final budget, or the council could vote on the budget tonight if they think that the amendments are not substantive. I, it's your choice. Uh, Alderman Savage. Uh, ball. Can I move O ten twenty one on the third reader? As amended. So uh, you got a motion to adopt O dash ten dash twenty one as amended on second reader. So it's no, third. third reader. Right? I think we have to do second reader, don't we? Because the new number. No, it's 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 adopt as amended on second. Yes. On second. Okay, reader, I'll move as adopted on second. Okay. Could I get a second? Second. 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 All those in favour, say aye. 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 I'm sorry, I'm not sure I know what we're doing. Adopted as amended on second reader. Second. We got the final number. I shouldn't have done the second reader until we got oh, the final okay. number. We just got the final number. Yes. It's amended through number 20. Yes. Right. And now it's connected to the bill. So all you have to do now is vote on it on third reader with a roll call. Do we have opportunity for discussion? Yeah, and right Afternoon. now because we Make haven't voted. Yep. Right. 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 So um, <clears throat> I, I do think we have presented a legally balanced budget. I think we have gone through all proper deliberations. Um, I do feel that we are balancing this budget with a lot of one-time only money, but it is balanced. Um, I want to thank all of my colleagues on the Finance Committee and on the Council for an incredible amount of uh, due diligence my worry is that we are setting ourselves up for some big problems in the next fiscal year and certainly the fiscal year after that when we run out of one-time only money. So that is my, my major reservation. Last year we talked about when we were passing the budget, do we need to do anything to set aside dollars to uh, stave off any potential adverse aspects of COVID. Um, turns out we got some very nice help from hmm. federal government and from the county that carried us through that and is gonna carry us into fiscal 23. But I, at this point, do want to express my grave concerns about the coming fiscal years. I think that there's going to be an extreme amount of pressure on our contract negotiations. And um, I'd have to say that uh, I don't think we did too well in the last batch. I hope we do better. But my real concern is kind of a double-edged sword. If, in fact, we are tough in the negotiations, it could be coming at the very time when uh, we might really need some cost of living increases because of all of the coming back in the recovery. So uh, I find myself in quite a quandary, quandary with this. I think we've done everything right. In fact, I think we've done it well, but I'm very concerned about the future of the budget. So uh, I know, Mr. Mayor, you've been watching how I'm going to do on this. <laughs> I, I, I think we did a good job for this year's budget. I truly do. But I am very concerned about the out years, as is my want. <laughs> so thank you. So in the way I saw the hands go, were Alderman Payone, then Alderman Shandemeyer, then Alderman Gay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, Alderman, I, I, I have... Uh, thoroughly reviewed this budget, particularly in the last 10 days, I really got up close and personal with it. I uh, have to say that I agree with much of what my colleague, uh, the budget hawk from Ward 8, who I think is uh, beginning to turn into the budget nightingale, beca <laughs> because, uh, you know, he complains about how, uh, you know, there, there are problems with this and problems with that, and then says, oh, okay, I'll vote for it. And uh, I appreciate everybody has to do what they have to do. Um, I, I understand that. But I don't see any even remotely serious effort anywhere in this budget to try to cut back on expenditures. It's like, we got this money from the federal government. Whoopee! Let's go spend it all right now, right here, while we can, instead of saving for the future, instead of prudently um, budgeting for the future. 
Uh, we, uh, we, w this budget does not represent that. I do agree that it is, well, <laughs> it's not structurally balanced, but uh, as a practical matter for right here, right now, uh, based on my very limited accounting background, extremely limited, I would say that on the surface it is a balanced budget. Um, there are so many places that need to be cut back. Uh, not this isn't an uh, you know all work no play type of situation. There's plenty of room in the budget to do some of the things that we'd like to do that may not be necessary, but not as much as as is in here. I think that uh, there are. Um, I, I must say I have to compliment the finance department uh, for presenting, uh, changing over to the open gov. I found that to be very helpful and they were helpful in instructing me how to use it. The one thing though that they don't have anything to do with um, is that it doesn't tell you anywhere what different programs are worth or how much individual salaries are. Um, you know, we've got X million dollars for police salaries, but does anybody here find anything that in, in, in here that said um, how much we pay sergeants? Uh, we, 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 found, we can find that out mostly by going through personnel, and I did, and I, I have a pretty good idea. But, I mean, try to find a program. I mean, for example, how much does it cost the police to send out McGruff uh, or a color guard to... Um, a picnic or a neighborhood 4th of July. Now, I'm hardly criticizing them for doing that. I understand that's part of, uh, part of a program that most any department's gonna have. But how much does it cost? It's not there. And it's not finances, to, uh, it's not their fault. It's uh, not part of OpenGov and therefore, you know, I spent <laughs> countless hours in the last week to 10 days trying to track things like that down without a lot of success. You know, we have to do it by phone call and other ways, and I'm, I'm still waiting for the deputy chief police, chief of police to call me back from last week. I mean, you know, I, he's a guy that's in charge of, of the, biz, the, the budget business, and um, again, I'm not even really blaming him. He may be on vacation for all I know, and uh, I, don't, I don't blame him for that. But, um, uh, the, the fact of the matter is we can do much, much better than this. I agree. I've discussed this with at least one of my colleagues to a large extent, uh, Alderman, Alderman Gay, and, and we're not in agreement by any means you know, right across the board, but I think in realizing that we can do much better than this, I think we are in agreement, and uh, we can. I mean, it, year after year, I leave this a meeting like this saying, you know, next year we're going to be in so much trouble. And fortunately that year, well, uh, other than maybe 2008 and 9, it really hit us and, and 10 too, to some extent. But if we don't do something, I'm afraid it's not going to just hit, it's hit us, it's going to clobber us because we're not prepared for anything. And the reason we're not is we haven't saved ahead. I mean, look at all the CARES money we got. And we don't have any money left over. We don't have any money to put toward, you know, something other than the mayors or the chief of police or fire chiefs, pet projects. That's not the way it ought to be. That's not the way you would run your own budget. And I don't think it ought to be the way we run the city budget. Um, I mean, best efforts on the part of the mayor and certainly kudos in part you know, for parts of, uh, of the budget, but overall, we can do a lot better and we should. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Schandelmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think this is a good budget and a very difficult year. Um, a lot of my priorities with outreach for like language services are, are taken care of and I, I appreciate that. One thing I will point out is we're all going to make the acknowledgement of the structural deficit, which is something that we share with a lot of cities across the country. And we can start addressing that if we walk away from our land use policies that have the lowest return on investment for us. 
uh, prioritizing parking lots over shops or housing costs us a lot of money and doesn't give us a lot of money back in tax revenue. So if we uh, start actually allowing the type of development that would return the infrastructure payments, the police payments, the firefighter payments to actually reach out to these various sprawled out communities, if we start filling those in, we can actually start paying for what we've put down and paying for maintaining what we've put down. Uh, I will end with this. The biggest return on investment we get is mixed use development. Um, and if we start allowing more of that coming up, I know some people think this is separate from the budget, but it's all connected to it. Uh, if we start allowing more of that, we start allowing more infill and repairing the suburban sprawl that we've gotten into in a lot of our neighborhoods, we can have a more fiscally stable and resilient city. Thank you. On McGay? Thank you. Um, I thought that OpenGov was a great addition to uh, Alderman Payon's point. I enjoyed using the online resource. What I really missed um, from previous budget experiences probably is uh, the former uh, city manager, um, her the uh, her ability one to understand the budget inside and out and two to follow up with staff on request that individual older people made like if i would have put something on the table that staff person would have followed up with me and an amendment would have been created or if i had put pushed an idea the amendment i just thought that that was uh, very she was very efficient in uh, how amendments and recommendations from council members uh, were handled and I, I miss that um i think that um this is a a a, a sound budget obviously because we aren't in, in any deficit but it is in no way a, a budget that reflects um the people of the city of annapolis um and so you, you, that that's you know i mean we ha we didn't invest in any um internships any additional assistance um for programming, uh, we didn't follow back up on any of the career ladder conversations that we had for days. Um, and so those are all concerns. And I just would ask that moving forward in any um, budget in the future, um, there is a process. Maybe we need to create an online portal or something, I don't know, where you put in something and the uh, appropriate staff member can respond or get you an answer back to the alderman's point. I was on the phone trying to get in touch with planning and zoning. Nobody was there on several instances, via email, all of that stuff. And so there has to be a better way for, for the individual council members to make a request and get a prompt or efficient response um, from staff. And I think that's something uh, that we can work on in the future budget. Um, yeah, I, just, I, I, I thought, again, OpenGov was a great addition. Alderman Finlayson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd first of all like to thank the finance department, uh, Kate and Ms. Connolly and Ms. Dickinson, you know, sitting through all of our finance committee meetings, and I don't know how many we had, but I do know they were four days a week for many hours. <laughs> and no matter what we asked for, we got it, and we got it pretty quickly. So um, we didn't have to ask twice. So I just want to say thank you personally for staying on top of it and uh, following along with everything that we asked of you because you were right there with us and I appreciate it. And uh, City Manager Gerald, I can't say enough. So just thank you for everything. You are our voice to the rank and file. And um, there was an, an opportunity that you missed to share with them what we were thinking. So I just wanna say thank you. Uh, and to my colleagues, you saw the wisdom in doing a survey. And you know that's gonna tell us in, in years to come, if we wanna really cut anything, then we have to look at services. Can't just cut people and not cut services. So that survey, and I hope there will be a you know, continuous investment in surveys regularly, um, that will really guide us on what the community wants and where we should be going. I hope deep down inside that we take 
um, interest-based bargaining as a model for bargaining. I know next year is a, is a bargaining year, or I guess we're in bargaining now for the coming year. Um, we were extremely successful with interest-based bargaining. Um, it is not adversarial. It, as a matter of fact, it's very extremely collegial. And the success that we had with working with our unions over the last almost 10 years now came out of that process. So I hope that we seriously consider using that process or a model that's similar that will create the collaboration with our employees. Our employees are our unions. They are not separate and apart. And my last comment, and it wasn't mentioned today and Ms. McCoy left the room before I could ask, but we've got a, a big discussion and some big decisions to make because our state legislature just passed a law on police reform that we must adhere to. And it's not going to be cheap. So we're going to have to begin that discussion about how we pay for those things that by state law we must conform to. So anyway, I think all in all, it, was a, it is a good budget. I think it's going to take us through the next year quite well. And it was a joint effort. And I apologize if I left anybody out. Um, but everybody worked together to get us to where we are. And it didn't make my 4 o'clock time, didn't make the Alderman 7.15 time. But it's not midnight either, so, well, close. He was 7.15. Our city clerk was 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock. She was way off. <laughs> anyway, we're not here until midnight, so it's all good. So thank you, everybody. And Takia, I'm sorry. Ms. Green, I'm sorry I didn't miss you, because you kept us. She's our whipcracker. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Alderman Pendell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I echo a, a lot of the sentiments that Alderman um, Finlayson has indicated. Start with the mayor's staff and um, bringing that budget yeah, to bear. Way, the finance uh, yeah. department, thank you so much. Mr. Gerald, who, who, who uh, takes care of all our departments, who's done a magnanimous job in my estimation. He's very responsive as well as everybody else. And of course, earlier I said I loved everybody here, so I can say that again, uh, but my colleagues as well. And I've gone through this budget process several times, and this is probably the best we've ever had. Um, you can tell by the number of amendments, which were few. Um, but, but I want to thank everybody who, everybody on staff in the city government has, has really um, put forth a yeoman effort in making sure that our residents are taken care of, our businesses and, and our visitors, and that's extremely important. We, we, I think, are a template for a lot of what goes on in other jurisdictions, and we should not lose sight of that. I mean, others look at us and, and come to us and say, what are you doing? Uh, how are you making that work? And I think that's a testimony to the leadership. And I won't leave out our city attorney, who uh, has kept us on board as well, and and but just everybody, not I won't, team out, effort. I won't leave out one single solitary close to 600 uh, staff members within the city. Not sing, one single one. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. The hands went up. Uh, Alderman Savage and Alderman Annette, then Alderman Tyranny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just. Again, echo those. I want to big, get, sorry, give a big thank you to staff for all of your work and support on this. Uh, this, I think, has been a relatively smooth budget process, especially compared to previous years. Um, and, and overall, I do think this is a very responsible budget. You know, we did get the federal bailout money, but you know, we're not spending that all this year on frivolous projects. We're actually carrying over a good portion of it to next year in case, you know, because we do expect uh, the possibility of some uh, lingering uh, fallout from COVID. Um, so I do think that's a very responsible uh, uh, thing to do. And as I've said with staffing, I think we've been able to maintain um, consistent levels of staffing um, and also, you know, build upon our community services, um, improve water access, um, and also take some significant steps on some uh, CIP projects that we have in the pipeline. Um, so all that said, I am still concerned about the deficit, and um, I know we really do need to deal with our, our, 
our pension issue, but I'm, I'm again happy to say that we are at least uh, fully funding our pensions um, and trying to play catch up from mistakes made in the past uh, administrations. Um, but I am gladdened though to hear the city manager, you know, when, when he was presented to us, that is his, I think it was your top goal there um, is to address the, the deficit in the future. So I think it, we are certainly, I think, taking that very seriously. Um, and, and also since I'm mentioning you, city manager, thank you for all your support on this. You, you've um, had a very uh, collaborative and um, helpful approach, which has been um, a great a great change. So with that, um, I'll be supporting the budget. Thank you. Alderman Annette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I won't accept Alderman Payone's slur any uh, night in, uh, budget nightingale, but I will be <laughs> no, but I will be consistent with uh, Henny Penny, and I do want to echo what Alderwoman Finlayson has brought up, and and it's maybe worse than she knows in the work we've been doing with Rhonda McCoy. Um, we have been handed a huge unfunded mandate by the state on our policing and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars so um, while I do think that this budget process has been the best so far and I do think that we have a responsible budget I I'm still thinking the sky's gonna fall I'm sorry and uh, I'm very worried about that thank you and, and Mr. Mayor, we didn't thank you. You you have had a role in <laughs> shepherding <laughs> this, so we do appreciate your efforts as well. Pretty bad, and the only Republican is the only one. To say thank you. Yeah, funny. Alderman Tierney. No. Thank you. I, I gosh, there's enough thank yous going around, but I think um, it must be mentioned that you know the finance, um, the finance finance department got us through you know, two, two COVID years, essentially, you know, last year was another difficult year. And, um, and with, you know, David Gerald's help, there was very, very um, in, intelligent, you know, um, estimates on, on revenue projections um, that we, you know, that were, that were, that were very good to have that we, we overcame them. Um, but I think what has to be mentioned is is the restructuring that you have done the last several years, you know, on the budget that we can see the we can actually see it with open.gov. We can, you know, these pie charts and revenue streams and everything and specifically targeting on the general fund, which is the meat of our budgeting, you know, makes us, you know, very um, um, fortunate to, to be able to look at that and make make projections and, and it was very clear to me when I asked for a projection of revenue and expenses and you went back a few years and I'm not exaggerating it kind of went crazy <laughs> and then like the last years that you've been involved in this budget restructuring you know it's like you can see this that we've kept a steady you know a steady budget with the cost of inflation and everything else um, but I, you know, I respect the Financial Advisory Commission's report, which basically, you know, cautions about the staff and sustaining staff projections and all that. But, but what the we find ourselves in a really trying time right now with, with, um, you know, our social needs, our, our in our in our in our public safety needs, our opioid epidemic, um, recovering from COVID. So it's it's not an opportune time. Um, thank God we didn't have to do it to start, you know, making cuts, if you know, on on staff. However, um, I see our focus has to be, and it was at the beginning of this budget review cycle. It was. I remember um, City Manager Jarrell said, "How about some ideas on revenue? We have to optimize our revenue. We have to get creative on revenue um, because we are this." You know, we're handicapped. We're this little postage stamp of real estate, and we have services that involve the county and the state, and we have big chunks that don't pay taxes. So we come into this with a huge handicap. Um, and so I think our focus has to be, you know, on how do we optimize our revenue, not making cuts so much, and also, I know that our state legislation lobbies hard for our pay in lieu of, but 
it, it can't possibly be enough for what for what we do with our with our services to accommodate um, you know the state events and the and the and just the geography, if you will. Um, so, and that you know that that could be a political issue, maybe with the new governor. I don't know, but that is a that is I would have to say not enough money, and we really have to look at that, especially as you say, Alderman Arnett, with the state mandate on policing. That's going to cost our, us money, but we should get help from them. Um, you know, I'm I'm sick of being the stepchild to to the state to the state. Um, we we need to get more money from them, and it's not the fault of our our legislature. It isn't you know Senator Alfred's fault. It's just that number is underestimated somehow, and and we need to lobby for more. Um, that's where our focus should be on. It's a very dangerous time right now to start looking at how we're going to cut really key services in this in the environment that we we live in right now so but thank you thank you all <laughs> thank you for thank you for the amendments etc so alderman gay would thank one person in particular um well two i'll say because she's new to the role and she's been doing adatola jazzy and laura gutierrez who get very, very little dollars. I had a couple amendments for them to get more dollars because these are, my colleagues are mentioning some of these issues, but they didn't put amendments in to fund them, in particular the opioid issue, which is a critical, critical, critical issue, and they are underfunded, and they've asked for money. And, and so just, uh, again, to continue to thank them uh, for really being overlooked, not funded, but continuing to be out in the communities and fighting on these issues, which we say what we care about, but we don't fund. And I think that's so um, important to uh, recognize them. Thank you. And um, I, I do, I'm gonna wrap it up now. We'll vote on this. Um, but I do wanna uh, thank the city manager. This is the earliest we've ever start the bu started the budget process. What was our first meeting that we had? Well, we actually started last August. Uh, Jody so, and I started meeting with the uh, the finance committee to, to sort of lay out the, 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 the next 10 months. And, and I want to thank the council because that was what the council wanted, to get involved as early as possible. So we've had all this time leading up to today. Um, I want to especially thank uh, uh, Jody and Katie because this is the best budget process we, we've had today. And, and in the face of COVID, um, I want to thank all the departments for the cuts that they made because we didn't know there was going to be any federal money on the way um, to help plug the budget at the end of this. We'd, we we ad agree that this year there was a structural deficit, but we have to realize that our revenues were hit like every other business and every other household in America. We suffered the same thing. We run um, a business almost. We have expenses um, and we have revenues. Our revenues were affected last year and the federal government stepped in like they stepped in to help many other uh, people in America to help us fill that gap. But we live in one of the best cities in America. The outlook is really good for this city. Everybody wants to live here. We are lucky to live in a city like this. It is a well-managed city because of all of you out there. So I just want to thank you for all your efforts and this city council for their efforts. And we will go to a vote to adopt uh, O-10-21 as amended on, uh, huh? I thought you wanted to go second again. No. Did we? Okay. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Is there a motion to adopt O-10-21 on third reader? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> All those, or oh, we do it. It's a roll, a roll call, sorry. <laughs> okay. Mayor Buckley. Uh, yes. Alderman Pinnell Charles. Aye. Alderman Finlayson. Aye. Alderman Shannon Meyer. Aye. Alderman Gett. I will not vote for it, no. I'm sorry? What? Say what? I will not vote for it. So that's a no? No. Okay. Alderman Savage. Aye. Alderman Arnett. Abstain. Okay. Um, Alderman Tierney. Aye. Alderman Payon. No. Good. It passed. Yeah. Motion the passes, passed. the budget passes. Let's have a little round of applause for you guys. You. Brooks, did we make the deadline? Right. <laughs>
Okay, thank you, Mr. City Attorney. That ends the agenda, Mr. Mayor. And this is a big one for uh, Alderman Payne. This is last budget. Is there anything else for good order, Alderman Payne? The best thing I can think of right now is to uh, request that uh, we be adjourned. <laughs> and and, and uh, can I just ask you, how many budgets have you voted for? I think three. <laughs> Okay, great, All right. Okay. All right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take it personally. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of adjourning the meeting say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. I think so. <laughs>